This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. The Bushfire From the Collection of Children of the Bush by Henry Lawson Chapter 1 Squatter and Selector Wall was a squatter and a hard man. There had been long years of drought and loss. And then came the rabbit pests. The rabbits swarmed like flies over his run, and cropped the ground bare, where even the poor grass might have saved thousands of sheep. And the rabbits cost the squatter hundreds of pounds in rabbit-proof fences, trappers, wages, etc., just to keep them down. Then came arrangements with the bank, and then Wall's wife died. Wall started to brood over other days, and the days that had gone between, and developed a temper which drove his children from home, one by one, till only Mary was left. She managed the lonely home with the help of a half-caste. Then, in good seasons, came the selectors. Men remembered Wall as a grand boss and a good fellow. But that was in the days before rabbits and banks, and syndicates, and pastoralists, or pastoral companies, instead of good squatters. Runs were mostly pastoral leases, for which the squatter paid the government so much per square mile, almost a nominal rent. Selections were small holdings, taken up by farmers under residential and other conditions, and paid for by instalments. If you were not ruined by the drought, and paid up long enough, the land became freehold. The writer is heir to a dusty patch of three hundred acres or so in the scrub, which was taken up thirty years ago and isn't freehold yet. Selectors were allowed to take up land on runs or pastoral leases, as well as on unoccupied crown lands, and as they secured the best bits of land, and on water frontages, if they could, and as, of course, selections reduced the area of the run. The squatters loved selectors like elder brothers. One man is allowed to select only a certain amount of land, and required by law to live on it. So the squatters bought as much freehold about the homestead as they could afford, selected as much as they are, are allowed to by law, and sometimes employed dummy selectors to take up choice bits about the runs and hold them for them. They fought selectors in many various ways, and, in some cases, annoyed and persecuted them with devilish ingenuity. Ross was a selector and a very hard man physically. He was a short, nuggety man with black hair and a frill beard, a little dusty. Bushy, black eyebrows, piercing black eyes, horny knotted hands, and the obstinacy or pluck of a dozen men in fight, drought and the squatter. Ross selected on Wall's Run, in a bend of Sandy Creek, a nice bit of land with a black soil, flat and red soil, sidings from the ridges, which no one had noticed before, and with the help of his boys he got the land cleared and fenced in a year or two, taking bush contracts about the district between Wiles to make tucker for the family until he got his first crop off. Wall was never accused of employing dummies or underhanded methods in dealings with selectors, but he had been through so much and had brooded so long that he had grown very hard and bitter and suspicious, and the reverse of generous, as many men do who start out in life too, soft and good-hearted, and with too much faith in human nature. He was a tall, dark man. He ordered Ross's boys off the run, impounded Ross's stock, before Ross had got his fencing finished, summoned Ross for trespass, and Ross retaliated as well as he could, until at last it might not have been safe for one of those men to have met the other 
with a gun. The impounding of the selector's cattle led to the last bad quarrel between Wall and his son Billy, who was a tall, good-natured cornstalk, and who reckoned that Australia was big enough for all of us. One day, in the drought, and in an extra bitter mood, Wall heard that some of his sheep had been dogged in the vicinity of Ross's selection, and he ordered Billy to take a station hand and watch Ross's place all night. And, if Ross's cattle put their noses over the boundary to drive them to the pound, fifteen miles away, also to lay poison baits for the dogs all round the selection, and Billy flatly refused. I know Ross and the boys, he said, and I don't believe they dogged the sheep. Why? They've only got a Newfoundland pup and an old lame, one-eyed sheep dog that couldn't hurt a flea. Now, father, this sort of thing has been going on long enough. What difference does a few poultry acres make to us? The country is big enough. God knows. Ross is a straight man, and, for God's sake, give the man a chance to get his ground fenced in. He's doing it as fast as he can, and he can't watch his cattle day and night. Are you going to do as I tell you, or are you not? shouted Wall. Well, if it comes to that, I'm not, said Billy. I'm not going to sneak round a place all night and watch for a chance to pound a poor man's cows. It was an awful row down behind the wool shed, and things looked so bad that old Peter, the station hand, who was a witness, took off his coat and rolled up his sleeves, ready, as he said afterwards, to roll into either the father or the son, if one raised a hand against the other. Father, said Billy, though rather sobered by the sight of his father's trembling, choking passion, do you call yourself an Englishman? Yes, yelled Wall furiously. What the hell do you call yourself? If it comes to that, I'm an Australian, said Billy, and he turned away and went to catch his horse. He went up country and knocked about in the northwest for a year or two. End of chapter one. Chapter two. Romeo and Juliet. Mary Wall was twenty-five. She was an Australian bush girl, every inch of her five foot nine. She had a pink and white complexion, dark blue eyes, blue-black hair, and the finest figure in the district, on horseback or afoot. She was the best girl rider too, saddle or bareback. And they say that when she was a tomboy, she used to tuck her petticoats under her and gallop man fashion through the scrub, after horses or cattle. She said she was going to be an old maid. There came a jackaroo on a visit to the station. He was related to the bank with which Wall had relations. He was a dude, with an expensive education and no brains. He was very vain of his education and prospects. He regarded Mary with undisguised admiration, and her father had secret hopes. One evening the jackaroo was down by the homestead gate when Mary came cantering home on her tall chestnut. The gate was six feet or more, and the jackaroo raised his hat and hastened to open it, but Mary reined her horse back a few yards, and the dude had barely time to jump aside when there was a scuffle of hoofs on the road, a ha-ha-ha in mid-air, a landing thud, and the girl was away up the home track in a cloud of dust. A few days later the jackaroo happened to be at Kelly's, a wayside shanty, watching a fight between two bushmen, when Mary rode up. She knew the men. She whipped her horse in between them and struck at first one and then the other with her riding whip. You ought to be ashamed of yourselves, she said, and both married men too. It evidently struck them that way, for after a bit they shook hands and went home. And I wouldn't have married that girl for a thousand pounds, said the jackaroo, relating the incidents to some friends in Sydney. Mary said she wanted a man, if she could get one. There was no life at home nowadays, so Mary went to all the bush dances in the district, 
She thought nothing of riding twenty or thirty miles to a dance. Dancing all night and riding home again the next morning. At one of these dances she met young Robert Ross, a clean, limbed, good-looking young fellow about her own age. She danced with him and liked him, and danced with him again, and he rode part of the way home with her. The subject of the quarrel between the two homes came up gradually. The boss, said Robert, meaning his father, the boss is always ready to let bygones be bygones. It's a pity it couldn't be fixed up. Yes, said Mary, looking at him. Bob looked very well on horseback. It is a pity. They met several times, and next Prince of Wales' birthday they rode home from the races together. Both had good horses, and they happened to be far ahead of the others on the wide, straight, clear road that ran between the walls of the scrub. Along about dusk, they became very confidential indeed. Mary had remarked what a sad and beautiful sunset it was. The horses got confidential too, and shouldered together and touched noses, and after a long interval in the conversation, during which Robert, for one, began to breathe quickly, he suddenly leaned over, put his arm round her waist, and ma made to kiss her. She jerked her body away, threw up her whip hand, and Robert ducked instinctively. But she brought her whip down on her horse's flank instead, and raced ahead. Robert followed, or rather, his horse did. He thought it was a race, and took the bit in his teeth. Robert kept calling, appealing. Wait a while, Mary. I want to explain. I want to apologise. For God's sake, listen to me, Mary. But Mary didn't hear him. Perhaps she misunderstood the reason of the chase and gave him credit for a spice of the devil in his nature. But Robert grew really desperate. He felt that the thing must be fixed up, now or never, and gave his horse a free rein. Her horse was the fastest, and Robert galloped in the dust from his heels for about a mile and a half. Then, at the foot of a rise, Mary's horse stumbled and nearly threw her over his head. Then he stopped like the good horse he was. Robert got down, feeling instinctively that he might best make his peace on foot, and approached Mary with a face of misery. She had dropped her whip. Oh, Bob, she said, I'm knocked out, and she slipped down into his arms and stayed there a while. They sat on a log and rested, while their horses made in inquiries of each other's noses and compared notes. And after a good while, Mary said, No, Bob, it's no use talking of marrying just yet. I like you, Bob, but I could never marry you while things are as they are between your father and mine. Now, that'll do. Let me get on my horse, Bob. I'll be safer there. Why? asked Bob. Come on, Bob, and don't be stupid. She met him often and liked him. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 A Tramp's Match and What It Did It was Christmas Eve at Walls, but there was no score or so of buggies and horses and dozens of strange dogs round the place as of old. The glasses and the decanters were dusty on the heavy old-fashioned sideboard in the dining room, and there was only a sullen, brooding man leaning over the hurdles and looking at his rams in the yard, and a sullen, brooding half-caste at work in the kitchen. Mary had ridden away that morning to visit a girl chum. It was towards the end of a long drought, and the country was like tinder for hundreds of miles round. The ground for miles and miles in the broiling scrubs, as bare as your hand, or covered with coarse, dry tufts. There was feed grass in places, but you had to look close to see it. Shearing had finished the day before, but there was a black boy and a station hand or two about the yards, and six or eight shearers and roustabouts, and a teamster camped in the men's huts. They were staying over the holidays to shear stragglers and clean up generally. Old Peter and a jackaroo were out on the run watching a bushfire across Sandy Creek. 
A swagman had happened to call at the station that morning. He asked for work and then for Tucker. He irritated Wall, who told him to clear out. It was the first time that a swagman had been turned away from the station without Tucker. Swaggy went along the track some miles, brooding over his wrongs, and crossed Sandy Creek. He struck a match and dropped it into a convenient tuft of grass in a likely patch of tufts, with dead grass running from it up into the scrubbery ridges. Then he hurried on. Did you ever see a bushfire? Not sheets of flame sweeping and roaring from treetop to treetop, but the snaky, hissing grass fire of hardwood country. The whole country covered with thin blue smoke, so that you never know in what direction the fire is travelling. At night, you see it like the lighted streets of cities in the distant ranges. It roars up the hollows of dead trees and gives them the appearance of factory chimneys in the dusk. It climbs by shreds of bark, the trunks of old, dead white box and blue gums, solid and hard as cast iron, and cuts off the limbs. And where there's a piece of recently ring-barked country with the dead leaves still on the trees, the fire will roar from bough to bough, a fair imitation of a softwood forest fire. The bushfire travels through the scrubs for hundreds of miles, taking the grass to the roots, scorching the living bush, but leaving it alive. For gum bush, it's hardest of any to kill. Where there is no undergrowth and the country seems bare as a road for miles, the fire will cross, licking up invisible straws of grass, dusty leaves, twigs and shreds of bark on the hard ground, already baking in the drought. You hear of a fire miles away, and next day, riding across the head of a gully, you hear a hissing and crackling, and there is the fire, running over the ground in lines and curves of thin blue smoke, snake-like, with old logs blazing on the blackened ground behind. Did you ever hear a fire where a fire should not be? There is something hellish in the sound of it. When the breeze is, say, from the east, the fire runs round western spurs, up sheltered gullies, helped by an eddy, in the wind perhaps, and appears along the top of the ridge, ready, with a change in the wind, to come down on the farms and fields of ripe wheat, with the front miles long. A selector might be protected by a wide sandy creek, in front and wide cleared roads behind, and, any hour in the day or night, a shout from the farther end of the wheat paddock, and, oh my God, the wheat. Wall didn't mind this fire much. Most of his sheep were on their way out back, to a back run where there was young grass, and the dry ridges along the creek would be better for a burning off, only he had to watch his fences. But about dusk, Mary came galloping home in her usual breakneck fashion. Father, she cried, turn out the men and send them at once. The fire is all down by Ross's farm, and he has ten acres of wheat standing, and no one at home but him and Bob. How do you know, growled Wall, then suddenly and suspiciously. Have you been there? I came home that way. Well... Let Ross look after his own, snarled the father. But he can't, father. They're fighting the fire now, and they'll be burnt out before morning if they don't get help. For God's sake, father, act like a Christian and send them in. Remember, it is Christmas time, father. You're surely not going to see a neighbour burnt out. Yes, I am, shouted Wall. I'd like to see every selector in the country burnt out. Hut and all. Get off that horse and go inside. If a man leaves the station tonight, he needn't come back. This lasts for the benefit of the men's hut. But, Father, get off that horse and go inside, roared Wall. I, I won't. What? He darted forward, as though to drag her from the saddle, but she swung her horse away. Stop. Where are you going? To help Ross, said Mary. He had no one to send for help. Then go the same way as your brother, roared her father. And if you show your nose back again, I'll horsewhip you off the run. I'll go, father. 
said Mary, and she was away. End of chapter 3「CHAPTER Four, THE FIRE AT ROSS'S FARM Ross's farm was in a corner between the ridges and the creek. The fire had come down from the creek, but the siding on that side was fairly clear. And they had stopped the fire there. It went the ridge and ran up and over. The ridge was covered thickly with scrub and dead grass. The wheat field went well up the siding, and along the top was a bush face with only a narrow bridle track between it and the long dead grass. Everything depended on the wind. Mary saw Ross and Mrs. Ross and the daughter Jenny, well up the siding above the fence, working desperately, running to and fro, and beating out the fire with green boughs. Mary left the horse, ran into the hut, and looked hurriedly round for something to wear in place of her riding skirt. She only saw a couple of light print dresses. She stepped into a skillion room, which happened to be Bob's room, and there caught sight of a pair of trousers and a coat hanging on the wall. Bob Ross, beating desperately along a line of fire that curved, downhill to his right and half choked and blinded with the smoke, almost stumbled against a figure which was too tall to be his father. Why, who's that? he gasped. It's only me, Bob, said Mary, and she lifted her bow again. Bob stared. He was so astonished that he almost forgot the fire and the wheat. Bob was not thin, but... Don't look at me, Bob, said Mary hurriedly. We're going to be married, so it doesn't matter. Let us save the wheat. There was no time to waste. There was a breeze now from over the ridges, light but enough to bear the fire down on them. Once... When they had breathing space, Mary ran to the creek for a billy of water. They beat out the fire all along the siding to where a rib of granite came down over the ridge to the fence, and then they thought the wheat was safe. They came together here, and Ross had time to look and see who the strange man was. Then he stared at Mary from under his black, bushy eyebrows. Mary, choking and getting her breath after her exertions, suddenly became aware, said, Oh, and fled round the track beyond the point of the granite. She felt a gust of wind and looked up the ridge. The bush fence ended here in a corner, where it was met by a new wire fence running up from the creek. It was a blind gully full of tall dead grass, and glancing up, Mary saw the flames coming down fast. She ran back. Come on, she cried. Come on. The fire's the other side of the rocks. Back at the station, Wall walked up and down till he cooled. He went inside and sat down, but it was no use. He lifted his head and saw his dead wife's portrait on the wall. Perhaps his whole life ran before him in detail, but this is not a psychological study. There were only two tracks open to him now, either to give in or go on as he was going, to shut himself out from the human nature and become known as Mean Wall, Hungry Wall, or Mad Wall, the squatter. He was a tall, dark man of strong imaginations and more than ordinary intelligence, and it was the great crisis of his ruined life. He walked to the top of a knoll near the homestead and saw the fire on the ridges above Ross's farm. As he turned back, he saw a horseman ride up and dismount by the yard. Is that you, Peter? Yes, boss. The fences is all right. Been near Ross's? No, he's burnt out by this time. Wall walked to and fro for a few minutes longer. Then he suddenly stopped and called Peter. Hey, hey, from the direction of the huts. Turn out the men. And Wall went into a shed and came out with his saddle on his arm. The fire rushed down the blind gully. Showers of sparks fell on the bush fence. It caught twice and they put it out, but the third time it blazed and roared and a fire engine could not have stopped it. The wheat must go, said Ross. We've done our best, and he threw down the blackened bough and leaned against a tree and covered his eyes with a grimy hand. The wheat was patchy in that corner. There were many old stumps of trees and there were bare strips 
where the plough had gone on each side of them. Mary saw a chance and climbed the fence. Come on, Bob, she cried. We might save it, yeah. Mr. Ross, pull out the fence along there, and she indicated a point beyond the fire. They tramped down and tore up the wheat where it ran between the stumps. The fire was hissing and crackling round and through it. And just as it ran past them in one place, there was a shout, a clutter, of horses' hooves on the stones, and Mary saw her father riding up the track with a dozen men behind him. She gave a shriek and ran straight down, through the middle of the wheat, towards the hut. Wall and his men jumped to the ground, wrenched green boughs from the saplings, and, after twenty minutes' hard fighting, the crop was saved, save for a patchy acre or so. When it was all over, Ross sat down on a log, and rested his head on his hands, and his shoulders shook. Presently he felt a hand on his shoulder, looked up, and saw Wall. Shake hands, Ross, he said, and it was Christmas Day. But in after years they used to nearly chafe the life out of Mary. You were in a great hurry to put on the breeches, weren't you, Mary? Bob's best Sunday, go meetings too, wasn't they, Mary? Rather tight fit, wasn't they, Mary? Couldn't get them on now, could you, Mary? But, reflected old Peter apart to some cronies, it ain't every young chap as gets an idea of the shape of his wife afore he marries her, is it? And that's saying something. And old Peter was set down as being an innocent sort of old cove. End of the Bushfire by Henry Lawson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Cannibalism in the Cars, a short story by Mark Twain, read by Matthew McGraw. I visited St. Louis lately, and on my way west, after changing cars at Terre Haute, Indiana, a mild, benevolent-looking gentleman of about forty-five or maybe fifty came in at one of the way-stations and sat down beside me. We talked together pleasantly on various subjects, for an hour perhaps, and I found him exceedingly intelligent and entertaining. When he learned that I was from Washington, he immediately began to ask questions about various public men and about congressional affairs, and I saw very shortly that I was conversing with a man who was perfectly familiar with the ins and outs of political life at the Capitol, even to the ways and manners and customs of procedure of senators and representatives in the chambers of the National Legislature. Presently two men halted near us for a single moment, and one said to the other, Harris, if you'll do that for me, I'll never forget you, my boy. My new comrade's eye lighted pleasantly. The words had touched upon a happy memory, I thought. Then his face settled into thoughtfulness, almost into gloom. He turned to me and said, Let me tell you a story. Let me give you a secret chapter of my life, a chapter that has never been referred to by me since its events transpired. Listen patiently, and promise that you will not interrupt me. I said I would not, and he related the following strange adventure, speaking sometimes with animation, sometimes with melancholy but always with feeling and earnestness. On the 19th of December, 1853, I started from St. Louis on the evening train bound for Chicago. There were only twenty-four passengers, all told. There were no ladies and no children. We were in excellent spirits, and pleasant acquaintanceships were soon formed. The journey bade fair to be a happy one, and no individual in the party, I think, had even the vaguest presentiment of the horrors we were soon to undergo. At eleven p.m. it began to snow hard. Shortly after leaving the small village of Weldon, we entered upon that tremendous prairie solitude that stretches its leagues on leagues of houseless dreariness far away toward the Jubilee settlements. The winds, unobstructed by trees or hills or even vagrant rocks, whistled fiercely across the level desert, driving the falling snow before it like spray 
from the crested waves of a stormy sea. The snow was deepening fast, and we knew, by the diminished speed of the train, that the engine was plowing through it with steadily increasing difficulty. Indeed, it almost came to a dead halt sometimes, in the midst of great drifts that piled themselves like colossal graves across the track. Conversation began to flag. Cheerfulness gave place to grave concern. The possibility of being imprisoned in the snow on the bleak prairie fifty miles from any house presented itself to every mind and extended its depressing influence over every spirit. At two o'clock in the morning I was aroused out of an uneasy slumber by the ceasing of all motion about me. The appalling truth flashed upon me instantly. We were captives in a snowdrift. All hands to the rescue! Every man sprang to obey. Out into the wild night, the pitchy darkness, the billowy snow, the driving storm, every soul leaped, with the consciousness that a moment lost now might bring destruction to us all. Shovels, hands, boards, anything, everything that could displace snow was brought into instant requisition. It was a weird picture, that small company of frantic men fighting the banking snows, half in the blackest shadow and half in the angry light of the locomotive's reflector. One short hour sufficed to prove the utter uselessness of our efforts. The storm barricaded the track with a dozen drifts while we dug one away. And worse than this, it was discovered that the last grand charge the engine had made upon the enemy had broken the fore and aft shaft of the driving wheel. With a free track before us, we should still have been helpless. We entered the car, wearied with labor, and very sorrowful. We gathered about the stoves, and gravely canvassed our situation. We had no provisions whatever. In this lay our chief distress. We could not freeze, for there was a good supply of wood in the tender. This was our only comfort. The discussion ended at last in accepting the disheartening decision of the conductor that it would be death for any man to attempt to travel fifty miles on foot through snow like that. We could not send for help, and even if we could it would not come. We must submit, and await, as patiently as we might, succor or starvation. I think the stoutest heart there felt a momentary chill when those words were uttered. Within the hour, conversation subsided to a low murmur here and there about the car, caught fitfully between the rising and falling of the blast. The lamps grew dim, and the majority of the castaways settled themselves among the flickering shadows to think, to forget the present if they could, to sleep if they might. The eternal night, it surely seemed eternal to us, wore its lagging hours away at last, and the cold gray dawn broke in the east. As the light grew stronger, the passengers began to stir and give signs of life, one after another, and each in turn pushed his slouched hat up from his forehead, stretched his stiffened limbs, and glanced out of the windows upon the cheerless prospect. It was cheerless indeed, not a living thing visible anywhere, not a human habitation, nothing but a vast white desert. Uplifted sheets of snow drifting hither and thither before the wind, a world of eddying flakes shutting out the firmament above. All day we moped about the cars, saying little, thinking much. Another lingering, dreary night and hunger. Another dawning, another day of silence, sadness, wasting hunger, hopeless watching for succor that would not come, a night of restless slumber, filled with dreams of feasting, wakings distressed with the gnawings of hunger. The fourth day came and went, and the fifth, five days of dreadful imprisonment. A savage hunger looked out at every eye. There was in it a sign of awful import, the foreshadowing of a something that was vaguely shaping itself in every heart, a something which no tongue dared yet frame into words. The sixth day passed. The seventh dawned upon as gaunt and haggard and hopeless a company of men as ever stood in the shadow of death. It must out now. 
that thing which had been growing up in every heart was ready to leap from every lip at last. Nature had been taxed to the utmost. She must yield. Richard H. Gaston of Minnesota, tall, cadaverous, and pale, rose up. All knew what was coming. All prepared. Every emotion, every semblance of excitement was smothered. Only a calm, thoughtful seriousness appeared in the eyes that were lately so wild. Gentlemen, it cannot be delayed longer. The time is at hand. We must determine which of us shall die to furnish food for the rest. Mr. John J. Williams of Illinois rose and said, Gentlemen, I nominate the Reverend James Sawyer of Tennessee. Mr. William R. Adams of Indiana said, I nominate Mr. Daniel Sloat of New York. Mr. Charles J. Langdon, I nominate Mr. Samuel A. Brown of St. Louis. Mr. Sloat, Gentlemen, I desire to decline in favor of Mr. John A. Van Nostrum, Jr. of New Jersey. Mr. Gaston, if there be no objection, the gentleman's desire will be acceded to. Mr. Van Ostrand objecting, the resignation of Mr. Sloat was rejected. The resignation of Messrs. Sawyer and Bowen were also offered, and refused upon the same grounds. Mr. A. L. Bascom of Ohio. I move that the nominations now close, and that the House proceed to an election by ballot. Mr. Sawyer. Gentlemen, I protest earnestly against these proceedings. They are, in every way, irregular and unbecoming. I must beg to move that they be dropped at once, and that we elect a chairman of the meeting and proper officers to assist him, and then we can go on with the business before us understandingly. Mr. Bell of Iowa. Gentlemen, I object. This is no time to stand upon forms and ceremonious observances. For more than seven days we have been without food. Every moment we lose in idle discussion increases our distress. I am satisfied with the nominations that have been made. Every gentleman present is, I believe. And I, for one, do not see why we should not proceed at once to elect one or more of them. I wish to offer a resolution, Mr. Gaston. It would be objected to, and have to lie over one day under the rules thus bringing about the very delay you wish to avoid. The gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Van Ostrand, Gentlemen, I am a stranger among you. I have not sought the distinction that has been conferred upon me, and I feel a delicacy, Mr. Morgan of Alabama, interrupting. I move the previous question. The motion was carried, and further debate shut off, of course. The motion to elect officers was passed, and under it, Mr. Gaston was chosen chairman, Mr. Blake, secretary, Mr. Holcomb, Dyer, and Baldwin, a committee on nominations, and Mr. R. M. Howland, purveyor, to assist the committee in making selections. A recess of half an hour was then taken, and some little caucusing followed. At the sound of the gavel, the meeting reassembled, and the committee reported in favor of Mr. George Ferguson of Kentucky, Lucian Herman of Louisiana, and W. Messick of Colorado as candidates. The report was accepted. Mr. Rogers of Missouri. Mr. President, the report being properly before the House now, I move to amend it by substituting for the name of Mr. Herman that of Mr. Lucius Harris of St. Louis, who is well and honorably known to us all. I do not wish to be understood as casting the least reflection upon the high character and standing of the gentleman from Louisiana. Far from it. I respect and esteem him as much as any gentleman here present possibly can. But none of us can be blind to the fact that he had lost more flesh during the week that we have lain here than any among us. None of us can be blind to the fact that the committee has been derelict in its duty either through negligence or a graver fault, in thus offering for our suffrages a gentleman who, however pure his motives may be, has really less nutriment in him the chair. The gentleman from Missouri will take his seat. The chair cannot allow the integrity of the committee to be questioned, save by the regular course under the rules. What action will the House take upon the gentleman's motion? Mr. Halliday of Virginia. 
I move to further amend the report by substituting Mr. Harvey Davis of Oregon for Mr. Messick. It may be urged by gentlemen that the hardships and privations of a frontier life have rendered Mr. Davis tough. But, gentlemen, is this the time to cavil at toughness? Is this a time to be fastidious concerning trifles? Is this a time to dispute about matters of paltry significance? No, gentlemen, bulk is what we desire. Substance, weight, bulk. These are the supreme requisites now. Not talent, not genius, not education. I insist upon my motion. Mr. Morgan excitedly. Mr. Chairman, I do most strenuously object to this amendment. The gentleman from Oregon is old, and furthermore is bulky only in bone, not in flesh. I ask the gentleman for Virginia if it is soup we want, instead of solid sustenance. If he would delude us with shadows, if he would mock our suffering with an Oregonian specter, I ask him if he can look upon the anxious faces around him, if he can gaze into our sad eyes, if he can listen to the beating of our expectant hearts, and still thrust this famine-stricken fraud upon us. I ask him if he can think of our desolate state, our past sorrows, our dark future, and still unpityingly foist upon us this wreck, this ruin, this tottering swindle, this gnarled and blighted and sapless vagabond from Oregon's inhospitable shores? Never! Applause. The amendment was put to vote after a fiery debate and lost. Mr. Harris was substituted on the first amendment. The balloting then began. Five ballots were held without a choice. On the sixth, Mr. Harris was elected, all voting for him but himself. It was then moved that his election should be ratified with by acclamation, which was lost, in consequence of his again voting against himself. Mr. Radway moved that the House now take up the remaining candidates and go into an election for breakfast. This was carried. On the first ballot there was a tie, half the members favoring one candidate on account of his youth, and half favoring the other on account of his superior size. The president gave the casting vote for the latter, Mr. Messick. This decision created considerable dissatisfaction among the friends of Mr. Ferguson, the defeated candidate, and there was some talk of demanding a new ballot, but in the midst of it a motion to adjourn was carried, and the meeting broke up at once. The preparations for supper diverted the attention of the Ferguson faction from the discussion of their grievance for a long time, and then, when they would have taken it up again, the happy announcement that Mr. Harris was ready drove all thought of it to the winds. We improvised tables by propping up the backs of car seats, and sat down with hearts full of gratitude to the finest supper that had blessed our vision for seven torturing days. How changed we were from what we had been just a few short hours before. Hopeless, sad-eyed misery, hunger, feverish anxiety, desperation, then thankfulness, serenity, joy too deep for utterance now. That, I know, was the cheeriest hour of my eventful life. The winds howled and blew the snow wildly about our prison house, but they were powerless to distress us any more. I liked Harris. He might have been better done, perhaps, but I am free to say that no man ever agreed with me better than Harris, or afforded me so large a degree of satisfaction. Messick was very well, though rather high-flavored, but for genuine nutritiousness and delicacy of fiber, give me Harris. Messick had his good points. I will not attempt to deny it, nor do I wish to do it. But he was no more fitted for breakfast than a mummy would be, sir. Not a bit. Lean? Why, bless me, and tough? Ah, he was very tough. You could not imagine it. You could never imagine anything like it. Do you mean to tell me that... Do not interrupt me, please. After breakfast, we elected a man by the name of Walker from Detroit for supper. He was very good. I wrote his wife so afterward. He was worthy of all praise. I shall always remember Walker. 
He was a little rare, but very good. And then the next morning we had Morgan of Alabama for breakfast. He was one of the finest men I ever sat down to. Handsome, educated, refined, spoke several languages fluently. A perfect gentleman. He was a perfect gentleman and singularly juicy. For supper we had that Oregon patriarch, and he was a fraud. There is no question about it. Old, scraggy, tough. Nobody can picture the reality. I finally said, gentlemen, you can do as you like, but I will wait for another election. And Grimes of Illinois said, gentlemen, I will wait also. When you elect a man that has something to recommend him, I shall be glad to join you again. It soon became evident that there was general dissatisfaction with Davis of Oregon, and so, to preserve the good will that had prevailed so pleasantly since we had had Harris, an election was called, and the result of it was that Baker of Georgia was chosen. He was splendid. Well, after that we had Doolittle, and Hawkins, and McElroy. There was some complaint about McElroy, because he was uncommonly short and thin, and Penrod, and two Smiths, and Bailey. Bailey had a wooden leg, which was clear loss, but he was good otherwise. And an Indian boy, and an organ grinder, and a gentleman by the name of Buckminster, a poor stick of a vagabond that wasn't any good for company, and no account for breakfast. We were glad we got him elected before relief came. And so the blessed relief did come at last? Yes, it came one bright, sunny morning just after election. John Murphy was the choice, and there never was a better, I am willing to testify. But John Murphy came home with us, in the train that came to succor us, and lived to marry the widow Harris. Relict of. Relict of our first choice. He married her, and is happy and respected and prosperous yet. Ah, it was like a novel, sir. It was like a romance. This is my stopping place, sir. I must bid you good-bye. Any time that you can make it convenient to tarry a day or two with me, I shall be glad to have you. I like you, sir. I have conceived an affection for you. I could like you as well as I liked Harris himself, sir. Good day, sir, and a pleasant journey. He was gone. I never felt so stunned, so distressed, so bewildered in my life. But in my soul I was glad he was gone. With all his gentleness of manner and his soft voice, I shuddered whenever he turned his hungry eye upon me, and when I heard that I had achieved his perilous affection, and that I stood almost with the late Harris in his esteem, my heart fairly stood still. I was bewildered beyond description. I did not doubt his word. I could not question a single item in a statement so stamped with the earnestness of truth as his but its dreadful details overpowered me, and threw my thoughts into hopeless confusion. I saw the conductor looking at me. I said, Who is that man? He was a member of Congress once, and a good one. But he got caught in a snowdrift in the cars, and liked to have been starved to death. He got so frostbitten and frozen up generally, and used up for want of something to eat, that he was sick and out of his head two or three months afterwards. He is all right now, only he is a monomaniac, and when he gets on that old subject he never stops till he has eat up that whole carload of people he talks about. He would have finished the crowd by this time, only he had to get out here. He has got their names as pat as ABC. When he gets them all eat up but himself, he always says, Then the hour for the usual election for breakfast having arrived, and there being no opposition, I was duly elected after which, there being no objections offered, I resigned. Thus, I am here. I felt inexpressibly relieved to know that I had only been listening to the harmless vagaries of a madman instead of the genuine experiences of a bloodthirsty cannibal. This has been Cannibalism in the Cars, a short story by Mark Twain, read by Matthew McGraw. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clocks by Jerome K. Jerome 
There are two kinds of clocks. There is the clock that is always wrong and that knows it is wrong and glories in it. And there is the clock that is always right, except when you rely upon it, and then it is more wrong than you would think a clock could be in a civilized country. I remember a clock of this latter type that we had in the house when I was a boy, routing us all up at three o'clock one winter's morning. We had finished breakfast at ten minutes to four, and I got to school a little after five, and sat down on the step outside and cried. Because I thought the world had come to an end. Everything was so deathlike. The man who can live in the same house with one of these clocks and not endanger his chance of heaven about once a month by standing up and telling it what he thinks of it is either a dangerous rival to that old established firm, Job, or else he does not know enough bad language to make it worth his while to start saying anything at all. The great dream of its life is to lure you on into trying to catch a train by it. For weeks and weeks it will keep the most perfect time. If there were any difference in time between that clock and the sun, you would be convinced it was the sun, not the clock that one had seen to. You feel that if that clock happened to get a quarter of a second fast, or the eighth of an instant slow, it would break its heart and die. It is in this spirit of childlike faith in its integrity that, one morning, you gather your family around you in the passage, kiss your children, and afterward wipe your jammy mouth, poke your finger in the baby's eye, promise not to forget to order the coals, wave at last fond adieu with the umbrella, and depart for the railway station. I have never been quite able to decide myself which is the more irritating. To run two miles at the top of your speed, and then to find when you reach the station that you are three quarters of an hour too early, or to stroll along leisurely the whole way and dawdle about outside the booking office, talking to some local idiot, and then to swagger carelessly onto the platform just in time to see the train go out. As for the other class of clocks, the common or always wrong clocks, they are harmless enough. You wind them up at the proper intervals, and once or twice a week you put them right and regulate them, as you call it. And you might just as well try to regulate a London tomcat. But you do all this not from any selfish motives, but from a sense of duty to the clock itself. You want to feel that, whatever may happen, you have done the right thing by it, and that no blame can attach to you. So far as looking to it for any return is concerned, that you never dream of doing, and consequently, you are not disappointed. You ask what the time is, and the girl replies, Well, the clock in the dining room says a quarter past two. But you are not deceived by this. You know that, as a matter of fact, it must be somewhere between nine and ten in the evening. And remembering that you noticed, as a curious circumstance, that the clock was only forty minutes past four hours ago, you mildly admire its energies and resources and wonder how it does it. I myself possess a clock that, for complicated unconventionality and light hearted independence, could, I should think, give points to anything yet discovered in the chronometrical line. As a mere timepiece, it leaves much to be desired, but considered as a self acting conundrum, it is full of interest and variety. I heard of a man once who had a clock that he used to say was of no good to anyone except himself, because he was the only man who understood it. He said it was an excellent clock, and one that you could thoroughly depend upon, but you wanted to know it, to have studied its system. An outsider might easily be misled by it. For instance, he would say, when it strikes fifteen and the hands point to twenty minutes past eleven, I know it is a quarter to eight. His acquaintanceship with that clock must certainly have given him an advantage over the cursory observer. But the great charm about my clock is its reliable uncertainty. It works on no method whatever. It is a pure emotionalist. One day it will be quite frolicsome and gain three hours in the course of the morning and think nothing of it. And the next day it will wish it were dead and be hardly able to drag itself along and lose two hours out of every four and stop altogether in the afternoon too miserable to do anything. And then, getting cheerful once more toward evening, will start off again of its own accord. I do not care to talk much about this clock because when I tell the simple truth concerning it, people think I am exaggerating. 
It is very discouraging to find when you are straining every nerve to tell the truth that people do not believe you, and fancy that you are exaggerating. It makes you feel inclined to go on and exaggerate on purpose, just to show them the difference. I know I often feel tempted to do so myself. It is my early training that saves me. We should always be very careful never to give way to exaggeration. It is a habit that grows upon one, and it is such a vulgar habit, too. In the old times, when poets and dry goods salesmen were the only people who exaggerated, there was something clever and distingue about a reputation for a tendency to over rather than to underestimate the mere bald facts. But everybody exaggerates nowadays. The art of exaggeration is no longer regarded as an extra in the modern bill of education. It is an essential requirement held to be most needful for the battle of life. The whole world exaggerates. It exaggerates everything, from the yearly number of bicycles sold to the yearly number of heathens converted into the hope of salvation and more whiskey. Exaggeration is the basis of our trade, the fallow field of our art and literature, the groundwork of our social life, the foundation of our political existence. As schoolboys, we exaggerate our fights and our marks and our father's debts. As men, we exaggerate our wares. We exaggerate our feelings. We exaggerate our incomes, except the tax collector. And to him, we exaggerate our outgoings. We exaggerate our virtues. We even exaggerate our vices. And being in reality the mildest of men, pretend we are daredevil scamps. We have sunk so low now that we try to act our exaggerations and to live up to our lies. We call it keeping up appearances, and no more bitter phrase could perhaps have been invented to describe our childish folly. If we possess a hundred pounds a year, do we not call it two? Our larder may be low and our grates be chill, but we are happy if the world, six acquaintances and a prying neighbor, gives us credit for one hundred and fifty. And when we have five hundred, we talk of a thousand, and the all-important and beloved world, sixteen friends now, and two of them carriage folks, agree that we really must be spending seven hundred, or, at all events, running into debt up to that figure. But the butcher and baker, who have gone into the matter with the housemaid, know better. After a while, having learned the trick, we launch out boldly and spend like Indian princes, or rather, seem to spend for we know by this time how to purchase the seeming with the seeming, how to buy the appearance of wealth with the appearance of cash. And the dear old world, Beelzebub blessed, for it is his own child, sure enough, there is no mistaking the likeness, it has all his funny little ways, gathers round, applauding and laughing at the lie, and sharing in the cheat, and gloating over the thought of the blow that it knows must sooner or later fall on us, from the Thor-like hammer of truth. And all goes merry as a witch's frolic, until the gray morning dawns. Truth and fact are old-fashioned and out-of-date, my friends, fit only for the dull and vulgar to live by. Appearance, not reality, is what the clever dog grasps at in these clever days. We spurn the dull brown solid earth, we build our lives and homes in the fair-seeming rainbow land of shadow and chimera. To ourselves, sleeping and waking there behind the rainbow, there is no beauty in the house, only a chill damp mist in every room, and over all, a haunting fear of the hour when the gilded clouds will melt away and let us fall, somewhat heavily no doubt, upon the hard world underneath. But there... Of what matter is our misery, our terror? To the stranger our home appears fair and bright. The workers in the fields below look up and envy us our abode of glory and delight. If they think it pleasant, surely we should be content. Have we not been taught to live for others and not for ourselves? And are we not acting up bravely to the teaching in this most curious method? Ah, yes. We are self-sacrificing enough and loyal enough in our devotion to this new-crowned king, the child of Prince Imposture and Princess Pretense. Never before was despot so blindly worshipped. 
never had earthly sovereign yet such worldwide sway. Man, if he would live, must worship. He looks around, and what to him within the vision of his life is the greatest and the best, that he falls down to and does reverence to. To him whose eyes have opened on the nineteenth century, what nobler image can the universe produce than the figure of falsehood in stolen robes? It is cunning and brazen and hollow-hearted, and it realizes his soul's ideal, and he falls and kisses its feet and clings to its skinny knees, swearing fealty to it forevermore. Ah, he is a mighty monarch, bladder-bodied king humbug. Come, let us build up temples of hewn shadows wherein we may adore him, safe from the light. Let us raise him aloft upon our brummagem shields. Long live our coward, false-hearted chief, fit leader for such soldiers as we. Long live the Lord of Lies, anointed. Long live poor King Appearances, to whom all mankind bows the knee. But we must hold him aloft very carefully, O my brother warriors. He needs much keeping up. He has no bones and sinews of his own, the poor old flimsy fellow. If we take our hands from him, he will fall a heap of worn-out rags, and the angry wind will whirl him away and leave us forlorn. Oh, let us spend our lives keeping him up, and serving him, and making him great, that is, evermore puffed out with air and nothingness, until he burst, and we along with him. Burst one day he must, as it is in the nature of bubbles to burst, especially when they grow big. And meanwhile he still reigns over us, and the world grows more and more a world of pretense and exaggeration and lies. And he who pretends and exaggerates and lies the most successfully is the greatest of us all. The world is a gingerbread fair, and we all stand outside our booths and point to the gorgeous colored pictures, and beat the big drum and brag, brag, brag. Life is one great game of brag. Buy my soap, O ye people, and ye will never look old, and the hair will grow again on your bald places, and ye will never be poor or unhappy again, and mine is the only true soap. Oh, beware of spurious imitations. Buy my lotion, all ye that suffer from pains in the head, or the stomach, or the feet, or that have broken arms, or broken hearts, or objectionable mothers-in-law, and drink one bottle a day, and all your troubles will be ended. Come to my church, all ye that want to go to heaven, and buy my penny weekly guide, and pay my pew rates, and, pray ye, have nothing to do with my misguided brother over the road. This is the only safe way. Oh, vote for me, my noble and intelligent electors, and send our party into power, and the world shall be a new place, and there shall be no sin or sorrow any more. And each free and independent voter shall have a brand new utopia made on purpose for him, according to his own ideas, with a good-sized extra unpleasant purgatory attached, to which he can send everybody he does not like. Oh, do not miss this chance. Oh, listen to my philosophy. It is the best and deepest. Oh, hear my songs. They are the sweetest. Oh, buy my pictures, they alone are true art. Oh, read my books, they are the finest. Oh, I am the greatest cheesemonger, I am the greatest soldier, I am the greatest statesman, I am the greatest poet, I am the greatest showman, I am the greatest mountebank, I am the greatest editor, and I am the greatest patriot. We are the greatest nation. We are the only good people. Ours is the only true religion. Bah! How we all yell! How we all brag and bounce and beat the drum and shout, and nobody believes a word we utter, and the people ask one another, saying, How can we tell who is the greatest and the cleverest among these shrieking braggarts? And they answer, There is none great or clever. 
the great and clever men are not here. There is no place for them in this pandemonium of charlatans and quacks. The men you see here are crowing cocks. We suppose the greatest and the best of them are they who crow the loudest and the longest. That is the only test of their merits. Therefore, what is left for us to do but to crow? And the best and the greatest of all of us is he who crows the loudest and the longest on this little dunghill that we call our world. Well, I was going to tell you about our clock. It was my wife's idea getting it in the first instance. We had been to dinner at the Buggles, and the Buggles had just bought a clock. Picked it up in Essex was the way he described the transaction. Buggles is always going about picking up things. He will stand before an old carved bedstead weighing about three tons and say, Yes, pretty little thing. I picked it up in Holland, as though he had found it up by the roadside and slipped it into his umbrella when nobody was looking. Buggles was rather full of this clock. It was of the good old-fashioned grandfather type. It stood eight feet high in a carved oak case and had a deep sonorous solemn tick that made a pleasant accompaniment to the after-dinner chat and seemed to fill the room with an air of homely dignity. We discussed the clock and Buggles said how he loved the sound of its slow grave tick and how when all the house was still and he and it were sitting up all alone together it seemed like some wise old friend talking to him and telling him about the old days and the old ways of thought and the old life and the old people the clock impressed my wife very much she was very thoughtful all the way home and as we went upstairs to our flat she said why could not we have a clock like that she said it would seem like having someone in the house to take care of us all she should fancy it was looking after baby I have a man in Northamptonshire from whom I buy old furniture now and then, and to him I applied. He answered by return to say that he had got exactly the very thing I wanted. He always has. I am very lucky in this respect. It was the quaintest and most old-fashioned clock he had come across for a long while, and he enclosed a photograph in full particulars. Should he send it up? From the photograph and the particulars, it seemed, as he said, the very thing, and I told him, yes, send it up at once. Three days afterward, there came a knock at the door. There had been other knocks at the door before this, of course, but I am dealing merely with the history of the clock. The girl said a couple of men were outside and wanted to see me, and I went to them. I found they were Pickford's carriers, and glancing at the way bill, I saw that it was my clock that they had brought, and I said airily, Oh, yes, it's quite right, bring it up. They said they were very sorry, but that was just the difficulty. They could not get it up. I went down with them, and wedged securely across the second landing of the staircase, I found a box which I should have judged to be the original case in which Cleopatra's needle came over. They said that was my clock. I brought down a chopper and a crowbar, and we sent out and collected in two extra hired ruffians, and the five of us worked away for half an hour and got the clock out, after which the traffic up and down the staircase was resumed, much to the satisfaction of the other tenants. We then got the clock upstairs and put it together, and I fixed it in the corner of the dining room. At first it exhibited a strong desire to topple over and fall on people but by the liberal use of nails and screws and bits of firewood, I made life in the same room with it possible, and then, being exhausted, I had my wounds dressed and went to bed. In the middle of the night, my wife woke me in a state of great alarm to say that the clock had just struck thirteen, and who did I think was going to die? I said I did not know, but hoped it might be the next-door dog. My wife said she had a presentiment it meant baby. There was no comforting her. She cried herself to sleep again. During the course of the morning, I succeeded in persuading her that she must have made a mistake, and she consented to smile once more. In the afternoon, the clock struck thirteen again. This renewed all her fears. She was convinced now that both Baby and I were doomed, 
and that she would be left a childless widow. I tried to treat the matter as a joke, and this only made her more wretched. She said that she could see I really felt as she did, and was only pretending to be light-hearted for her sake, and she said she would try and bear it bravely. The person she chiefly blamed was Buggles. In the night the clock gave us another warning, and my wife accepted it for her Aunt Maria, and seemed resigned. She wished, however, that I had never had the clock, and wondered when, if ever, I should get cured of my absurd craze for filling the house with tomfoolery. The next day the clock struck thirteen four times, and this cheered her up. She said that if we were all going to die, it did not so much matter. Most likely there was a fever or a plague coming, and we should all be taken together. She was quite light-hearted over it. After that, the clock went on and killed every friend and relation we had, and then it started on the neighbors. It struck thirteen all day long for months, until we were sick of slaughter, and there could not have been a human being left alive for miles around. Then it turned over a new leaf and gave up murdering, murdering folks, and took to striking mere harmless thirty-nines and forty-ones. Its favorite number now is thirty-two but once a day it strikes forty-nine. It never strikes more than forty-nine. I don't know why. I have never been able to understand why, but it doesn't. It does strike at regular intervals, but when it feels it wants to and would be better for it. Sometimes it strikes three or four times within the same hour, and at other times it will go for half a day without striking at all. He is an odd fellow." I have thought now and then of having him seen to, and made to keep regular hours and be respectable, but somehow I seem to have grown to love him as he is, with his daring mockery of time. He certainly has not much respect for it. He seems to go out of his way almost to openly insult it. He calls half-past two thirty-eight o'clock, and in twenty minutes from then he says it is one. Is it that he really has grown to feel contempt for his master, and wishes to show it? They say no man is a hero to his valet. May it be that even stony-faced time himself is but a short-lived, puny mortal, a little greater than some others, that is, all, to the dim eyes of this old servant of his? Has he, ticking, ticking, all these years, come at last to see into the littleness of that time that looms so great to our awed human eyes? Is he sane as he grimly laughs and strikes his thirty-fives and forties? Bah! I know you, time, godlike and dread though you seem. What are you but a phantom, a dream like the rest of us here? I less, for you will pass away and be no more. Fear him not, immortal men. Time is but the shadow of the world upon the background of eternity. The End of Clocks by Jerome K. Jerome This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by Betsy Bush. Marquette, Michigan, November 2006. The Cost of Kindness by Jerome K. Jerome Kindness, argued little Mrs. Pennycoop, costs nothing. And speaking generally, my dear, is valued precisely at cost price, retorted Mr. Pennycoop, who, as an auctioneer of twenty years' experience, had enjoyed much opportunity of testing the attitude of the public towards sentiment. "'I don't care what you say, George,' persisted his wife. "'He may be a disagreeable, cantankerous old brute. I don't say he isn't. All the same, the man is going away, and we may never see him again.' "'If I thought there was any fear of our doing so,' observed Mr. Pennycoop, "'I'd turn my back on the Church of England to-morrow and become a Methodist.' "'Don't talk like that, George,' his wife admonished him reprovingly. "'The Lord might be listening to you.' "'If the Lord had to listen to old Cracklethorpe, he'd sympathize with me,' 
was the opinion of Mr. Pennycoop. "'The Lord sends us our trials, and they are meant for our good,' explained his wife. "'They are meant to teach us patience.' "'You are not churchwarden,' retorted her husband. "'You can get away from him. You hear him when he is in the pulpit, where, to a certain extent, he is bound to keep his temper.' "'You forget the rummage sale, George,' Mrs. Pennycoop reminded him, "'to say nothing of the church decorations.' "'The rummage sale,' Mr. Pennycoop pointed out to her, "'occurs only once a year, "'and at that time your own temper I have noticed.' "'I always try to remember I am a Christian,' "'interrupted little Mrs. Pennycoop. "'I do not pretend to be a saint.' "'But whatever I say, I am always sorry for it afterwards. "'You know I am, George.' "'It's what I am saying,' explained her husband. "'A vicar who has contrived in three years "'to make every member of his congregation hate the very sight of a church. "'Well, there's something wrong about it somewhere.' "'Mrs. Pennycoop, gentlest of little women, "'laid her plump and still pretty hands upon her husband's shoulder.' "'Don't think, dear, I haven't sympathized with you. "'You have borne it nobly. "'I have marvelled sometimes that you have been able to control yourself "'as you have done, most times. "'The things that he has said to you.' "'Mr. Pennycoop had slid unconsciously into an attitude "'suggestive of petrified virtue, lately discovered. "'One's own poor self,' observed Mr. Pennycoop, in accents of proud humility. Insults that are merely personal, one can put up with. Though even there, added the senior churchwarden, with momentary dissent, towards the plane of human nature, nobody cares to have it hinted publicly across the vestry table, that one has chosen to collect from the left side, for the expense purpose, of artfully passing over one's own family." "'The children have always had their three-penny bits ready waiting in their hands,' explained Mrs. Pennycoop indignantly. "'It's the sort of thing he says merely for the sake of making a disturbance,' continued the senior churchwarden. "'It's the things he does I draw the line at.' "'The things he has done, you mean, dear,' laughed the little woman, with the accent on the has." "'It is all over now, and we are going to be rid of him. "'I expect, dear, if we only knew, we should find it was his liver. "'You know, George, I remarked to you the first day that he came "'how pasty he looked, and what a singularly unpleasant mouth he had. "'People can't help these things, you know, dear. "'One should look upon them in the light of afflictions and be sorry for them.' "'I could forgive him doing what he does if he didn't seem to enjoy it,' said the senior churchwarden. "'But as you say, dear, he is going, and all I hope and pray is that we never see his like again.' "'And you'll come with me to call upon him, George,' urged little kind Mrs. Pennycoop. "'After all, he has been our vicar for three years, and he must be feeling it, poor man, whatever he may pretend.' "'going away like this, knowing that everybody is glad to see the back of him.' "'Well, I shan't say anything I don't really feel,' stipulated Mr. Pennycoop. "'That will be all right, dear,' laughed his wife. "'So long as you don't say what you do feel, and we'll both of us keep our temper,' further suggested the little woman. "'Whatever happens, remember it will be for the last time.' Little Mrs. Pennycoop's intention was kind and Christian-like. The Reverend Augustus Cracklethorpe would be quitting Winchwood on the Heath the following Monday, never to set foot, so the Reverend Augustus Cracklethorpe himself, and every single member of his congregation hoped sincerely, in the neighborhood again. Hitherto no pains had been taken on either side to disguise the mutual joy with which the parting was looked forward to. The Reverend Augustus Cracklethorpe, M.A., might possibly have been of service to his church in, say, some East End parish of unsavory reputation, 
some mission station far advanced amid the hordes of heathendom. There was inborn instinct of antagonism to everybody and everything surrounding him. His unconquerable disregard for other people's views and feelings, his inspired conviction that everybody but himself was bound to be always wrong about everything, combined with determination to act and speak fearlessly in such belief, might have found their uses. In picturesque little Winchwood on the Heath, among the Kentish hills, retreat beloved of the retired tradesmen, the spinster of moderate means, the reformed bohemian, developing latent instincts towards respectability, these qualities made only for scandal and disunion. For the past two years the Rev. Cracklethorpe's parishioners, assisted by such other of the inhabitants of Winchwood on the Heath, as had happened to come into personal contact with the reverend gentleman, had sought to impress upon him, by hints and innuendos, difficult to misunderstand, their cordial and daily increasing dislike of him, both as a parson and a man. Matters had come to a head by the determination officially announced to him that, failing other alternatives, a deputation of his leading parishioners would wait upon his bishop. This it was that had brought it home to the Rev. Augustus Cracklethorpe, that, as the spiritual guard and comforter of Winchwood on the Heath, he had proved a failure. The Rev. Augustus had sought and secured the care of other souls. The following Sunday morning he had arranged to preach his farewell sermon, and the occasion promised to be a success from every point of view. Churchgoers, who had not visited St. Jude's for months, had promised themselves the luxury of feeling they were listening to the Rev. Augustus Cracklethorpe for the last time. The Rev. Augustus Cracklethorpe had prepared a sermon that, for plain speaking and directness, was likely to leave an impression. The parishioners of St. Jude's, Winchwood on the Heath, had their failings, as we all have. The Rev. Augustus flattered himself that he had not missed out a single one, and was looking forward with pleasurable anticipation to the sensation that his remarks, from his firstly to his sixthly and lastly, were likely to create. What marred the entire business was the impulsiveness of little Mrs. Pennycoop. The Rev. Augustus Cracklethorpe informed in his study on the Wednesday afternoon that Mr. and Mrs. Pennycoop had called, entered the drawing-room a quarter of an hour later, cold and severe, and without offering to shake hands, requested to be informed as shortly as possible for what purpose he had been disturbed. Mrs. Pennycoop had had her speech ready to her tongue. It was just what it should have been, and no more. It referred casually, without insisting on the point, to the duty incumbent upon all of us to remember on occasion we were Christians, that our privilege it was to forgive and forget, that generally speaking there are faults on both sides, that partings should never take place in anger, in short, that little Mrs. Pennycoop and George, her husband, as he was waiting to say for himself, were sorry for everything and anything they may have said or done in the past to hurt the feelings of the Rev. Augustus Cracklethorpe, and would like to shake hands with him and wish him every happiness for the future. The chilling attitude of the Rev. Augustus scattered that carefully rehearsed speech to the winds. It left Mrs. Pennycoop nothing but to retire in choking silence, or to fling herself upon the inspiration of the moment and make up something new. She chose the latter alternative. At first the words came halting. Her husband, manlike, had deserted her in her hour of utmost need, and was fumbling with the doorknob. The steely stare with which the Rev. Cracklethorpe regarded her, instead of chilling her, acted upon her as a spur. It put her on her mettle. He should listen to her. She would make him understand her kindly feeling toward him, if she had to take him by the shoulders and shake it into him. At the end of five minutes, the Rev. Augustus Cracklethorpe, without knowing it, was looking pleased. At the end of another five, Mrs. Pennycoop stopped, not for want of words, but for want of breath. The Rev. Augustus Cracklethorpe replied in a voice that, to his own surprise, was trembling with emotion. 
Mrs. Pennycoop had made his task harder for him. He had thought to leave Winchwood on the heath without a regret. The knowledge he now possessed, that at all events one member of his congregation understood him, as Mrs. Pennycoop had proved to him she understood him, sympathized with him. The knowledge that at least one heart, and that heart Mrs. Pennycoop's, had warmed to him, would transform what he had looked forward to as a blessed relief into a lasting grief. Mr. Pennycoop, carried away by his wife's eloquence, added a few halting words of his own. It appeared from Mr. Pennycoop's remarks that he had always regarded the Rev. Augustus Cracklethorpe as the vicar of his dreams, but misunderstandings in some unaccountable way will arise. The Rev. Augustus Cracklethorpe, it appeared, had always secretly respected Mr. Pennycoop. If at any time his spoken words might have conveyed the contrary impression, that must have arisen from the poverty of our language, which does not lend itself to subtle meanings. Then following the suggestion of tea, Miss Cracklethorpe, sister to the Reverend Augustus, a lady whose likeness to her brother in all respects was startling, the only difference between them being that, while he was clean-shaven, she wore a slight moustache, was called down to grace the board. The visit was ended by Mrs. Pennycoop's remembrance that it was Wilhelmina's night for a hot bath. "'I said more than I intended to,' admitted Mrs. Pennycoop to George, her husband, on the way home. "'But he irritated me.' Rumor of the Pennycoop's visit flew through the parish. Other ladies felt it their duty to show to Mrs. Pennycoop that she was not the only Christian in Winchwood on the heath. Mrs. Pennycoop, it was feared, might be getting a swelled head over this matter. The Rev. Augustus, with pardonable pride, repeated some of the things that Mrs. Pennycoop had said to him. Mrs. Pennycoop was not to imagine herself the only person in Winchwood on the heath capable of generosity that cost nothing. Other ladies could say graceful nothings, could say them even better. Husbands dressed in their best clothes, and carefully rehearsed, were brought in to grace the almost endless procession of disconsolate parishioners hammering at the door of St. Jude's Parsonage. Between Thursday morning and Saturday night, the Rev. Augustus, much to his own astonishment, had been forced to the conclusion that five-sixths of his parishioners had loved him from the first, without hitherto having had opportunity of expressing their real feelings. The eventful Sunday arrived. The Rev. Augustus Cracklethorpe had been kept so busy listening to regrets at his departure, assurances of an esteem hitherto disguised from him, explanations of seeming discourtesies that had been intended as tokens of affectionate regard, that no time had been left to him to think of other matters. Not till he entered the vestry at five minutes to eleven did recollection of his farewell sermon come to him. It haunted him throughout the service. To deliver it after the revelations of the last three days would be impossible. It was the sermon that Moses might have preached to Pharaoh the Sunday prior to the Exodus. To crush with it this congregation of broken-hearted adorers sorrowing for his departure would be inhuman. The Rev. Augustus tried to think of passages that might be selected, altered. There were none. From beginning to end it contained not a single sentence capable of being made to sound pleasant by any ingenuity whatsoever. The Rev. Augustus Cracklethorpe climbed slowly up the pulpit steps, without an idea in his head of what he was going to say. The sunlight fell upon the upturned faces of a crowd that filled every corner of the church. So happy, so buoyant a congregation, the eyes of the Rev. Augustus Cracklethorpe had never till that day looked down upon. The feeling came to him that he did not want to leave them, that they did not wish him to go, could he doubt? Only by regarding them as a collection of the most shameless hypocrites ever gathered together under one roof. The Rev. Augustus Cracklethorpe dismissed the passing suspicion as a suggestion of the evil one, folded the neatly written manuscript that lay before him on the desk, and put it aside. He had no need of a farewell sermon. The arrangements made could easily be altered. The Rev. Augustus Cracklethorpe spoke from his pulpit for the first time, 
an impromptu. The Reverend Augustus Cracklethorpe wished to acknowledge himself in the wrong, foolishly founding his judgment upon the evidence of a few men, whose names there would be no need to mention, members of the congregation who, he hoped, would one day be sorry for the misunderstandings they had caused, brethren whom it was his duty to forgive. He had assumed the parishioners of St. Jude's Winchwood on the Heath to have taken a personal dislike to him. He wished to publicly apologize for the injustice he had unwittingly done to their heads and to their hearts. He now had it from their own lips that a libel had been put upon them. So far from their wishing him departure, it was self-evident that his going would inflict upon them a great sorrow. With the knowledge he now possessed of the respect, one might almost say the veneration, with which the majority of that congregation regarded him, knowledge he admitted acquired somewhat late, it was clear to him he could still be of help to them in their spiritual need. To leave a flock so devoted would stamp him as an unworthy shepherd. The ceaseless stream of regrets at his departure that had been poured into his ear during the last four days, he had decided at the last moment to pay heed to. He would remain with them, on one condition. There quivered across the sea of humanity below him a movement that might have suggested to a more observant watcher the convulsive clutchings of some drowning man at some chance straw. But the Reverend Augustus Cracklethorpe was thinking of himself. The parish was large, and he was no longer a young man. Let them provide him with a conscientious and energetic curate. He had such a one in his mind's eye, a near relation of his own, who, for a small stipend, that was hardly worth mentioning, would, he knew it for a fact, accept the post. The pulpit was not the place in which to discuss these matters, but in the vestry afterwards he would be pleased to meet such members of the congregation as might choose to stay. The question agitating the majority of the congregation during the singing of the hymn was the time it would take them to get outside the church. There still remained a faint hope that the Reverend Augustus Cracklethorpe, not obtaining his curate, might consider it due to his own dignity to shake from his feet the dust of a parish generous in sentiment but obstinately close-fisted when it came to putting its hands into its pockets. But for the parishioners of St. Jude's that Sunday was a day of misfortune. Before there could be any thought of moving, the Reverend Augustus raised his surpliced hand and begged leave to acquaint them with the contents of a short note that had just been handed up to him. It would send them all home, he felt sure, with joy and thankfulness in their hearts. An example of Christian benevolence was among them that did honor to the church. Here a retired wholesale clothier from the east end of London, a short tubby gentleman who had recently taken the manor house, was observed to turn scarlet. A gentleman hitherto unknown to them had signaled his advent among them by an act of munificence that should prove a shining example to all rich men. Mr. Horatio Cooper the reverend gentleman found some difficulty, apparently, in deciphering the name. Coopersmith, sir, with a hyphen, came in a thin whisper, the voice of the still scarlet-faced clothier. Mr. Horatio Coopersmith, Mr. Horatio Coopersmith, taking, the reverend Augustus felt confident, a not unworthy means of grappling to himself, thus early the hearts of his fellow townsmen, had expressed his desire to pay for the expense of a curate entirely out of his own pocket. Under these circumstances, there would be no further talk of a farewell between the Reverend Augustus Cracklethorpe and his parishioners. It would be the hope of the Reverend Augustus Cracklethorpe to live and die the pastor of St. Jude's. A more solemn-looking, sober congregation than the congregation that emerged that Sunday morning from St. Jude's in Winchwood-on-the-Heath had never, perhaps, passed out of a church door. "'He'll have more time on his hands,' said Mr. Biles, retired wholesale ironmonger and junior churchwarden, to Mrs. Biles, turning the corner of Acacia Avenue. "'He'll have more time to make himself a curse and a stumbling-block.' 
"'And if this near relation of his is anything like him—' "'Which you may depend upon it is the case, "'or he'd never have thought of him,' "'was the opinion of Mr. Biles. "'I shall give that Mrs. Pennycoop,' said Mrs. Biles, "'a piece of my mind when I meet her.' "'But of what use was that?' End of The Cost of Kindness by Jerome K. Jerome This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Country Life in Canada in the Thirties by Kenneth Height Adapted from the Ontario Readers Country life in Western Canada in the thirties was very simple and uneventful. There were no lines of social divisions such as now exist. All alike had to toil to win and maintain a home, and if, as was natural, some were more successful in the rough battle of pioneer life than others, they did not feel, on that account, disposed to treat their neighbours as their inferiors. Neighbours, they well knew, were too few and too desirable to be coldly and haughtily treated. Had not all the members of each community hewn their way side by side into the fastnesses of the Canadian bush? And what could a little additional wealth do for them, when the remoteness of the centres which might supply luxuries enforced simplicity and made superfluities almost impossible? The furnishings of their houses were plain, and the chief articles of dress— if substantial and comfortable, were of course homespun, the product of their own labour. The sources of amusement were limited. The day of the harmonium or piano had not come. Music, except in its simplest vocal form, was not cultivated. Only the occasional presence of some fiddler afforded rare seasons of merriment to the delight both of old and young. The motto of early to bed and early to rise was, even in winter, the strict rule of family life. In the morning all were up, and breakfast was over usually before seven. As soon as the grey light of dawn appeared, men and boys were off to the barns, not merely to feed the cattle, but to engage in the needful and tedious labour of threshing by hand. In the evenings the family gathered together for lighter tasks and pleasant talk around a glowing fire. In firewood, at least, there was, in those days, no need for economy. We scarcely realize how largely little things may contribute to convenience and comfort. There were no lucifer matches at that date. It was needful to cover up carefully the live coals on the hearth before going to bed, so that there might be the means of starting the fire in the morning. This precaution was rarely unsuccessful, but sometimes a member of the family had to set out for a supply of fire from a neighbour's, in order that breakfast might be prepared. I remember well having to crawl out of my warm nest and run through the keen, frosty air for half a mile or more to fetch live coals from a neighbour's. It was, however, my father's practice to keep bundles of finely split pine sticks tipped with brimstone. With the aid of these, the mere spark served to start the fire. In the spring, tasks of various kinds crowded rapidly upon us. The hams and beefs that had been salted down in casks during the preceding autumn were taken out of the brine, washed off, and hung in the smokehouse. On the earthen floor, beech or maple was burned. The oily smoke, given off by the combustion of these woods in a confined space, not only acted as a preservative, but also lent a special flavour to the meat. Then ploughing, fencing, sowing, and planting followed in quick succession. No hands could be spared. The children must drive the cows to and from pasture. They must also take a hand at churning. It was a weary task, I remember well, to stand, perhaps for an hour, and drive the dasher up and down through the thick cream. How often did we examine the handle for evidence that the butter was forming? And what was the relief when the monotonous task was at an end? As soon as my legs were long enough, I had to follow a team. Indeed, I drove the horses, mounted on the back of one of them, when my nether limbs were scarcely sufficiently grown to give me a grip. 
The instruments for the agricultural operations were few and rough. Iron ploughs with cast-iron mould-boards and shares were commonly employed. Compared with our modern ploughs they were clumsy things, but a vast improvement on the earlier wooden ploughs which, even at that date, had not wholly gone out of use. For drags, tree-tops were frequently used. In June came sheep-washing. The sheep were driven to the bay shore and secured in a pen. One by one they were taken out, and the fleeces carefully washed. Within a day or two shearing followed in the barn. The wool was sorted. Some was reserved to be carted by hand. The remainder was sent to the mills to be turned into rolls. Then, day after day, for weeks, the noise of the spinning wheel was heard, accompanied by the steady beat of the girls' feet, as they walked forward and backward, drawing out and twisting the thread and running it on the spindle. This was work that required some skill, for on the fineness and evenness of the thread the character of the fabric largely depended. Finally the yarn was carried to the weavers to be converted into cloth. The women of the family found their hands very full in the thirties. Besides the daily round of housewifely cares, every season brought its special duties. There were wild strawberries and raspberries to be picked and prepared for daily consumption or to be preserved for winter use. Besides milking, there was the making both of butter and cheese. There was no nurse to take care of the children, no cook to prepare the dinner. To be sure, in households, when the work was beyond the powers of the family, the daughter of some neighbor might come as a helper. Though hired, she was treated in all respects as one of the family, and in return was likely to take the same sort of interest in the work as if the tie that bound her to the family was closer than wages. In truth, such help was regarded as a favor, and not as any way affecting the girl's social position. The girls in those days were more at home in a kitchen than in a drawing-room. They did better execution at a tub than at a spinet, and could handle a rolling-pin more satisfactorily than a sketch-book. At a pinch they could even use a rake or fork to good purpose in field or barn. Their finishing education was received at the country school, along with their brothers. Of fashion-books and milliners, few of them had any experience. Country life in Canada was plodding in the thirties, and there was no varied outlook. The girls trained for future life was mainly at the hands of their mothers. The boys followed in the footsteps of their fathers. Neither sex felt that life was cramped or burdensome on that account. They were content to live as their parents had done. And, though we can see that, as compared with later conditions, there may be something wanting in such an existence, this at least we know, that, in such a school, and by such masters, the foundations of Canadian character and prosperity were laid. End of Country Life in Canada in the Thirties by Kenneth Height This is a LibriVox recording, and all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Lucy Burgoyne. Enter Mitchell by Henry Lawson. The western train had just arrived at Redfern Railway Station with a lot of ordinary passengers and one swagman. He was short and stout and bow-legged and freckled and sandy. He had red hair and small, twinkling grey eyes. And what often was such things? The expression of a born comedian. He was dressed in a ragged, well-washed print shirt, an old black waistcoat with a calico back, a pair of cloudy moleskins patched at the knees and held up by a plaited green hide belt, buckled loosely round his hips, a pair of well-worn fuzzy blucher boots, and a soft felt hat, green with age and with no brim worth mentioning, and no crown to speak of. He swung a swag onto the platform, shouldered it, pulled out a billy and a water bag, then went to a dog box in the brake van. Five minutes later he appeared on the edge of the cab platform with an anxious looking cattle dog crouching against his legs and one end of the chain in his hand. He eased down the swag against the post, turned his face to the city, tilted his hat forward 
and scratched the well-developed back of his head with a little finger. He seemed undecided what track to take. Cab, sir? The swagman turned slowly and regarded Cabby with a quiet grin. Now, do I look as if I want a cab? Well, why not? No harm anyway, I thought you might want a cab. Swaggy scratched his head reflectively. Well, he said, you're the first man that has thought so these ten years. What do I want with a cab? To go where you're going, of course. Do I look knocked up? I didn't say you did. And I didn't say you said I did. Now, I've been on the track this five years. I've tramped two thousand miles since last Christmas, and I don't see why I can't tramp that last mile. Do you think my old dog wants a cab? The dog shivered and whimpered. He seemed to want to get away from the crowd. But then, you see, you ain't going to carry that swag through the streets, are you? asked the cabman. Why not? Who'll stop me? There ain't no law again it, I believe. But then you see it don't look well, you know. Ah, I thought we'd get to it at last. The traveller upended his bluey against his knee, gave it an affectionate pat, then straightened himself up and looked fixedly at the cabman. Now look here, he said, sternly and impressively. Can you see anything wrong with that old swag of mine? It was a stout, dumpy swag with a red blanket outside patched with blue and the edge of a blue blanket showing in the inner rings at the end. The swag might have been newer. It might have been cleaner. It might have been hooped with decent straps instead of bits of clothesline and green hide, but otherwise there was nothing the matter with it as swags go. I've humped that old swag for years, continued the bushman. I've carried that old swag thousands of miles, as that old dog knows, and no one ever bothered about the look of it, or of me, or of my old dog, neither. And do you think I'm going to be ashamed of that old swag for a cabbie or anyone else? Do you think I'm going to study anybody's feelings? No one ever studied mine. I'm in two minds to summon you for using insulting language t towards me. He lifted the swag by the twisted towel which served for a shoulder strap, swung it into the cab, got in himself and hauled the dog after him. You can drive me somewhere where I can leave my swag and dog while I get some decent clothes to see a tailor in, he said to the cabman. My old dog ain't used to cabs, you see. Then he added reflectively, I drove a cab myself once for five years in Sydney. End of Enter Mitchell by Henry Lawson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read and recorded by William Kuhn, November 2006. His Worship the Goose Driver by Arnold Bennett. 1. It was an amiable but deceitful afternoon in the third week of December. Snow fell heavily in the windows of the confectioner's shops, and Father Christmas smiled in Keats's bazaar the fawning smile of a myth who knows himself to be exploded. But beyond these and similar efforts to remedy the forgetfulness of a careless climate, there was no sign anywhere in the five towns, and especially in Bursley, of the immediate approach of the season of peace, goodwill, and gluttony on earth. At the Tiger, next door to Keats's in the marketplace, Mr. Josiah Topham Curtenty had put down his glass, the port was kept specially for him, and told his boon companion, Mr. Gordon, that he must be going. These two men had one powerful sentiment in common. They loved the same woman. Mr. Curtenty, aged twenty-six in heart, thirty-six in mind, and forty-six in looks, was fifty-six only in years. He was a rich man. He had made money as an earthenware manufacturer in the good old times before Satan was ingenious enough to invent German competition, American tariffs, and the price of coal. He was still making money with the aid of his son Harry, who now managed the works, but he never admitted that he was making it. 
No one has yet succeeded, and no one ever will succeed, in catching an earthenware manufacturer in the act of making money. He may confess with a sigh that he has performed the feat in the past. He may give utterance to a vague, preposterous hope that he will perform it again in the remote future. But as for surprising him in the very act, you would as easily surprise a hen laying an egg. Nowadays, Mr. Curtenty, commercially secure, spent most of his energy in helping to shape and control the high destinies of the town. He was deputy mayor and chairman of the General Purposes Committee of the town council. He was also a guardian of the poor, a justice of the peace, president of the Society for the Prosecution of Felons, a sidesman, an odd fellow, and several other things that meant dining, shrewdness, and good nature. He was a short, stiff, stout, red-faced man, jolly with the jollity that springs from a kind heart, a humorous disposition, and perfect digestion, and the respectful deference of one's bank manager. Without being a member of the Browning Society, he held firmly to the belief that all's right with the world. Mr. Gordon, who has but a sorry part in the drama, was a younger, quieter, less forceful person, rather shy, a municipal mediocrity, perhaps a little inflated that day by reason of his having been elected to the chairmanship of the Gas and Lighting Committee. Both men had sat on their committees at the town hall across the way that deceitful afternoon, and we see them now, after refreshment well earned and consumed, about to separate and sink into private life. But as they came out into the portico of the tiger, the famous calypso-like barmaid of the tiger a hovering enchantment in the background, it occurred that a flock of geese were meditating, as geese will, in the middle of the road. The goose herd, a shabby middle-aged man, looked as though he had recently lost the battle of Marathon, and was asking himself whether the path of his retreat might not lie through the bar parlor of the tiger. The business pretty good, Mr. Curtenty inquired of him cheerfully. In the five towns, business takes the place of weather as a topic of salutation. Business, echoed the goose herd. In that one unassisted noun, scorning the aid of verb, adjective, or adverb, the goose herd, by a masterpiece of profound and subtle emphasis, contrived to express the fact that he existed in a world of dead illusions, that he had become a convert to Schopenhauer, and that Mr. Curtenty's inapposite geniality was a final grievance to him. "'There ain't no business,' he added. "'Ah,' returned Mr. Curtenty, thoughtful. Such an assertion of the entire absence of business was a reflection upon the town. "'See thee,' said the goose-herd in ruthless accents. "'I drove these air geese into this air town this morning.' Here he exaggerated the number of miles traversed. Twelve geese and two gander, a brent and a barnacle. And how many is there now? How many? Fourteen, said Mr. Gordon, having counted. And Mr. Curtenty gazed at him in reproach, for that he, a town councillor, had thus mathematically demonstrated the commercial decadence of Bursley. Market overstocked, eh? Mr. Curtenty suggested throwing a side glance at Callier, the poulterer's close by, which was crammed with everything that flew, swam, or waddled. "'Call this a market,' said the gooseherd. "'I take my lot over to Hanbridge, where there's a bit doing by all accounts.' Now, Mr. Curtenty had not the least intention of buying those geese, but nothing could be better calculated to straighten the back of a Bursley man than a reference to the mercantile activity of Hanbridge, that Chicago of the five towns. "'How much for the lot?' he inquired. In that moment he reflected upon his reputation. He knew that he was a cure, a card, a character. He knew that everyone would think it just like Joss Curtenty, the renowned deputy mayor of Bursley, to stand on the steps of the tiger and pretend to chaffer with a goose herd for a flock of geese. His imagination caught the sound of an oft-repeated inquiry, did you hear about old Joss's latest, trying to buy them their geese? And the appreciative laughter that would follow. The gooseherd faced him in silence. Well, said Mr. Curtenty again, his eyes twinkling, how much for the lot? 
the gooseherd gloomily and suspiciously named a sum. Mr. Curtenty named a sum startlingly less, ending in sixpence. "'I'll take it,' said the gooseherd, in a tone that closed on the bargain like a vice. The deputy mayor perceived himself the owner of twelve geese and two ganders, one Brent, one Barnacle. It was a shock, but he sustained it. Involuntarily he looked at Mr. Gordon. "'How are you going to get em home, Cotenti?' asked Gordon, with coarse sarcasm. "'Drive em? Nettled, Mr. Curtenty retorted, "'Now then, gas Gordon!' The barmaid laughed aloud at this sobriquet, which that same evening was all over the town, and which has stuck ever since to the chairman of the gas and lighting committee. Mr. Gordon wished, and has never ceased to wish, either that he had been elected to some other committee, or that his name had begun with some other letter. The gooseherd received the purchase money like an affront, but when Mr. Curtenty, full of private mirth, said, "'Chuck us your stick in,' he gave him the stick, and smiled under reservation. Jos Curtenty had no use for the geese. He could conceive no purpose which they might be made to serve, no smallest corner for them in his universe. Nevertheless, since he had rashly stumbled into a ditch, he determined to emerge from it grandly, impressively, magnificently. He instantaneously formed a plan by which he would snatch victory out of defeat. He would take Gordon's suggestion, and himself drive the geese up to his residence in Hillport, that lofty and aristocratic suburb. It would be an immense, an unparalleled farce, a wonder, a topic for years, the crown of his reputation as a card. He announced his intention with that misleading sobriety and ordinariness of tone which has been the foible of many great humorists to assume. Mr. Gordon lifted his head several times very quickly as if to say, What next? And then actually departed, which was a clear proof that the man had no imagination and no soul. The goose herd winked. You'll be rightly called Catenti, mister, said he and passed into the tiger. That's the best joke I ever heard, Joss said to himself. I wonder whether he saw it. Then the procession of the geese and the deputy mayor commenced. Now, it is not to be assumed that Mr. Curtenty was necessarily bound to look foolish in the driving of geese. He was no nincompoop. On the contrary, he was one of those men who, bringing common sense and presence of mind to every action of their lives, do nothing badly, and always escape the ridiculous. He marshaled his geese with noble gumption, adopted towards them exactly the correct stress of persuasion, and presently he smiled to see them preceding him in the direction of Hillport. He looked neither to right nor left, but simply at his geese, and thus the quidnuncs of the marketplace and the supporters of shop fronts were unable to catch his eye. He tried to feel like a goose herd, and such was his histrionic quality, his instinct for the dramatic, that he was a goose herd, despite his blue melt and overcoat, his hard felt hat with the flattened top and that opulent curving collar which was the secret despair of the young dandies of Hillport. He had the most natural air in the world. The geese were the victims of this imaginative effort of Mr. Curtenty's. They took him seriously as a gooseherd. These fourteen intelligences, each with an object in life, each bent on self-aggrandizement and the satisfaction of desires, began to follow the line of least resistance in regard to the superior intelligence unseen but felt behind them, feigning, as geese will, that it suited them to submit, and that in reality they were still quite independent. But in the peculiar eye of the barnacle gander, who was leading, an observer with sufficient fancy might have deciphered a mild revolt against this triumph of the absurd, the accidental, and the futile a passive yet Promethean spiritual defiance of the supreme powers. Mr. Curtenty got his fourteen intelligences safely across the top of St. Luke's Square, and gently urged them into the steep defile of Old Castle Street. By this time rumor had passed in front of him and run off down side streets like water let into an irrigation system. At every corner was a knot of people, at most windows a face, and the deputy mayor never spoke nor smiled. The farce was enormous, 
the memory of it would survive revolutions and religions. Halfway down Oldcastle Street, the first disaster happened. Electric tramways had not then knitted the five towns in a network of steel, but the last word of civilization and refinement was about to be uttered, and a gang of men were making patterns with wires on the skyscape of Old Castle Street. One of the wires, slipping from its temporary gripper, swirled with an extraordinary sound into the roadway, and writhed there in spirals. Several of Mr. Curtenty's geese were knocked down, and rose obviously annoyed. But the barnacle gander fell with a clinging circle of wire round his muscular, glossy neck, and did not rise again. It was a violent, mysterious, agonizing, and sudden death for him, and must have confirmed his theories about the arbitrariness of things. The thirteen passed pitilessly on. Mr. Curtenty freed the gander from the coiling wire, and picked it up, but finding it far too heavy to carry, he handed it to a corporation road-sweeper. "'I'll send for it,' he said. "'Wait here.' These were the only words uttered by him during a memorable journey. The second disaster was that the deceitful afternoon turned to rain, cold, cruel rain, persistent rain, full of sinister significance. Mr. Curtenty ruefully raised the velvet of his Melton. As he did so, a brougham rolled into Old Castle Street, a little in front of him, from the direction of St. Peter's Church, and vanished towards Hillport. He knew the carriage. He had bought it and paid for it. Deep, far down in his mind, stirred the thought, "'I'm the least bit glad she didn't see me.' He had the suspicion, which recurs even to optimists, that happiness is, after all, a chimera. The third disaster was that the sun set and darkness descended. Mr. Curtenty had, unfortunately, not reckoned with this diurnal phenomenon. He had not thought upon the undesirability of being under compulsion to drive geese by the sole illumination of gas lamps lighted by corporation gas. After this, disasters multiplied. Dark and the rain had transformed the farce into something else. It was five-thirty when at last he reached the firs and the garden of the firs was filled with lamentable complainings of a remnant of geese. His man, Pond, met him with a stable lantern. "'Damp, sir,' said Pond. "'Oh, now to speak of,' said Mr. Curtenty, and taking off his hat, he shot the fluid contents of the brim into Pond's face. It was his way of dotting the eye of irony. "'Mrs. Come in?' "'Yes, sir. I have but just rubbed the holes down.' So far no reference to the surrounding geese, all forlorn in the heavy winter rain. "'I've gotten a two-three geese and one gander here for Christmas,' said Mr. Curtenty after a pause. To inferiors he always used the dialect. "'Yes, sir.' "'Turn em into the orchard, as you call it.' "'Yes, sir.' "'They aren't all here. Thou man put the horse in the trap and fetch the rest thy send.' "'Yes, sir.' "'One's dead.' A roadman's taken care on it in Old Castle Street. he wait for thee. Give him sixpence. Yes, sir. There's another got into the cut. Canal. Yes, sir. There's another strayed in the railway line. It happened it's run over by this. Yes, sir. And one's making the best of her way to Old Castle. I couldn't have coax her in here. Yes, sir. Collect em. Yes, sir. Mr. Curtenty walked away towards the house. Mr. Pond called after him, flashing the lantern. Well, lad, there's no gander in this lot. Hast forgotten to count thy son? Mr. Curtenty answered blithely from the shelter of the side door. But within himself he was a little crestfallen to think that the surviving gander should have escaped his vigilance, even in the darkness. He had set out to drive the geese home, and he had driven them home, most of them. He had kept his temper, his dignity, his cheerfulness. He had got a bargain in geese. So much was indisputable ground for satisfaction. And yet the feeling of an anticlimax would not be dismissed. Upon the whole, his transit lacked glory. It had begun in splendor, but it had ended in discomfort and almost ignominy. 
Nevertheless, Mr. Curtenty's unconquerable soul asserted itself in a quite genuine and tuneful whistle as he entered the house. The fate of the Brent Gander was never ascertained. 2. The dining-room of the Furs was a spacious and inviting refectory, which owed nothing of its charm to William Morris, Regent Street, or the Arts and Crafts Society. Its triple aim was richness, solidity, and comfort, but especially comfort, and this aim was achieved in new oak furniture of immovable firmness, in a turkey carpet which swallowed up the feet like a feather bed, and in large oil paintings whose darkly glinting frames were a guarantee of their excellence. On a winter's night, as now, the room was at its richest, solidest, most comfortable. The blue plush curtains were drawn on their stout brass rods across door and French window. Finest select silkstone fizzed and flamed in a patent grate, which had the extraordinary gift of radiating heat into the apartment instead of up the chimney. The shaded Wellsbach lights of the chandelier cast a dazzling luminance on the tea-table of snow and silver, while leaving the pictures in a gloom so discreet that not Ruskin himself could have decided whether these were by Whistler or Peter Paul Rubens. On either side of the marble mantelpiece were two easy chairs of an immense, incredible capacity, chairs of crimson plush for titans, chairs softer than moss, more pliant than a loving heart, more enveloping than a caress. In one of these chairs, that to the left of the fireplace, Mr. Curtenty was accustomed to snore every Saturday and Sunday afternoon, and almost every evening. The other was usually empty, but tonight it was occupied by Mrs. Curtenty, the jewel of the casket. In the presence of her husband she always used a small rocking chair of ebonized cane. To glance at this short, slight, yet plump little creature as she reclined crosswise in the vast chair, leaving great spaces of the seat unfilled, was to think rapturously to oneself, This is a woman. Her fluffy head was such a dot against the back of the chair, the curve of her chubby ringed hand above the head was so adorable, her black eyes were so provocative, her slippered feet so wee, yes, and there was something so mysteriously thrilling about the fall of her skirt that you knew instantly her name was Clara, her temper both fiery and obstinate, and her personality distracting. You knew that she was one of those women of frail physique who can endure fatigues that would destroy a camel, one of those demonic women capable of doing without sleep for ten nights in order to nurse you, capable of dying and seeing you die rather than give way about the tint of a necktie, capable of laughter and tears simultaneously, capable of never being in the wrong except for the idle whim of so being. She had a big mouth and very wide nostrils, and her years were thirty-five. It was no matter. It would have been no matter had she been a hundred and thirty-five. In short... Clara Curtenty wore tight-fitting black silk with a long gold chain that descended from her neck nearly to her waist and was looped up in the middle to an old-fashioned gold brooch. She was in mourning for a distant relative. Black preeminently suited her. Consequently, her distant relatives died at frequent intervals. The basalt clock on the mantelpiece trembled and burst into the song of six. Clara Curtenty rose swiftly from the easy chair and took her seat in front of the tea tray. Almost at the same moment a neat black-and-white parlor maid brought in teapot, copper kettle, and a silver-covered dish containing hot pikelets, then departed. Clara was alone again, not the same Clara now, but a personage demure, prim, precise, frightfully upright of back a sort of impregnable stronghold, without doubt a deputy mayoress. At five past six, Josiah Curtenty entered the room, radiant from a hot bath and happy in dry clothes, a fine if mature figure of a man. His presence filled the whole room. "'Well, my chuck,' he said, and kissed her on the cheek. She gazed at him with a look that might mean anything. Did she raise her cheek to his greeting? or was it fancy that she had endured rather than accepted his kiss? He was scarcely sure, 
and if she had endured instead of accepting the kiss, was her mood to be attributed to his lateness for tea, or the fact that she was aware of the episode of the geese? He could not divine. Pikelets! Good! he exclaimed, taking the cover off the dish. This strong, successful, and dominant man adored his wife, and went in fear of her. She was his first love, but his second spouse. They had been married ten years. In those ten years they had quarreled only five times, and she had changed the very color of his life. Till his second marriage he had boasted that he belonged to the people, and retained the habits of the people. Clara, though she also belonged to the people, very soon altered all that. Clara had a passion for the genteel, like many warm-hearted, honest, clever, and otherwise sensible persons. Clara was a snob, but a charming little snob. She ordered him to forget that he belonged to the people. She refused to listen when he talked in the dialect. She made him dress with opulence, and even with tidiness. She made him buy a fashionable house and fill it with fine furniture. She made him buy a brougham in which her gentility could pay calls and do shopping. She shopped in Old Castle, where a decrepit aristocracy of tradesmen sneered at Hanbridge's lack of style. She had her day. She taught the servants to enter the reception rooms without knocking. She took tea in bed in the morning, and tea in the afternoon in the drawing room. She would have instituted dinner at seven, but she was a wise woman, and realized that too much tyranny often means revolution, and the crumbling of thrones. Therefore the ancient plebeian custom of high tea at six was allowed to persist and continue. She it was who had compelled Josiah, or bewitched, beguiled, coaxed, and wheedled him, after a public refusal, to accept the unusual post of deputy mayor. In two years' time he might count on being mayor. Why then should Clara have been so anxious for this secondary dignity? Because in that year of royal festival, Bursley, in common with many other boroughs, had a fancy to choose a mayor out of the House of Lords. The Earl of Chell, a magnate of the county, had consented to wear the mayoral chain and dispense the mayoral hospitalities on condition that he was provided with a deputy for daily use. It was the idea of herself being deputy to the lovely, meddlesome, and arrogant Countess of Chell that had appealed to Clara. The deputy of a countess at length spoke. "'Will Harry be late to the works again to-night?' she asked in her colder, small-talk manner, which committed her to nothing, as Josiah well knew. Her way of saying that word Harry was inimitably significant. She gave it an air. She liked Harry, and she liked Harry's name, because it had a Kensingtonian sound. Harry, so accomplished in business, was also a dandy, and he was a dog. My stepson, she loved to introduce him, so tall, manly, distinguished, and dandiacal. Harry, enriched by his own mother, belonged to a London club. He ran down to Landuno for weekends, and it was reported that he had been behind the scenes at the Alhambra. Clara felt for the word Harry, the unreasoning affection which most women lavish on George. "'Like as not,' said Josiah. "'I haven't been to the works this afternoon.' Another silence fell, and then Josiah, feeling himself unable to bear any further suspense as to his wife's real mood and temper, suddenly determined to tell her all about the geese, and know the worst. And precisely at the instant that he opened his mouth, the maid opened the door and announced, "'Mr. Duncalf wishes to see you at once, sir. He won't keep you a minute.' "'Ask him in here, Mary,' said the deputy mayor sweetly, "'and bring another cup and saucer.' Mr. Duncalf was the town clerk of Bursley, legal, portly, dry, and a little shy. "'I won't stop, Cotenti. How do you do, Mrs. Cotenti? No, thanks, really.' but she, smiling exquisitely gracious, flattered and smoothed him into a chair. "'Any interesting news, Mr. Duncalf,' she said and added, "'but we're glad that anything should have brought you in.' "'Well,' said Duncalf, "'I've just had a letter by the afternoon post from Lord Chell.' "'Oh, the Earl, indeed, how very interesting!' "'What's he after?' inquired Josiah cautiously. 
He says he's just been appointed Governor of East Australia. Announcement will be in tomorrow's papers. And so he must regretfully resign the mayoralty. Says he'll pay the fine, but of course we shall have to remit that by special resolution of the council. Well, I'm damned, Josiah exclaimed. Top em, Mrs. Curtenty remonstrated, but with a delightful acquitting dimple. She never would call him Josiah, much less Joss. Topham came more easily to her lips, and sometimes Top. "'Your husband,' said Mr. Duncalf impressively to Clara, "'will, of course, have to step into the mayor's shoes, "'and you'll have to fill the place of the countess.' He paused and added, "'And very well you'll do it, too. "'Very well. "'Nobody better.' The town clerk frankly admired Clara. "'Mr. Duncalf! "'Mr. Duncalf!' She raised a finger at him. "'You are the most shameless flatterer in the town.' The flatterer was flattered. Having delivered the weighty news, he had leisure to savor his own importance as the bearer of it. He drank a cup of tea. Josiah was thoughtful, but Clara brimmed over with a fascinating loquacity. Then Mr. Duncalf said that he really must be going, and having arranged with the mayor-elect to call a special meeting of the council at once, he did go, all the while wishing he had the enterprise to stay. Josiah accompanied him to the front door. The sky had now cleared. "'Thank ye for calling,' said the host. "'Oh, that's all right. Good night, Catenti. Got that goose out of the canal?' So the story was abroad. Josiah returned to the dining-room, imperceptibly smiling. At the door the sight of his wife halted him. The face of that precious and adorable woman flamed out lightning and all menace and offense. Her lowering eyes showed what a triumph of dissimulation she must have achieved in the presence of Mr. Duncalf, but now she could speak her mind. "'Yes, Topham!' she exploded as though finishing an harangue. "'And on this day of all days you choose to drive geese in the public road behind my carriage!' Joss was stupefied, annihilated. "'Did you see me then, Clary?' He vainly tried to carry it off. "'Did I see you? Of course I saw you!' She withered him up with the hot wind of scorn. "'Well,' he said foolishly, "'how was I to know that the Earl would resign just today? "'How were you to—' Harry came in for his tea. He glanced from one to the other, discreet, silent. On the way home he had heard the tale of the geese in seven different forms. The deputy mayor, so soon to be mayor, walked out of the room." "'Pond has just come back, father,' said Harry. "'I drove up the hill with him.' And as Josiah hesitated a moment in the hall, he heard Clara exclaim, "'Oh, Harry!' "'Damn!' he murmured. 3. The signal of the following day contained the announcement which Mr. Duncalf had forecast. It also stated on authority that Mr. Josiah Curtenty would wear the mayoral chain of Bursley immediately, and added as its own private opinion that, in default of the right honorable, the Earl of Chell and his Countess, no better civic heads could have been found than Mr. Curtenty and his charming wife. So far the tone of the signal was unimpeachable, but underneath all this was a subtitle, Amusing Exploit of the Mayor-Elect followed by an amusing description of the procession of the geese, a description which concluded by referring to Mr. Curtenty as his worship, the goose-driver. Hanbridge, Knipe, Longshawl, and Turnhill laughed heartily, and perhaps a little viciously, at this paragraph, but Bursley was annoyed by it. In print the affair did not look at all well. Bursley prided itself on possessing a unique dignity as the mother of the five towns, and to be presided over by a goose-driver, however humorous and hospitable he might be, did not consort with that dignity. A certain mayor of Longshaw, years before, had driven a sow to market, and derived a tremendous advertisement therefrom, but Bursley had no wish to rival Longshaw in any particular. Bursley regarded Longshaw as the inferno of the five towns. In Bursley you were bidden to go to Longshaw as you were bidden to go to... Certain acute people in Hillport saw nothing but a paralyzing insult in the opinion of the signal, 
first and foremost a Hanbridge organ, that Bursley could find no better civic head than Josiah Curtenty. At least three aldermen and seven councillors privately, and in the Tiger, disagreed with any such view of Bursley's capacity to find heads. And underneath all this brooding dissatisfaction lurked the thought, as the alligator lurks in a muddy river, that the Earl wouldn't like it, meaning the geese episode. It was generally felt that the Earl had been badly treated by Jos Curtenty. The town could not explain its sentiments, could not argue about them. They were not, in fact, capable of logical justification. But they were there. They violently existed. It would have been useless to point out that if the inimitable Joss had not been called to the mayoralty, the episode of the geese would have passed as a gorgeous joke, that every one had been vastly amused by it, until that desolating issue of the signal announced the Earl's retirement, that Joss Curtenty could not possibly have foreseen what was about to happen, and that, anyhow, goose-driving was less a crime than a social solecism, and less a social solecism than a brilliant eccentricity. Bursley was hurt, and logic is no balm for wounds. Some may ask, if Bursley was offended, why did it not mark its sense of Josiah's failure to read the future by electing another mayor? The answer is that while all were agreed that his antic was inexcusable, all were equally agreed to pretend that it was a mere trifle of no importance. You could not deprive a man of his prescriptive right for a mere trifle of no importance. Besides, nobody could be so foolish as to imagine that goose-driving, though reprehensible in a mayor about to succeed an earl, is an act of which official notice can be taken. The most curious thing in the whole imbroglio is that Josiah Curtenty secretly agreed with his wife and the town. He was ashamed, overset. His procession of geese appeared to him in an entirely new light, and he had the strength of mind to admit to himself I've made a fool of myself. Harry went to London for a week, and Josiah, under plea of his son's absence, spent eight hours a day at the works. The brougham remained in the coach house. The town council duly met in special conclave, and Josiah Topham Curtenty became mayor of Bursley. Shortly after Christmas, it was announced that the mayor and mayoress had decided to give a New Year's treat to four hundred poor old people in the St. Luke's covered market. It was also spread about that this treat would eclipse and extinguish all previous treats of a similar nature, and that it might be accepted as some slight foretaste of the hospitality which the mayor and mayoress would dispense in that memorable year of royal festival. The treat was to occur on January ninth, the mayoress's birthday. On January 7th, Josiah happened to go home early. He was proceeding into the drawing-room without enthusiasm to greet his wife when he heard voices within, and one voice was the voice of Gas Gordon. Josh stood still. It has been mentioned that Gordon and the mayor were in love with the same woman. The mayor had easily captured her under the very guns of his not formidable rival, and he had always thereafter felt a kind of benevolent, good-humored, contemptuous pity for Gordon, Gordon whose life was a tragic blank, Gordon who lived a melancholy and defeated bachelor with his mother and two unmarried sisters older than himself. That Gordon still worshipped at the shrine did not disturb him. On the contrary, it pleased him. Poor Gordon. But really, Mrs. Cotenti, Gordon was saying, really, you know I, that is, really... "'To please me?' Mrs. Curtenty entreated, with a seductive charm that Joss felt even outside the door. Then there was a pause. "'Very well,' said Gordon. Mr. Curtenty tiptoed away and back into the street. He walked in the dark nearly to Old Castle, and returned about six o'clock. But Clara said no word of Gordon's visit. She had scarcely spoken to Topham for three weeks." The next morning, as Harry was departing to the works, Mrs. Curtenty followed the handsome youth into the hall. Harry, she whispered, bring me two ten-pound notes this afternoon, will you, and say nothing to your father. 4. Gas Gordon was to be on the platform at the poor people's treat. As he walked down Trafalgar Road, his eye caught a still-exposed fragment of a decayed bill on a hoarding. 
It referred to a meeting of the local branch of the Anti-Gambling League a year ago in the lecture hall of the Wesleyan Chapel, and it said that Councillor Gordon would occupy the chair on that occasion. Mechanically, Councillor Gordon stopped and tore the fragment away from the hoarding. The treat, which took the form of a dinner, was an unqualified success. It surpassed all expectations. Even the diners themselves were satisfied, a rare thing at such affairs. Goose was a prominent item on the menu. After the repast, the replete guests were entertained from the platform, the mayor being, of course, in the chair. Harry sang In Old Madrid, accompanied by his stepmother, with faultless expression. Mr. Duncalf astonished everybody with the famous North Country recitation, The Patent Hair-Brushing Machine. There was also a banjo solo, a skirt dance of discretion, and a campanological turn. At last, towards ten o'clock, Mr. Gordon, who had hitherto done nothing, rose in his place, amid good-natured cries of, "'Gas!' "'I feel sure that you will all agree with me,' he began, "'that this evening would not be complete without a vote of thanks, a very hearty vote of thanks, to our excellent host and chairman.' ear-splitting applause. "'I've got a little story to tell you,' he continued, "'a story that up to this moment has been a close secret between His Worship the Mayor and myself.' His Worship looked up sharply at the speaker. "'You've heard about some geese, I reckon?' Laughter. "'Well, you've not heard all, but I'm going to tell you. I can't keep it to myself any longer. You think His Worship drove those geese? I hope they're digesting well.' loud laughter. Just for fun. He didn't. I was with him when he bought them, and I happened to say that goose-driving was a very difficult accomplishment. "'Depends on the geese!' shouted a voice. "'Yes, it does,' Mr. Gordon admitted. "'Well, his worship contradicted me, and we had a bit of an argument. I don't bet, as you know, at least not often, but I don't mind confessing that I offered to bet him a sovereign he couldn't drive his geese half a mile.' "'Look here, Gordon,' he said to me. "'There's a lot of distress in the town just now. "'Trade, bad, and so on, and so on. "'I'll lay you a level ten pounds "'I drive these geese to Hillport myself, "'the loser to give the money to charity.' "'Done,' I said. "'Don't say anything about it,' he said. "'I won't,' I says. "'But I am doing.' "'Applause. "'I feel it my duty to say something about it.' "'More applause. "'Well, I lost, as you all know. "'He drove him to Hillport.' Good old Joss! That's not all. The mayor insisted upon putting his own ten pounds to mine and making it twenty. Here are the two identical notes, his and mine. Mr. Gordon waved the identical notes amid an uproar. We've decided that everyone who has dined here tonight shall receive a brand new shilling. I see Mr. Septimus Lovett from the bank there with a bag. He will attend to you as you go out. Wild outbreak and tumult of rapturous applause. "'And now three cheers for your mayor and mayoris. "'It was colossal, the enthusiasm. "'And for Gas Gordon!' called several voices. "'The cheers rose again in surging waves. "'Everyone remarked that the mayor, usually so imperturbable, "'was quite overcome, seemed as if he didn't know where to look. "'Afterwards, as the occupants of the platform descended, Mr. Gordon glanced into the eyes of Mrs. Curtenty and found there his exceeding reward. The mediocrity had blossomed out that evening into something new and strange. Liar, deliberate liar and self-accused gambler as he was, he felt that he had lived during that speech. He felt that it was the supreme moment of his life. "'What a perfectly wonderful man your husband is!' said Mrs. Duncalf to Mrs. Curtenty. Clara turned to her husband with a sublime gesture of satisfaction. In the brougham, going home, she bewitched him with wifely endearments. She could afford to do so. The stigma of the geese episode was erased. But the barmaid of the tiger, as she let down her bright hair that night in the attic of the tiger, said to herself, Well, of all the... Just that. 
End of His Worship the Goose Driver by Arnold Bennett This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hunter Quartermain's Story by H. Ryder Haggard Sir Henry Curtis, as everybody acquainted with him knows, is one of the most hospitable men on earth. It was in the course of the enjoyment of his hospitality at his place in Yorkshire the other day that I heard the haunting story which I am now about to transcribe. Many of those who read it will no doubt have heard some of the strange rumours that are flying about to the effect that Sir Henry Curtis and his friend Captain Good, R.N., recently found a vast treasure of diamonds out in the heart of Africa, supposed to have been hidden by the Egyptians, or King Solomon, or some other antique people. I first saw the matter alluded to in a paragraph in one of the society papers the day before I started for Yorkshire to pay my visit to Curtis and arrived, needless to say, burning with curiosity. For there is something very fascinating to the mind in the idea of hidden treasure. When I reached the hall, I at once asked Curtis about it, and he did not deny the truth of the story. But on my pressing him to tell it, he would not, nor would Captain Good, who was also staying in the house. "'You would not believe me if I did,' Sir Henry said, with one of the hearty laughs which seemed to come right out of his great lungs. "'You must wait till Hunter Quartermain comes. "'He will arrive here from Africa to-night, "'and I am not going to say a word about the matter, "'or good either, until he turns up. "'Quartermain was with us all through. "'He has known about the business for years and years, "'and if it had not been for him, "'we should not have been here to-day. "'I am going to meet him presently.' "'I could not get a word more out of him, "'nor could anybody else.' though we were all dying of curiosity, especially some of the ladies. I shall never forget how they looked in the drawing-room before dinner when Captain Good produced a great rough diamond, weighing fifty carats or more, and told them that he had many larger than that. If ever I saw curiosity and envy printed on fair faces, I saw them then. It was just at this moment that the door was opened and Mr. Allan Quartermain announced, whereupon Good put the diamond into his pocket and sprang at a little man who limped shyly into the room, convoyed by Sir Henry Curtis himself. "'Here he is! Good! Safe and sound!' said Sir Henry gleefully. "'Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to you one of the oldest hunters and the very best shot in Africa, who has killed more elephants and lions than any other man alive!' Everybody turned and stared politely at the curious-looking little lame man, and though his size was insignificant, he was quite worth staring at. He had short grizzled hair, which stood about an inch above his head like the bristles of a bush, gentle brown eyes that seemed to notice everything, and a withered face, tanned to the colour of mahogany from exposure to the weather. He spoke, too, when he returned Good's enthusiastic greeting with a curious little accent which made his speech noticeable. It so happened that I sat next to Mr. Allan Quatermain at dinner, and of course did my best to draw him, but he was not to be drawn. He admitted that he had recently been on a long journey into the interior of Africa with Sir Henry Curtis and Captain Good, and that they had found treasure, and then politely turned the subject, and began to ask me questions about England, where he had never been before, that is, since he came to years of discretion. Of course I did not find this very interesting, and so cast about for some means to bring the conversation round again. Now we were dining in an oak-panelled vestibule, and on the wall opposite to me were fixed two gigantic elephant tusks, and under them a pair of buffalo horns, very rough and knotted, showing that they came off an old bull, and having the tip of one horn split and chipped. I noticed that Hunter Quartermain's eyes kept glancing at these trophies, and took an occasion to ask him if he knew anything about them. "'I ought to,' he answered, with a little laugh. "'The elephant to which those tusks belonged tore one of our party right in two about eighteen months ago, and as for the buffalo horns, they were nearly my death, and were the end of a servant of mine to whom I was much attached. I gave them to Sir Henry, when he left Natal some months ago.' and Mr. Quartermain sighed, and turned to answer a question from the lady whom he had taken down to dinner, and who, needless to say, was also employed in trying to pump him about the diamonds. 
Indeed, all around the table there was a simmer of scarcely suppressed excitement, which, when the servants had left the room, could no longer be restrained. "'Now, Mr. Quartermain,' said the lady next to him, "'we have been kept in an agony of suspense by Sir Henry and Captain Good, "'who have persistently refused to tell us a word of this story "'about the hidden treasure till you came, "'and we simply can bear it no longer, so please begin at once.' "'Yes,' said everybody. "'Go on, please.' Hunter Quartermain glanced around the table apprehensively. He did not seem to appreciate finding himself the object of so much curiosity. "'Ladies and gentlemen,' he said at last, with a shake of his grizzled head, "'I am very sorry to disappoint you, but I cannot do it. "'It is this way. "'At the request of Sir Henry and Captain Good, "'I have written down a true and plain account of King Solomon's mines "'and how we found them.' "'so you will soon be able to learn all about that wonderful adventure for yourselves. "'But until then I will say nothing about it, "'not from any wish to disappoint your curiosity or to make myself important, "'but simply because the whole story partakes so much of the marvellous "'that I am afraid to tell it in a piecemeal, hasty fashion, "'for I fear I should be set down as one of those common fellows "'of whom there are so many in my profession.' who are not ashamed to narrate things they have not seen and even to tell wonderful stories about wild animals they have never killed and i think that my companions in adventure sir henry curtis and captain good will bear me out in what i say yes quartermain i think you are quite right said sir henry precisely the same considerations have forced good and myself to hold our tongues we did not wish to be bracketed with well with other famous travellers there was a murmur of disappointment at these announcements. "'I believe you are all hoaxing us,' said the young lady next to Mr. Quartermain rather sharply. "'Believe me,' answered the old hunter, with a quaint courtesy of a little bow of his grizzled head. "'Though I have lived all my life in the wilderness and among savages, I have neither the heart nor the want of manners to wish to deceive one so lovely.' whereat the young lady, who was pretty, looked appeased. "'This is very dreadful,' I broke in. "'We ask for bread, and you give us a stone, Mr. Quartermain. "'The least that you can do is tell us the story of the tusks opposite the buffalo horns underneath. "'We won't let you off with less.' "'I am but a poor story-teller,' put in the old hunter. "'But if you will forgive my want of skill, I shall be happy to tell you.' Not the story of the tusk, for that is part of the history of our journey to King Solomon's mines, but that of the buffalo horns beneath them, which is now ten years old. Bravo, Quartermain, said Sir Henry. We shall all be delighted. Fire away. Fill up your glass first. The little man did as he was bid, took a sip of claret, and began. About ten years ago, I was hunting in the far interior of Africa at a place called Getgera, not a great way from the Kobe River. I had with me four native servants, namely, a driver and vorloper, or leader, who were natives of Metabeland, a Hottentot named Hans, who had once been the slave of a Transvaal boar, and a Zulu hunter, who for five years had accompanied me on my trips, and whose name was Mashun. Now near Gatgara I found a piece of healthy, park-like country, where the grass was very good, considering the time of year. And here I made a little camp, or headquarter settlement, from whence I went expeditions on all sides in search of game, especially elephant. My luck, however, was bad. I got but little ivory. I was therefore very glad when some natives brought me news that a large herd of elephants were feeding in a valley about thirty miles away. At first I thought of trekking down to the valley, wagon and all, but gave up the idea on hearing that it was infested with the deadly testy fly, which is certain death to all animals except men, donkeys, and wild game. So I reluctantly determined to leave the wagon in the charge of Metabel, leader and driver, and to start on a trip into the thorn country, accompanied only by the Hottentot hands and Meshun. Accordingly, on the following morning we started, and on the evening of the next day reached the spot where the elephants were reported to be. But here again we were met by ill luck. That the elephants had been there was evident enough, for their spoor was plentiful, 
and so were other traces of their presence in the shape of mimoso trees torn out of the ground and placed topsy-turvies on their flat crowns in order to enable the great beasts to feast on their sweet roots. But the elephants themselves were conspicuous by their absence. They had elected to move on. This being so, there was only one thing to do, and that was to move after them, which we did, and a pretty hunt they led us. For a fortnight or more we dodged about after those elephants, coming up with them on two occasions, and a splendid herd they were, only, however, to lose them again. At length we came up with them a third time, and I managed to shoot one bull, and then they started off again, where it was useless to try and follow them. After this I gave it up in disgust, and we made the best of our way back to the camp, not in the sweetest of tempers, carrying the tusks of the elephant I had shot. It was on the afternoon of the fifth day of our tramp that we reached the little kopje overlooking the spot where the wagon stood, and I confess that I climbed it with a pleasurable sense of homecoming, for his wagon is the hunter's home, as much as his house is that of the civilized person. I reached the top of the kopi, and looking in the direction where the friendly white tent of the wagon should be, but there was no wagon, only a black burnt plain, stretching away as far as the eye could reach. I rubbed my eyes, looked again, and made out on the spot of the camp, not my wagon, but some charred beams of wood, half wild with grief and anxiety, followed by hands and machoon, I ran at full speed down the slope of the kopi and across the space of the plain below the spring of water where my camp had been. I was soon there, only to find my worst suspicions were confirmed. The wagon and all its contents, including my spare guns and ammunition, had been destroyed by a grass-fire. Now before I started I had left orders with the driver to burn off the grass around the camp in order to guard against accidents of this nature, and here was the reward of my folly a very proper illustration of the necessity, especially where natives are concerned, of doing a thing oneself if one wants it done at all. Evidently the lazy rascals had not burnt around the wagon. Most probably, indeed, they had themselves carelessly fired the tall and resinous tambuki grass nearby. The wind had driven the flames on to the wagon tent, and there was quickly an end of the matter. As for the driver and leader, I know not what became of them. Probably fearing my anger, they bolted, taking the oxen with them. I have never seen them from that hour to this. I sat down on the black veldt by the spring, and gazed at the charred axles and disselboom of my wagon, and I can assure you, ladies and gentlemen, I felt inclined to weep. As for Mashoon and Hans, they cursed away vigorously, one in Zulu and the other in Dutch. Ours was a pretty position. We were nearly three hundred miles away from Bemaguato, the capital of Kama's country, which was the nearest spot where we could get any help, and our ammunition, spare guns, clothing, food, and everything else were all totally destroyed. I had just what I stood in, which was a flannel shirt, a pair of veldtschoons or shoes of rawhide, my eight-bore rifle, and a few cartridges. Hans and Mashoon also each had a martini rifle and some cartridges, not many. And it was with this equipment that we had to undertake a journey of three hundred miles through a desolate and almost uninhabitable region. I can assure you that I have rarely been in a worse position, and I have been in some queer ones. However, these things are the natural incidents of a hunter's life, and the only thing to do was to make the best of them. Accordingly, after passing a comfortless night by the remains of my wagon, we started next morning on a long journey toward civilization. Now, if we were to set work to tell you all the troubles and incidents of that dreadful journey, I should keep you listening here till midnight, so I will, with your permission, pass on to the particular adventure of which the pair of buffalo horns opposite are the melancholy memento. We had been travelling for about a month, living and getting along as best we could, when one evening we camped some forty miles from Bemaguato. By this time we were indeed in a melancholy plight, foot-sore, half-starved, 
and utterly worn out, and in addition I was suffering from a sharp attack of fever, which half blinded me and made me weak as a babe. Our ammunition, too, was exhausted. I had only one cartridge left for my eight-bore rifle, and Hans and Machoon, who were armed with Martini Henrys, had three between them. It was about an hour from sundown when we halted and lit a fire, for luckily we still had a few matches. It was a charming spot to camp, I remember. Just off the game track we were following was a little hollow, fringed about with flat-crowned mimosa trees, and at the bottom of the hollow a spring of clear water welled up out of the earth and formed a pool, round the edges of which grew an abundance of watercress, of an exactly similar kind to those which were handed round the table just now. Now we had no food of any kind left, having that morning devoured the last remains of a little orib antelope which I had shot two days previously. Accordingly, Hans, who was a better shot than Machoon, took two of the remaining martini cartridges and started out to see if he could not kill a buck for supper. I was too weak to go out myself. Meanwhile, Machoon employed himself in dragging together some dead boughs from the mimosa tree to make a sort of skirm, or shelter for us to sleep in, about forty yards from the edge of the pool of water. We had been greatly troubled with lions in the course of our long tramp, and only on the previous night have very nearly been attacked by them, which made me nervous, especially in my weak state. Just as we had finished the skirm, or rather something which did duty for one, Massoon and I heard a shot apparently fired about a mile away. "'Hark to it!' sung out Massoon in Zulu, more, I fancy, by way of keeping his spirits up than for any other reason— for he was a sort of black Mark Tapley, and very cheerful under difficulties. Hark to the wonderful sound with which the Mabuna, the Boers, shook our fathers to the ground at the Battle of the Blood River. We are hungry now, my father, our stomachs are small and withered up like a dry ox's paunch. But they will soon be full of good meat. Hans is a Hottentot, and an Umfagozan, that is, a long fellow. But he shoots straight, ah! He certainly shoots straight. Be of good heart, my father. There will soon be meat upon the fire, and we shall rise up men. And so he went on talking nonsense till I told him to stop, because he made my head ache with his empty words. Shortly after we heard the shot, the sun sank in his red splendor, and there fell upon the earth and sky the great hush of the African wilderness. The lions were not up as yet. They would probably wait for the moon and the birds and beasts were all at rest. I could not describe the intensity of the quiet of the night, to me in my weak state, and fretting as I was over the non-return of the Hottentot hands. It seemed almost ominous, as though nature were brooding over some tragedy which was being enacted in her sight. It was quiet, quiet as death, and lonely as the grave. Mashoon, I said at last, where is Hans? My heart is heavy for him. "'Nay, my father, I know not. Mayhap he is weary, and sleeps, or mayhap he has lost his way. "'Mashoon, art thou a boy to talk folly to me?' I answered. "'Tell me, in all the years thou hast hunted by my side, "'didst thou ever know a Hottentot to lose his path, or to sleep upon the way to camp?' "'Nay, Macumazan, that, ladies, is my native name.' and means the man who gets up by night, or who is always awake. I know not where he is. But though we talked thus, we neither of us liked to hint at what was both in our minds, namely, that misfortune had overtaken the poor Hottentot. Mashoon, I said at last, go down to the water, and bring me of those green herbs that grow there. I am hungered, and must eat something." "'Nay, my father, surely the ghosts are there. "'They come out of the water at night "'and sit upon the banks to dry themselves. "'An Isanusi, that is, witch-finder, told me. "'Mashoon was, I think, "'one of the bravest men I ever knew in the daytime, "'but he had a more than civilized dread of the supernatural. "'Must I go myself, thou fool?' I said sternly. "'Nay, Macumazan, if thy heart yearns for strange things like a sick woman, "'I go, even if the ghosts devour me.' "'And accordingly he went, and soon returned with a large bundle of watercress, "'of which I ate greedily. 
"'Art thou not hungry?' I asked the great Zulu presently, as he sat eyeing me eating. "'Never was I hungrier, my father.' "'Then eat!' and I pointed to the watercress. "'Nay, Makumasan, I cannot eat those herbs.' "'If thou dost not eat, thou wilt starve. Eat, Mashuni.' He stared at the watercress doubtfully for a while, and at last seized a handful and crammed them into his mouth, crying out as he did so, Oh, why was I born that I should live to feed on green weeds like an ox? Surely if my mother could have known it, she would have killed me when I was born. And so he went on lamenting between each fistful of watercrest till all were finished, when he declared that he was full indeed of stuff. But it lay very cold on his stomach, like snow upon a mountain. At any other time I should have laughed, for it must be admitted he had a ludicrous way of putting things. Zulus do not like green food. Just after Mashoon had finished his watercress, we heard the loud woof, woof of a lion, who was evidently promenading much nearer to our little skirm than was pleasant. Indeed, on looking into the darkness and listening intently, I could hear his snoring breath and catch the light of his green-yellow eyes. We shouted loudly, and Mashoon threw some sticks on the fire to frighten him, which apparently had the desired effect, for we saw no more of him for a while. Just after we had this fright from the lion, the moon rose in her fullest splendor, throwing a robe of silver light all over the earth. I have rarely seen a more beautiful moonrise. I remember that sitting in the skirm I could with ease read faint pencil notes in my pocket-book. As soon as the moon was up, game began to trek down to the water just below us. I could, from where I sat, see all sorts of them passing along the little ridge that ran to our right, on their way to the drinking-place. Indeed, one buck, a large eland, came within twenty yards of the skirm, and I stood at gaze, staring at it suspiciously, his beautiful head and twisted horns standing out clearly against the sky. I had, I recollect, every mind to have a pull at him on the chance of providing ourselves with a good supply of beef. But remembering that we had but two cartridges left, and the extreme uncertainty of a shot by moonlight, I at length decided to refrain. The eland presently moved on to the water, and a minute or two afterwards there arose a great sound of splashing, followed by the quick fall of galloping hoofs. "'What's that, Mashun? I asked. That damn lion, buck smell him, replied the Zulu in English, of which he had a very superficial knowledge. Scarcely were the words out of his mouth before we heard a sort of whine over the other side of the pool, which was instantly answered by a loud coughing roar close to us. By Jove, I said, there are two of them. They have lost the buck. We must look out. They don't catch us. And again we made up the fire and shouted, with the result that the lions moved off. Mashoon, I said, do you watch till the moon gets over that tree, when it will be in the middle of the night, then wake me. Watch well now, or the lions will be picking those worthless bones of yours before you are three hours older. I must rest a little, or I shall die. Course, chief, answered the Zulu. Sleep, my father, sleep in peace. My eyes shall be open as the stars, and like the stars watch over you. Although I was so weak, I could not at once follow his advice. To begin with, my head ached with fever, and I was torn with anxiety as to the fate of the Hottentot hands, and indeed as to our own fate, left with sore feet, empty stomachs, and two cartridges, to find our way to Bamagwata, forty miles off. Then the mere sensation of knowing that there are one or more hungry lions prowling around you somewhere in the dark is disquieting, however well one may be used to it and, by keeping the attention on the stretch, tends to prevent one from sleeping. In addition to all these troubles, too, I was, I remember, seized with a dreadful longing for a pipe of tobacco, whereas, under the circumstances, I might as well have longed for the moon. At last, however, I fell into an uneasy sleep as full of bad dreams as a prickly pear is of points, one of which I recollect was that I was setting my naked foot upon a cobra, which rose upon its tail and hissed my name, Makumazan, into my ear. Indeed, the cobra hissed with such persistency that at last I roused myself. Makumazan! Nazia! Nazia! There, there, whispered Mashun's voice into my drowsy ear. 
Raising myself, I opened my eyes, and I saw Mashoon kneeling by my side, pointing towards the water. Following the line of his outstretched hand, my eyes fell upon a sight that made me jump. Old hunter as I was, even in those days. About twenty paces from the little skirm was a large ant heap, and on the summit of the ant heap, her four feet rather close together, so as to find standing space, stood the massive form of a big lioness. Her head was towards the skirm, and in the bright moonlight I saw her lower it and lick her paws. Mashum thrust the martini rifle into my hands, whispering that it was loaded. I lifted it and covered the lioness, but found that even in that light I could not make out the foresight of the martini. As it would have been madness to fire without doing so, for the result would probably be that I should wound the lioness if indeed I did not miss her altogether, I lowered the rifle. And hastily tearing a fragment of paper from one of the leaves of my pocket book, which I had been consulting just before I went to sleep, I proceeded to fix it on to the front sight. But all this took a little time, and before the paper was satisfactorily arranged, Mashum again gripped me by the arm and pointed to the dark heap under the shade of a small mimosa tree which grew not more than ten paces from the skirm. Well, what is it? I whispered. I can see nothing. It's another lion, he answered. Nonsense! Thy heart is dead with fear, thou seest double. And I bent forward over the edge of the surrounding fence and stared at the heap. Even as I said the words, the dark mass rose and stalked out into the moonlight. It was a magnificent black maned lion, one of the largest I had ever seen. When he had gone two or three steps, he caught the sight of me, halted, and there stood gazing straight towards us. He was so close that I could see the firelight reflected in his wicked greenish eyes. Shoot! Shoot! said Mashoon. The devil is coming. He is going to spring. I raised the rifle and got the bit of paper on the foresight straight on to a little path of white hair just where the throat is set into the chest and shoulders. As I did so, the lion glanced back over his shoulder, as according to my experience, a lion nearly always does before he springs. Then he dropped his body a little, and I saw his big paws spread out upon the ground as he put his weight upon them to gather purchase. In haste, I pressed the trigger of the martini, and not a moment too soon, for as I did so, he was in the act of springing. The report of the rifle rang out sharp and clear on the intense silence of the night. And in another second, the great brute had landed on his head within four feet of us, rolling over and over towards us, was sending the brushes which composed our little fence flying with convulsive strokes of his great paws. We sprang out of the other side of the skirm, and he rolled on to it and into it, and then right through the fire. Next, he raised himself and sat upon his haunches like a great dog, and began to roar. Heavens, how he roared! I never heard anything like it before or since. He kept filling his lungs with air and then emitting it in the most heart shaking volumes of sound. Suddenly, in the middle of one of the loudest roars, he rolled over onto his side and lay still, and I knew that he was dead. A lion generally dies upon his side. With a sigh of relief, I looked up towards his mate upon the ant heap. She was standing there, apparently petrified with astonishment. Looking over her shoulder and lashing her tail. But to our intense joy, when the dying beast ceased roaring, she turned and with one enormous bound vanished into the night. Then we advanced cautiously towards the prostrate brute, Mashoon droning an improvised Zulu song as he went, about how Makumazan, the hunter of hunters, whose eyes are open by night as well as by day, put his hand down the lion's stomach when it came to devour him and pulled out his heart by the roots, etc., etc. By way of expressing his satisfaction in his hyperbolical Zulu way at the turn events had taken. There was no need for caution. The lion was as dead as though he had already been stuffed with straw. The martini bullet had entered within an inch of the white spot I had aimed at, and travelled right through him, passing out at the right buttock near the root of the tail. The martini has wonderful driving power, though the shock it gives to the system, comparatively speaking, slight, owing to the smallness of the hole it makes. But fortunately, the lion is an easy beast to kill. 
I passed the rest of that night in a profound slumber, my head reposing upon the deceased lion's flank, a position that had, I thought, a beautiful touch of irony about it, though the smell of his singed hair was disagreeable. When I woke again, the faint primrose lights of dawn were flushing in the eastern sky. For a moment I could not understand the chill sense of anxiety that lay like a lump of ice at my heart till the feel and smell of the skin of the dead lion beneath my head recalled the circumstances in which we were placed. I rose, and eagerly looked round to see if I could discover any sign of Hans, who, if he had escaped accident, would surely return to us at dawn. But there was none. Then hope grew faint, and I felt that it was not well with the poor fellow. Setting Mashoon to build up the fire, I hastily removed the hide from the flank of the lion, which was indeed a splendid beast, and cutting off some lumps of flesh, we toasted and ate them greedily. Lion's flesh, strange as it may seem, is very good eating, and tastes more like veal than anything else. By the time we had finished our much-needed meal, the sun was getting up, and after a drink of water and a wash at the pool, we started to try and find Hans leaving the dead lion to the tender mercies of the hyenas. Both Mashoon and myself were, by constant practice, pretty good hands at tracking, and we had not much difficulty in following the Hottentot's spore, faint as it was. We had gone in this way for half an hour or so, and were perhaps a mile or more from the site of our camping-place, when we discovered the spore of a solitary bull buffalo mixed up with the spore of Hans and we were able, from various indications, to make out that he had been tracking the buffalo. At length we reached a little glade in which there grew a stunted old mimosa thorn, with a peculiar and overhanging formation of root, under which a porcupine or ant-bear, or some such animal, had hollowed out a wide-lipped hole. About ten or fifteen paces from this thorn-tree there was a thick patch of bush. "'See, Macumazahn! See!' said Mashoon excitedly as we drew near the thorn. The buffalo has charged him. Look, here he stood to fire at him. See how firmly he planted his feet upon the earth. There is the mark of his crooked toe. Hans had one bent toe. Look, here the bull came like a boulder down the hill, his hooves turning up the earth like a hoe. Hans had hit him. He bled as he came. There are the blood spots. It is all written down there, my father, there upon the earth. "'Yes,' I said. "'Yes, but where is Hans?' Even as I said it, Mashoon clutched my arm, and pointed to the stunted thorn just by us. Even now, gentlemen, it makes me feel sick when I think of what I saw. For fixed in a stout fork of the tree, some eight feet from the ground, was Hans himself, or rather his dead body, evidently tossed there by the furious buffalo. One leg was twisted round the fork, probably in a dying convulsion." In the side, just beneath the ribs, was a great hole from which the entrails protruded. But this was not all. The other leg hung down to within five feet of the ground. The skin and most of the flesh were gone from it. For a moment we stood aghast and gazed at this horrifying sight. Then I understood what had happened. The buffalo, with that devilish cruelty which distinguishes the animal, had, after his enemy was dead, stood underneath his body, and licked the flesh off the pendant leg with his file-like tongue. I had heard of such a thing before, but had always treated the stories as hunter's yarns, but I had no doubt about it now. Poor Hans's skeleton foot and ankle were ample proof. We stood aghast under the tree, and stared and stared at this awful sight, when suddenly our cogitations were interrupted in a painful manner. The thick bush, about fifteen paces off, burst asunder with a crashing sound, and uttering a series of ferocious pig-like grunts, the bull buffalo himself came charging out straight at us. Even as he came, I saw the blood mark on his side where poor Hans's bullet had struck him, and also, as is often the case with particularly savage buffaloes, that his flanks had recently been terribly torn in an encounter with a lion. On he came, his head welled up. A buffalo does not generally lower his head till he does so to strike. Those great black horns, as I look at them before me, gentlemen, I seem to see them coming charging at me as I did ten years ago, silhouetted against the green bush behind. On, on. With a shout, Mashoon bolted off sideways towards the bush. 
I had instinctively lifted my eight-bore, which I had in my hand. It would have been useless to fire at the buffalo's head, for the dense horns must have turned the bullet, but as Machoon bolted, the bull slew a little, with the momentary idea of following him, and this gave me a ghost of a chance. I let drive my only cartridge at his shoulder. The bullet struck the shoulder-blade and smashed it up, and then travelled under the skin into his flank, but it did not stop him, though for a second he staggered. Throwing myself onto the ground with the energy of despair, I rolled under the shelter of the projecting root of the thorn, crushing myself as far into the mouth of the ant-bear hole as I could. In a single instant the buffalo was after me, kneeling down on his uninjured knee, for one leg, that of which I had broken the shoulder, was swinging helplessly to and fro. He set to work to try and hook me out of the hole with his crooked horn. At first he struck at me furiously, and it was one of the blows against the base of the tree which splintered the tip of the horn in the way that you see. Then he grew more cunning, and pushed his head as far under the root as possible, made a long semicircular sweep at me, grunting furiously, and blowing saliva and hot steamy breath all over me. I was just out of reach of the horn, though every stroke, by widening the hole and making more room for his head, brought it closer to me. But every now and again I received heavy blows in the ribs from his muzzle. Feeling that I was being knocked silly, I made an effort, and seizing his rough tongue, which was hanging from his jaws, I twisted it with all my force. The great brute bellowed with pain and fury, and jerked himself backwards so strongly that he dragged me some inches further from the mouth of the hole, and again made a sweep at me, catching me this time around the shoulder joint in the hook of his horn. I felt that it was all up now, and began to hola. "'He has got me!' I shouted in mortal terror. "'Gwasa! Machoon! Gwasa! "'Stab, Machoon! Stab!' One hoist of the great head, and out of the hole I came like a periwinkle out of his shell. But even as I did so, I caught the sight of Machoon's stalwart form advancing with his bagwan, or broad stabbing assegai, raised above his head. In another quarter of a second I had fallen from the horn, and heard the blow of the spear followed by the indescribable sound of steel shearing its way through flesh. I had fallen on my back, and, looking up, I saw that the gallant Machoon had driven the assegai a foot or more into the carcass of the buffalo, and was turning to fly. Alas! it was too late. Bellowing madly, and spouting blood from mouth and nostrils, the devilish brute was on him, and had thrown him up like a feather and then gored him twice as he lay. I struggled up with some wild idea of affording help. But before I had gone a step, the buffalo gave one long, sighing bellow, and rolled over dead by the side of his victim. Machoon was still living, but a single glance at him told me that his hour had come. The buffalo's horn had driven a great hole in his right lung, and inflicted other injuries. I knelt down beside him in the uttermost distress, and took his hand. "'Is he dead, Macumazahn?' he whispered. "'My eyes are blind. I cannot see.' "'Yes, he is dead. "'Did the black devil hurt thee, Macumazahn?' "'No, my poor fellow, I am not hurt much.' "'Oh, I am glad.' Then came a long silence, broken only by the sound of the air whistling through the hole in his lungs as he breathed. "'Macumazahn!' Art thou there? I cannot feel thee. I am here, Mashun. I die, Makumazan. The world flies round and round. I go. I go out into the dark. Surely, my father, at times in days to come, thou wilt think of me, Mashun, who stood by thy side, when thou killest elephants as we used, as we used. They were his last words. His brave spirit passed with him. I dragged his body to the hole under the tree, and pushed it in, placing his broad assegai by him, according to the customs of his people, that he might not go defenceless on his long journey. And then, ladies, I am not ashamed to confess, I stood alone there, before it, and wept like a woman. 
End of Hunter Quartermain's Story by H. Ryder Haggard This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to find out how to volunteer, please contact LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley In the Penal Colony by Franz Kafka Translated by Ian Johnston of Malaspina University College, Nanaimo, British Columbia, Canada In the Penal Colony "'It's a peculiar apparatus,' said the officer to the traveller, gazing with a certain admiration at the device with which he was, of course, thoroughly familiar. It appeared that the traveller had responded to the invitation of the commandant only out of politeness when he had been invited to attend the execution of a soldier, condemned for disobeying and insulting his superior. Of course, interest in the execution was not very high, not even in the penal colony itself. At least, here in the small, deep, sandy valley, closed in on all sides by barren slopes, apart from the officer and the traveller, there were present only the condemned, a vacant-looking man with a broad mouth and dilapidated hair and face, and the soldier, who held the heavy chain to which were connected the small chains which bound the condemned man by his feet and wrist-bones, as well as by his neck and which were also linked to each other by connecting chains. The condemned man had an expression of such dog-like resignation that it looked as if one could set him free to roam around the slopes, and would only have to whistle at the start of the execution for him to return. The traveller had little interest in the apparatus, and walked back and forth behind the condemned man, almost visibly indifferent while the officer took care of the final preparations. Sometimes he crawled under the apparatus, which was built deep into the earth, and sometimes he climbed up a ladder to inspect the upper parts. These were really jobs which could have been left to a mechanic, but the officer carried them out with great enthusiasm, maybe because he was particularly fond of this apparatus, or maybe because there was some other reason why one could not trust the work to anyone else. "'It's all ready now,' he finally cried and climbed back down the ladder. He was unusually tired, breathing with his mouth wide open, and he had pushed two fine ladies' handkerchiefs under the collar of his uniform. "'These uniforms are really too heavy for the tropics,' the traveller said, instead of asking some questions about the apparatus as the officer had expected. "'That's true,' said the officer. He washed the oil and grease from his dirty hands in a bucket of water standing ready. "'But they mean home.' and we don't want to lose our homeland. Now, have a look at this apparatus, he added immediately, drying his hands with a towel and pointing to the device. Up to this point I had to do some work by hand, but from now on the apparatus should work entirely on its own. The traveller nodded and followed the officer. The latter tried to protect himself against all eventualities by saying, of course, breakdowns do happen. I really hope none will occur today, but we must be prepared for it. The apparatus is supposed to keep going for twelve hours without interruption, but if any breakdowns do occur, they'll only be very minor, and we'll deal with them right away. Don't you want to sit down? he asked finally, as he pulled out a chair from a pile of cane chairs, and offered it to the traveller. The latter could not refuse. He sat on the edge of the pit, into which he cast a fleeting glance. It was not very deep. On one side of the hole the piled earth was heaped up into a wall. On the other side stood the apparatus. "'I don't know,' the officer said, "'whether the commandant has already explained the apparatus to you.' The traveller made a vague gesture with his hand. That was good enough for the officer, for now he could explain the apparatus himself. "'This apparatus,' he said, grasping a connecting rod and leaning against it, is our previous commandant's invention. I also worked with him on the very first tests, and took part in all the work right up to its completion. However, the credit for the invention belongs to him alone. Have you heard of our previous commandant? No? Well, I'm not claiming too much when I say that the organization of the entire penal colony is his work. We, his friends, already knew at the time of his death that the administration of the colony was so self-contained 
that even if his successor had a thousand new plans in mind, he would not be able to alter anything of the old plan, at least not for several years. And our prediction has held. The new commandant has had to recognize that. It's a shame that you didn't know the previous commandant. However, the officer said, interrupting himself, I'm chattering, and his apparatus stands here in front of us. As you see, it consists of three parts. With the passage of time, certain popular names have been developed for each of these parts. The one underneath is called the bed, the upper one is called the inscriber, and here in the middle this moving part is called the harrow. The harrow? the traveller asked. He had not been listening with full attention. The sun was excessively strong, trapped in the shadowless valley, and one could hardly collect one's thoughts. So the officer appeared to him all the more admirable in his tight tunic, weighed down with epaulettes and festooned with braid, ready to go on parade, as he explained the matter so eagerly, and while he was talking adjusted screws here and there with a screwdriver. The soldier appeared to be in a state similar to the traveller. He had wound the condemned man's chain around both his wrists, and was supporting himself with his hand on his weapon, letting his head hang backward not bothering about anything. The traveller was not surprised at that, for the officer spoke French, and clearly neither the soldier nor the condemned man understood the language. So it was all the more striking that the condemned man, in spite of that, did what he could to follow the officer's explanation. With a sort of sleepy persistence he kept directing his gaze to the place where the officer had just pointed and when the question from the traveller interrupted the officer, the condemned man looked at the traveller too, just as the officer was doing. "'Yes, the harrow,' said the officer. "'The name fits. The needles are arranged as in a harrow, and the whole thing is driven like a harrow, although it stays in one place and is in principle much more artistic. You'll understand in a moment. The condemned is laid out here on the bed. First I'll describe the apparatus, and only then let the procedure go to work.' That way you'll be able to follow it better. Also, a sprocket in the inscriber is excessively worn. It really squeaks. When it's in motion, one can hardly make oneself understood. Unfortunately, replacement parts are difficult to come by in this place. So, here is the bed, as I said. The whole thing is completely covered with a layer of cotton wool, the purpose of which you'll find out in a moment. The condemned man is laid out on his stomach on the cotton wool, naked, of course. There are straps for the hands here, for the feet here, and for the throat here, to tie him in securely. At the head of the bed here, where the man, as I have mentioned, first lies face down, is this small protruding lump of felt, which can easily be adjusted so that it presses right into the man's mouth. Its purpose is to prevent him screaming and biting his tongue to pieces. Of course the man has to let the felt in his mouth, otherwise the straps around his throat would break his neck. That's cotton wool asked the traveller, and bent down. "'Yes, it is,' said the officer, smiling. "'Feel it for yourself.' He took the traveller's hand and led him over to the bed. "'It's a specially prepared cotton wool. That's why it looks so unrecognisable. I'll get around to mentioning its purpose in a moment.' The traveller was already being won over a little to the apparatus. With his hand over his eyes to protect them from the sun, he looked at the apparatus in the hole. It was a massive construction. The bed and the inscriber were the same size, and looked like two dark chests. The inscriber was set about two metres above the bed, and the two were joined together at the corners by four brass rods, which almost reflected the sun. The harrow hung between the chests on a band of steel. The officer had hardly noticed the earlier indifference of the traveller, but he did have a sense now of how the latter's interest was being aroused for the first time so he paused in his explanation in order to allow the traveller time to observe the apparatus undisturbed. The condemned man imitated the traveller, but since he could not put his hand over his eyes, he blinked upward, with his eyes uncovered. "'So now the man is lying down,' said the traveller. He leaned back in his chair and crossed his legs. "'Yes,' said the officer, pushing his cap back a little and running his hand over his hot face. "'Now, listen.' Both the bed and the inscriber have their own electric batteries. The bed needs them for itself, and the inscriber for the harrow. As soon as the man is strapped in securely, the bed is set in motion. 
It quivers with tiny, very rapid oscillations, from side to side and up and down simultaneously. You will have seen similar devices in mental hospitals. Only, with our bed, all movements are precisely calibrated, for they must be meticulously coordinated with the movements of the harrow. But it's the harrow which has the job of actually carrying out the sentence. "'What is the sentence?' the traveller asked. "'You don't even know that?' asked the officer, in astonishment, and bit his lip. "'Forgive me if my explanations are perhaps confused. I really do beg your pardon. Previously it was the commandant's habit to provide such explanations. But the new commandant has excused himself from this honourable duty. The fact that with such an eminent visitor—' The traveller tried to deflect the honour with both hands but the officer insisted on the expression, that with such an eminent visitor he didn't even once make him aware of the form of our sentences, yet again something new which— He had a curse on his lips, but controlled himself, and said merely, I was not informed about it. It's not my fault. In any case, I am certainly the person best able to explain our style of sentencing, for here I am, carrying— He patted his breast pocket the relevant diagrams drawn by the previous commandant. "'Diagrams made by the commandant himself?' asked the traveller. "'Then was he in his own person a combination of everything? Was he soldier, judge, engineer, chemist, and draughtsman?' "'He was indeed,' said the officer, nodding his head with a fixed and thoughtful expression. Then he looked at his hands, examining them. They didn't seem to him clean enough to handle the diagrams. So he went to the bucket and washed them again. Then he pulled out a small leather folder and said, Our sentence does not sound severe. The law which a condemned man has violated is inscribed on his body with the harrow. This condemned man, for example, and the officer pointed to the man, will have inscribed on his body, Honour your superiors. The traveller had a quick look at the man. When the officer was pointing at him, the man kept his head down, and appeared to be directing all his energy into listening, in order to learn something, but the movements of his thick, pouting lips showed clearly that he was incapable of understanding anything. The traveller wanted to raise various questions, but after looking at the condemned man he merely asked, "'Does he know his sentence?' "'No,' said the officer. He wished to get on with his explanation right away, but the traveller interrupted him. "'He doesn't know his own sentence?' "'No.' said the officer once more. He then paused for a moment, as if he was asking the traveller for a more detailed reason for his question, and said, It would be useless to give him that information. He experiences it on his own body. The traveller really wanted to keep quiet at this point, but he felt how the condemned man was gazing at him. He seemed to be asking whether he could approve of the process the officer had described. So the traveller, who had up to this point been leaning back, bent forward again, and kept up his questions. But does he nonetheless have some general idea that he's been condemned? Not that either, said the officer, and he smiled at the traveller as if he was still waiting for some strange revelations from him. No, said the traveller, wiping his forehead. Then does the man also not yet know how his defence was received? He has had no opportunity to defend himself, said the officer and looked away as if he was talking to himself, and wished not to embarrass the traveller with an explanation of matters so self-evident to him. "'But he must have had a chance to defend himself,' said the traveller, and stood up from his chair. The officer recognised that he was in danger of having his explanation of the apparatus held up for a long time, so he went to the traveller, took him by the arm, pointed with his hand at the condemned man, who stood there stiffly, now that the attention was so clearly directed at him, the soldier was also pulling on his chain, and said, The matter stands like this. Here in the penal colony I have been appointed judge, in spite of my youth, for I stood at the side of our old commandant in all matters of punishment, and I also know the most about the apparatus. The basic principle I use for my decisions is this. Guilt is always beyond a doubt. Other courts could not follow this principle, for they are made up of many heads, and in addition have even higher courts above them. But that is not the case here. Or at least it was not that way with the previous commandant. It's true the new commandant has already shown a desire to get mixed up in my court, but I've succeeded so far in fending him off, and I'll continue to be successful. 
you want this case explained. It's simple, just like all of them. This morning a captain laid a charge that this man, who is assigned to him as a servant, and who sleeps before his door, had been sleeping on duty, for his task is to stand up every time the clock strikes the hour, and salute in front of the captain's door. That's certainly not a difficult duty, and it's necessary, since he is supposed to remain fresh both for guarding and for service. Yesterday night the captain wanted to check whether his servant was fulfilling his duty. He opened the door on the stroke of two, and found him curled up asleep. He got his horsewhip and hit him across the face. Now, instead of standing up and begging for forgiveness, the man grabbed his master by the legs, shook him, and cried out, "'Throw away that whip or I'll eat you up!' Those are the facts. The captain came to me an hour ago. I wrote up his statement, and right after that the sentence. Then I had the man chained up. It was all very simple. If I had first summoned the man and interrogated him, the result would have been confusion. He would have lied, and if I had been successful in refuting his lies, he would have replaced them with new lies, and so forth. But now I have him, and I won't release him again. Now does that clarify everything? But time is passing. We should be starting the execution, and I haven't finished explaining the apparatus yet. He urged the traveller to sit down in his chair moved to the apparatus again, and started. As you see, the shape of the harrow corresponds to the shape of a man. This is the harrow for the upper body, and here are the harrows for the legs. This small cutter is the only one designated for the head. Is that clear to you? He leaned forward to the traveller in a friendly way, ready to give the most comprehensive explanation. The traveller looked at the harrow with a wrinkled frown. The information about the judicial procedures had not satisfied him. However, he had to tell himself that here it was a matter of a penal colony, that in this place special regulations were necessary, and that one had to give precedence to military measures right down to the last detail. Beyond that, however, he had some hopes in the new commandant, who obviously, although slowly, was intending to introduce a new procedure which the limited understanding of this officer could not cope with. Following this train of thought, the traveller asked, "'Will the commandant be present at the execution?' "'That is not certain,' said the officer, embarrassingly affected by the sudden question, and his friendly expression made a grimace. "'That's why we need to hurry up. As much as I regret the fact, I'll have to make my explanation even shorter. But to-morrow, once the apparatus is clean again, the fact that it gets so very dirty is its only fault, I could add a detailed explanation. So now, only the most important things. When the man is lying on the bed and it starts quivering, the harrow sinks onto the body. It positions itself automatically in such a way that it touches the body only lightly with the needle tips. Once the machine is set in this position, the steel cable tightens up into a rod, and now the performance begins. Someone who is not an initiate, sees no external difference among the punishments. The harrow seems to do its work uniformly. As it quivers, it sticks the tips of its needles into the body, which is also vibrating from the movement of the bed. Now, to enable someone to check on how the sentence is being carried out, the harrow is made of glass. That gave rise to certain technical difficulties with fastening the needles securely, but after several attempts we were successful. We didn't spare any efforts. And now, as the inscription is made on the body, everyone can see through the glass. Don't you want to come closer and see the needles for yourself? The traveller stood slowly, moved up, and bent over the harrow. You see, the officer said, two sorts of needles in a multiple arrangement. Each long needle has a short one next to it. The long one inscribes, and the short one squirts water out to wash away the blood and keep the inscription always clear. The bloody water is then channelled here, in small grooves, and finally flows into these main gutters, and the outlet pipe takes it to the pit. The officer pointed with his finger to the exact path which the bloody water had to take. As he began to demonstrate with both hands at the mouth of the outlet pipe, in order to make his account as clear as possible, the traveller raised his head, and feeling behind him with his hand, wanted to return to his chair. Then he saw to his horror that the condemned man had also, like him, accepted the officer's invitation to inspect the arrangement of the harrow up close. 
He had pulled the sleeping soldier, holding the chain, a little forward, and was also bending over the glass. One could see how, with a confused gaze, he also was looking for what the two gentlemen had just observed, but how he didn't succeed, because he lacked the explanation. He leaned forward this way and that. He kept running his eyes over the glass again and again. The traveller wanted to push him back, for what he was doing was probably punishable. But the officer held the traveller firmly with one hand, and with the other he took a lump of earth from the wall and threw it at the soldier. The latter opened his eyes with a start, saw what the condemned man had dared to do, let his weapon fall, braced his heels in the earth, and pulled the condemned man back, so that he immediately collapsed. The soldier looked down at him as he writhed around, making his chain clink. "'Stand him up!' cried the officer. Then he noticed that the condemned man was distracting the traveller too much. The latter was even leaning out away from the harrow, without paying any attention to it, wanting to find out what was happening to the condemned man. "'Handle him carefully!' the officer yelled again. He ran around the apparatus, personally grabbed the condemned man under the armpits, and with the help of the soldier stood the man, whose feet kept slipping upright. "'Now I know all about it,' said the traveller, as the officer turned back to him again. "'Except the most important thing,' said the latter, grabbing the traveller by the arm and pointing up high. "'There in the inscriber is the mechanism which determines the movement of the harrow, and this mechanism is arranged according to the diagram on which the sentence is set down. I still use the diagrams of the previous commandant. Here they are.' He pulled some pages out of the leather folder. "'Unfortunately I can't hand them to you. They are the most cherished thing I possess. Sit down, and I'll show you them from this distance. Then you'll be able to see it all well.' He showed the first sheet. The traveller would have been happy to say something appreciative, but all he saw was a labyrinthine series of lines, criss-crossing each other in all sorts of ways. These covered the paper so thickly that only with difficulty could one make out the white spaces in between. "'Read it,' said the officer. "'I can't,' said the traveller. "'But it's clear,' said the officer. "'It's very elaborate,' said the traveller evasively but I can't decipher it. Yes, said the officer, smiling, and putting the folder back again. It's not calligraphy for schoolchildren. One has to read it a long time. You too will finally understand it clearly. Of course, it has to be a script that isn't simple. You see, it's not supposed to kill right away, but on average over a period of twelve hours. The turning point is set for the sixth hour. There must also be many, many embellishments surrounding the basic script. The essential script moves around the body only in a narrow belt. The rest of the body is reserved for decoration. Can you now appreciate the work of the harrow, and the whole apparatus? Just look at it!" He jumped up the ladder, turned a wheel, and called down, "'Watch out! Move to the side!' Everything started moving. If the wheel had not squeaked, it would have been marvellous. The officer threatened the wheel with his fist, as if he was surprised by the disturbance it created. Then he spread his arms, apologising to the traveller and quickly clambered down, in order to observe the operation of the apparatus from below. Something was still not working properly, something only he noticed. He clambered up again, and reached with both hands into the inside of the inscriber. Then, in order to descend more quickly, instead of using the ladder, he slid down one of the poles, and, to make himself understandable through the noise, strained his voice to the limit as he yelled in the traveller's ear, "'Do you understand the process? The harrow is starting to write.' When it's finished with the first part of the script on the man's back, the layer of cotton wool rolls and turns the body slowly onto its side to give the harrow a new area. Meanwhile, those parts lacerated by the inscription are lying on the cotton wool, which, because it has been specially treated, immediately stops the bleeding and prepares the script for a further deepening. Here, as the body continues to rotate, prongs on the edge of the harrow then pull the cotton wool from the wounds, throw it into the pit, and the harrow goes to work again. In this way it keeps making the inscription deeper for twelve hours. For the first six hours the condemned man goes on living almost as before. He suffers nothing but pain. After two hours the felt is removed, for at that point the man has no more energy for screaming. Here at the head of the bed warm rice pudding is put into this electrically heated bowl. From this the man, if he feels like it, can help himself to what he can lap up with his tongue. No one passes up this opportunity. 
I don't know of a single one, and I've had a lot of experience. He first loses his pleasure in eating around the sixth hour. I usually kneel down at this point and observe the phenomenon. The man rarely swallows the last bit. He turns it around in his mouth and spits it into the pit. When he does that, I have to lean aside or else he'll get me in the face. But how quiet the man becomes around the sixth hour. The most stupid of them begin to understand. It starts around the eyes and spreads out from there. A look that could tempt one to lie down under the harrow. Nothing else happens. The man simply begins to decipher the inscription. He purses his lips, as if he is listening. You've seen that it is not easy to figure out the inscription with your eyes. But our man deciphers it with his wounds. True, it takes a lot of work. It requires six hours to complete. But then the harrow spits him right out and throws him into the pit, where he splashes down into the bloody water and cotton wool. Then the judgment is over, and we, the soldier and I, quickly bury him. The traveller had leaned his ear towards the officer, and with his hands in his coat pockets was observing the machine at work. The condemned man was also watching, but without understanding. He bent forward a little and followed the moving needles, as the soldier, after a signal from the officer, cut through his shirt and trousers with a knife from the back, so that they fell off the condemned man. He wanted to grab the falling garments to cover his bare flesh, but the soldier held him up and shook the last rags from him. The officer turned the machine off, and in the silence which then ensued, the condemned man was laid out under the harrow. The chains were taken off, and the straps fastened in their place. For the condemned man it seemed at first glance to signify almost a relief, and now the harrow sunk down a stage lower, for the condemned was a thin man. As the needle-tips touched him, a shudder went over his skin. While the soldier was busy with the right hand, the condemned man stretched out his left, with no sense of its direction, but it was pointing to where the traveller was standing. The officer kept looking at the traveller from the side, without taking his eyes off him, as if he was trying to read from his face the impression he was getting of the execution, which he had now explained to him, at least superficially. The strap, meant to hold the wrist, ripped off. The soldier probably had pulled on it too hard. The soldier showed the officer the torn-off piece of strap, wanting him to help. So the officer went over to him, and said, with his face turned towards the traveller, "'The machine is very complicated. Now and then something has to tear or break. One shouldn't let that detract from one's overall opinion. Anyway, we have an immediate replacement for the strap. I'll use a chain, even though that will affect the sensitivity of the movement for the right arm.' And while he put the chain in place he kept talking. "'Our resources for maintaining the machine are very limited at the moment.' Under the previous commandant, I had free access to a cash-box specially set aside for this purpose. There was a storeroom here in which all possible replacement parts were kept. I admit I made almost extravagant use of it. I mean earlier, not now, as the new commandant claims. For him, everything serves only as a pretext to fight against the old arrangements. Now he keeps the cash-box or machinery under his own control, and if I ask him for a new strap, he demands the torn one as a piece of evidence. The new one doesn't arrive for ten days, and it's an inferior brand of not much use to me. But how am I supposed to get the machine to work in the meantime without a strap? No one's concerned about that. The traveller was thinking, it's always questionable to intervene decisively in strange circumstances. He was neither a citizen of the penal colony, nor a citizen of the state to which it belonged. If he wanted to condemn the execution, or even hinder it, people could say to him, you're a foreigner, keep quiet. He would have nothing in response to that, but could only add that he did not understand what he was doing on this occasion, for the purpose of his travelling was merely to observe and not to alter other people's judicial systems in any way. True, at this point, the way things were turning out, it was very tempting. The injustice of the process and the inhumanity of the execution were beyond doubt. No one could assume that the traveller was acting out of any sense of his own self-interest, for the condemned man was a stranger to him, not a countryman, and not someone who invited sympathy in any way. The traveller himself had letters of reference from high officials, and had been welcomed here with great courtesy. The fact that he had been invited to this execution even seemed to indicate that people were asking for his judgment of this trial. This was all the more likely since the commandant, as he had now heard only too clearly, was no supporter of this process, 
and maintained an almost hostile relationship with the officer. Then the traveller heard a cry of rage from the officer. He had just shoved the stub of felt in the condemned man's mouth, not without difficulty, when the condemned man, overcome by an irresistible nausea, shut his eyes and threw up. The officer quickly yanked him up off the stump, and wanted to turn his head aside toward the pit, but it was too late. The vomit was already flowing down onto the machine. "'This is all the commandant's fault!' cried the officer, and mindlessly rattled the brass rods at the front. "'My machine's as filthy as a pigsty!' With trembling hands he showed the traveller what had happened. "'Haven't I spent hours trying to make the commandant understand that a day before the execution there should be no more food served? But the new lenient administration has a different opinion. Before the man is led away, the commandant's women cram sugary things down his throat. His whole life he's fed himself on stinking fish, and now he has to eat sweets. But that would be all right. I'd have no objections. But why don't they get a new felt, the way I've been asking him for three months now? How can anyone take this felt into his mouth without feeling disgusted? Something that a hundred men have sucked and bitten on it as they were dying. The condemned man had laid his head down and appeared peaceful. The soldier was busy cleaning up the machine with the condemned man's shirt. The officer went up to the traveller, who, feeling some premonition, took a step backwards. But the officer grasped him by the hand and pulled him aside. "'I want to speak a few words to you in confidence,' he said. "'May I do that?' "'Of course,' said the traveller, and listened with his eyes lowered. "'This process and execution, which you now have an opportunity to admire, have no more open supporters in our colony. I am its only defender, just as I am the single advocate for the legacy of the old commandant. I can no longer think about a more extensive organization of the process. I am using all my powers to maintain what there is at present. When the old commandant was alive, the colony was full of his supporters. I have something of the old commandant's power of persuasion, but I completely lack his power, and as a result the supporters have gone into hiding. There are still a lot of them, but no one admits to it. If you go into a tea-house to-day, that is to say, on a day of execution, and keep your ears open, perhaps you will hear nothing but ambiguous remarks. They are all supporters, but under the present commandant, considering his present views, they are totally useless to me. And now I am asking you, should such a life's work, he pointed to the machine, come to nothing? because of this commandant and the women influencing him. Should people let that happen? Even if one is a foreigner, and only on our island for a couple of days. But there's no time to lose. People are already preparing something against my judicial proceedings. Discussions are already taking place in the commandant's headquarters, to which I am not invited. Even your visit today seems to me typical of the whole situation. People are cowards, and send you out, a foreigner. You should have seen the executions in earlier days. The entire valley was overflowing with people, even a day before the execution. They all came merely to watch. Early in the morning the commandant appeared with his women. Fanfares woke up the entire campsite. I delivered the news that everything was ready. The whole society, and every high official had to attend, arranged itself around the machine. This pile of cane chairs is a sorry leftover from that time. The machine was freshly cleaned and glowed. For almost every execution I had new replacement parts. In front of hundreds of eyes, all the spectators stood on tiptoe right up to the hills there. The condemned man was laid down under the harrow by the commandant himself. What nowadays is done by a common soldier was then my work as the senior judge, and it was an honour for me. And then the execution began. No discordant note disturbed the work of the machine. Many people did not look any more at all, but lay down with closed eyes in the sand. They all knew. Now justice was being carried out. In silence people listened to nothing but the groans of the condemned man, muffled by the felt. These days the machine no longer manages to squeeze a strong groan out of the condemned man, something the felt is not capable of smothering. But back then the needles which made the inscription dripped a caustic liquid, which we are not permitted to use any more today. Well, then came the sixth hour. It was impossible to grant all the requests people made to be allowed to watch from up close. The commandant, in his wisdom, arranged that the children should be taken care of before all the rest. Naturally, I was always allowed to stand close by because of my official position. 
Often I crouched down there with two small children in my arms, on my right and left. How we all took in the expression of transfiguration on the martyred face! How we held our cheeks in the glow of this justice, finally attained, and already passing away! What times we had, my friend! The officer had obviously forgotten who was standing in front of him. He had put his arm around the traveller, and laid his head on his shoulder. The traveller was extremely embarrassed. Impatiently he looked away over the officer's head. The soldier had ended his task of cleaning, and had just shaken some rice pudding into the bowl from a tin. No sooner had the condemned man, who seemed to have fully recovered already, noticed this, than his tongue began to lick at the pudding. The soldier kept pushing him away, for the pudding was probably meant for a later time. But in any case, it was not proper for the soldier to reach in and grab some food with his dirty hands, and eat it in front of the famished condemned man. The officer quickly collected himself. I, I didn't want to upset you in any way, he said. I know it is impossible to make someone understand those days now. Beside, the machine still works and operates on its own. It operates on its own even when it is standing alone in this valley. And at the end, the body still keeps falling in that incredibly soft flight into the pit, even if hundreds of people are not gathered like flies around the hole the way they used to be. Back then, we had to erect a strong railing around the pit. It was pulled out long ago. The traveller wanted to turn his face away from the officer, and looked aimlessly around him. The officer thought he was looking at the wasteland of the valley. So he grabbed his hands, turned him around in order to catch his gaze, and asked, "'Do you see the shame of it?' But the traveller said nothing. The officer left him alone for a while. With his legs apart and his hands on his hips, the officer stood still and looked at the ground. Then he smiled at the traveller cheerfully and said, "'Yesterday I was nearby when the commandant invited you. I heard the invitation. I know the commandant. I understood right away what he intended with his invitation. Although his power might be sufficiently great to take action against me, he doesn't yet dare to. But my guess is that with you he is exposing me to the judgment of a respected foreigner. He calculates things with care. You are now in your second day on the island. You didn't know the old commandant and his way of thinking. You are trapped in a European way of seeing things. Perhaps you are fundamentally opposed to the death penalty in general, and to this kind of mechanical style of execution in particular. Moreover, you see how the execution is a sad procedure, without any public participation, using a partially damaged machine. Now, if we take all of this together, so the commandant thinks, surely one could easily imagine that you would not consider my procedure proper. And if you didn't consider it right, you wouldn't keep quiet about it. I'm still speaking the mind of the commandant, for you no doubt have faith that your tried and true convictions are correct. It's true that you have seen many peculiar things among many peoples, and have learnt to respect them. Thus, you will probably not speak out against the procedure with your full power, as you would, perhaps, in your own homeland. But the Commandant doesn't really need that. A casual word, merely a careless remark, is enough. It doesn't have to match your convictions at all, so long as it corresponds to his wishes. I'm certain he will use all his shrewdness to interrogate you and his women will stand around in a circle and perk up their ears. You will say something like, Among us the judicial procedures are different, or With us the accused is questioned before the verdict, or We had torture only in the Middle Ages. For you these observations appear as correct as they are self-evident, innocent remarks which do not impugn my procedure. But how will the commandant take them? I see him, our excellent commandant, the way he immediately pushes his stool aside and hurries out to the balcony. I see his women, how they stream after him. I hear his voice. The women call it a thunder voice. And now he's speaking. A great Western explorer who has been commissioned to inspect judicial procedures in all countries has just said that our process based on old customs is inhuman. After the verdict of such a personality, it is, of course, no longer possible for me to tolerate this procedure. So from this day on I am ordering... And so forth. You want to intervene. You didn't say what he is reporting. You didn't call my procedure inhuman. By contrast, in keeping with your deep insight, you consider it most humane and most worthy of human beings. You also admire this machinery, but it is too late. You don't even go on to the balcony, which is already filled with women. You want to attract attention. You want to cry out. But a lady's hand is covering your mouth. 
and I and the old commandant's works are lost. The traveller had to suppress a smile, so the work which he had considered so difficult was easy. He said evasively, You're exaggerating my influence. The commandant has read my letters of recommendation. He knows that I'm no expert in judicial processes. If I were to express an opinion, it would be that of a lay person, no more significant than the opinion of anyone else, and in any case far less significant than the opinion of the commandant, who, as I understand it, has very extensive powers in this penal colony. If his views of this procedure are as definite as you think they are, then I'm afraid the time has come for this procedure to end, without any need for my humble opinion. Did the officer understand by now? No, he did not yet get it. He shook his head vigorously, briefly looked back at the condemned man and the soldier, who both flinched and stopped eating the rice, went up really close to the traveller, without looking into his face, but gazing at parts of his jacket, and said more gently than before, "'You don't know the commandant. Where he and all of us are concerned, you are, forgive the expression, to a certain extent innocent. Your influence, believe me, cannot be overestimated. In fact, I was blissfully happy when I heard that you were to be present at the execution by yourself. This order of the commandant was aimed at me, but now I'll turn it to my advantage, without being distracted by false insinuations and disparaging looks, which could not have been avoided with a greater number of participants at the execution. You have listened to my explanation, looked at the machine, and are now about to view the execution. Your verdict is no doubt already fixed. If some small uncertainties remain, witnessing the execution will remove them, and now I am asking you help me with the commandant. The traveller did not let him go on talking. How can I do that? he cried. It's totally impossible. I can help you as little as I can harm you. You could do it, said the officer. With some apprehension, the traveller observed that the officer was clenching his fists. You could do it, repeated the officer even more emphatically. I have a plan which must succeed. You think your influence is insufficient. I know it will be enough. But assuming you're right, doesn't saving this whole procedure require one to try even those methods which may be inadequate? So listen to my plan. To carry it out it's necessary, above all, for you to keep as quiet as possible today in the colony about your verdict on this procedure. Unless someone asks you directly, you should not express any view whatsoever. But what you do say must be short and vague. People should notice that it's difficult for you to speak about the subject, that you feel bitter, that if you were to speak openly you'd have to burst out cursing on the spot. I'm not asking you to lie, not at all. You should only give brief answers, something like, Yes, I've seen the execution, or Yes, I've heard the full explanation. That's all, nothing further, for that will be enough of an indication for people to observe in you a certain bitterness, even if that's not what the commandant will think. Naturally, he will completely misunderstand the issue and interpret it in his own way. My plan is based on that. Tomorrow, a large meeting of all the higher administrative officials takes place at headquarters under the chairmanship of the commandant. He, of course, understands how to turn such a meeting into a spectacle. A gallery has been built, which is always full of spectators. I am compelled to take part in the discussions, though they fill me with disgust. In any case, you will certainly be invited to the meeting. If you follow my plan today, and behave accordingly, the invitation will become an emphatic request. But should you for some inexplicable reason still not be invited, you must make sure you request an invitation. Then you'll receive one without question. Now tomorrow you're sitting with the women in the commandant's box. With frequent upward glances he reassures himself that you are there. After various trivial and ridiculous agenda items designed for the spectators, mostly harbour construction, always harbour construction, the judicial process comes up for discussion. If it's not raised by the commandant himself, or does not occur soon enough, I'll make sure that it comes up. I'll stand up and report on today's execution. Really briefly, just the report. Such a report is not really customary. However, I'll do it, nonetheless. The commandant thanks me, as always, with a friendly smile. And now he cannot restrain himself. He seizes this excellent opportunity. The report of the execution, he'll say, or something like that. 
has just been given. I would like to add to this report only that the fact that this particular execution was attended by the great explorer whose visit confers such extraordinary honour on our colony, as you all know. Even the significance of our meeting today has been increased by his presence. Should we not now ask this great explorer for his appraisal of the execution based on old customs and of the process which preceded it? Of course there is the noise of applause everywhere, universal agreement, and I am louder than anyone. The commandant bows before you and says, Then in everyone's name I am putting the question to you. And now you step up to the railing. Place your hands where everyone can see them, otherwise the ladies will grab them and play with your fingers. And now finally come your remarks. I don't know how I'll bear the tension up to then. In your speech you mustn't hold back. Let truth resound. Lean over the railing and shout it out. Yes, yes, roar your opinion at the commandant, your unshakable opinion. But perhaps you don't want to do that. It doesn't suit your character. Perhaps in your country people behave differently in such situations. That's all right. That's perfectly satisfactory. Don't stand up at all. Just say a couple of words. Whisper them so that only the officials underneath you can just hear them. That's enough. You don't even have to say anything at all about the lack of attendance at the execution, or about the squeaky wheel, the torn strap, or the disgusting felt. No, I'll take over all further details, and, believe me, if my speech doesn't chase him out of the room, it will force him to his knees, so he'll have to admit it. Old Commandant, I bow down before you. That's my plan. Do you want to help me carry it out? But of course you want to. More than that, you have to and the officer gripped the traveller by both arms and looked at him, breathing heavily into his face. He had yelled the last sentences so loudly that even the soldier and the condemned man were paying attention. Although they couldn't understand a thing, they stopped eating, and looked over at the traveller, still chewing. From the start the traveller had had no doubts about the answer he must give. He had experienced too much in his life to be able to waver here. Basically, he was honest and unafraid. Still, with the soldier and the condemned man looking at him, he hesitated a moment, but finally he said, as he had to, No. The officer's eyes blinked several times, but he did not take his eyes off the traveller. Would you like an explanation? asked the traveller. The officer nodded dumbly. I am opposed to this procedure, said the traveller. Even before you took me into your confidence, and of course I will never abuse your confidence under any circumstances, I was already thinking about whether I was entitled to intervene against this procedure, and whether my intervention could have the smallest chance of success. And if that was the case, it was clear to me whom I had to turn to first of all, naturally to the Commandant. You clarified the issue for me even more, but without reinforcing my decision in any way, quite the reverse. I find your conviction genuinely moving, even if it cannot deter me. The officer remained quiet turned towards the machine, grabbed one of the brass rods, and then, leaning back a little, looked up at the inscriber, as if he was checking that everything was in order. The soldier and the condemned man seemed to have made friends with each other. The condemned man was making signs to the soldier, although, given the tight straps on him, this was difficult for him to do. The soldier was leaning into him. The condemned man whispered something to him, and the soldier nodded. The traveller went over to the officer and said, you don't yet know what I'll do. Yes, I will tell the Commandant my opinion of the procedure, not in a meeting, but in private. In addition, I won't stay here long enough to be able to get called in to some meeting or other. Early tomorrow morning I leave, or at least I go on board ship. It didn't look as if the officer had been listening. So the process has not convinced you, he said to himself, smiling the way an old man smiles over the silliness of a child, concealing his own true thoughts behind that smile. "'Well, then, it's time,' he said finally, and suddenly looked at the traveller with bright eyes, which contained some sort of demand, some appeal for participation. "'Time for what?' asked the traveller, uneasily, but there was no answer. "'You're free,' the officer told the condemned man in his own language. At first the man did not believe him. "'You're free now,' said the officer. For the first time the face of the condemned man showed signs of real life. Was it the truth?' Was it only the officer's mood which could change? Had the foreign traveller brought him a reprieve? What was it? That's what the man's face seemed to be asking. But not for long. Whatever the case might be, if he could, he wanted to be truly free, and he began to shake back and forth, as much as the harrow permitted. "'You're tearing my straps!' cried the officer, 
"'Be still. We'll undo them right away.' And giving a signal to the soldier, he set to work with him. The condemned man said nothing and smiled slightly to himself. He turned his face to the officer, and then to the soldier, and then back again, without ignoring the traveller. "'Pull him out,' the officer ordered the soldier. This process required a certain amount of care because of the harrow. The condemned man already had a few small wounds on his back, thanks to his own impatience. From this point on, however, the officer paid him hardly any attention. He went up to the traveller, pulled out the small leather folder once more, leafed through it, finally found the sheet he was looking for, and showed it to the traveller. "'Read that,' he said. "'I can't,' said the traveller. "'I've already told you I can't read these pages.' "'But take a close look at the page,' said the officer, and moved up right next to the traveller, in order to read with him. When that didn't help, he raised his little finger high up over the paper, as if the page must not be touched under any circumstances, so that using this he might make the task of reading easier for the traveller. The traveller also made an effort, so that at least he could satisfy the officer, but it was impossible for him. Then the officer began to spell out the inscription, and then read out once again the joined-up letters. "'Be just, it states,' he said. "'Now you can read it.' The traveller bent so low over the paper that the officer, afraid he might touch it, moved it further away. The traveller didn't say anything more, but it was clear that he was still unable to read anything. "'Be just, it says,' the officer remarked once again. "'That could be,' said the traveller. "'I do believe that's written there.' "'Good,' said the officer, at least partially satisfied. He climbed up the ladder, holding the paper. With great care he set the page in the inscriber, and appeared to rotate the gear mechanism completely around. This was very tiring work. It must have required him to deal with extremely small wheels. He had to inspect the gears so closely that sometimes his head disappeared completely into the inscriber. The traveller followed this work from below, without looking away. His neck grew stiff, and his eyes found the sunlight pouring down from the sky painful. The soldier and the condemned man were keeping each other busy. With the tip of his bayonet the soldier pulled out the condemned man's shirt and trousers which were lying in the hole. The shirt was horribly dirty, and the condemned man washed it in the bucket of water. When he was putting on his shirt and trousers, the soldier and the condemned man had to laugh out loud, for the pieces of clothing were cut in two up the back. Perhaps the condemned man thought that it was his duty to amuse the soldier. In his ripped-up clothes he circled around the soldier, who crouched down on the ground, laughed and slapped his knees, but they restrained themselves out of consideration for the two gentlemen present. When the officer was finally finished up on the machine, with a smile he looked over the whole thing and all its parts one more time, and this time closed the cover of the inscriber, which had been open up to this point. He climbed down, looked into the hole, and then at the condemned man, observed with satisfaction that he had pulled out his clothes, then went to the bucket of water to wash his hands, recognized too late that it was disgustingly dirty, and was upset that now he couldn't wash his hands. Finally he pushed them into the sand. This option didn't satisfy him, but he had to do what he could in the circumstances. Then he stood up and began to unbutton the coat of his uniform. As he did this, the two ladies' handkerchiefs, which he had pushed into the back of his collar, fell into his hands. "'Here, you have your handkerchiefs,' he said, and threw them over to the condemned man and to the traveller he said by way of an explanation, "'Presents from the ladies!' In spite of the obvious speed with which he took off the coat of his uniform, and then undressed himself completely, he handled each piece of clothing very carefully, even running his fingers over the silver braids on his tunic with special care, and shaking a tassel into place. But in great contrast to this care, as soon as he was finished handling an article of clothing, he immediately flung it angrily into the hole. The last items he had left were his short sword and its harness. He pulled the sword out of its scabbard, broke it into pieces, gathered up everything, the pieces of his sword, the scabbard and the harness, and threw them away so forcefully that they rattled against each other down in the pit. Now he stood there naked. The traveller bit his lip and said nothing, for he was aware what would happen, but he had no right to hinder the officer in any way. If the judicial process to which the officer clung was really so close to the point of being cancelled, perhaps as a result of the intervention of the traveller, something to which he for his part felt duty-bound, then the officer 
was now acting in a completely correct manner. In his place the traveller would not have acted any differently. The soldier and the condemned man at first didn't understand a thing. To begin with they didn't look, not even once. The condemned man was extremely happy to get the handkerchiefs back, but he couldn't enjoy them very long, for the soldier snatched them from him with a quick grab, which he had not anticipated. The condemned man then tried to pull the handkerchiefs out from the soldier's belt, where he had put them for safekeeping, but the soldier was too wary, so they were fighting half in jest. Only when the officer was fully naked did they start to pay attention. The condemned man, especially, seemed to be struck by a premonition of some sort of significant transformation. What had happened to him was now taking place with the officer. Perhaps this time the procedure would play itself out to its conclusion. The foreign traveller had probably given the order, so that was revenge. Without having suffered all the way to the end himself, nonetheless he would be completely revenged. A wide, silent laugh now appeared on his face, and did not go away. The officer, however, had turned towards the machine. If earlier on it had already become clear that he understood the machine thoroughly, one might well get alarmed now at the way he handled it and how it obeyed. He only had to bring his hand near the harrow for it to rise and sink several times, until it had reached the correct position to make room for him. He only had to grasp the bed by the edges, and it already began to quiver. The stump of felt moved up to his mouth. One could see how the officer really didn't want to accept it, but his hesitation was only momentary. He immediately submitted and took it in. Everything was ready, except that the straps still hung down on the sides, but they were clearly unnecessary. The officer did not have to be strapped down. When the condemned man saw the loose straps, he thought the execution would be incomplete unless they were fastened. He waved eagerly to the soldier, and they ran over to strap in the officer. The latter had already stuck out his foot to kick the crank designed to set the inscriber in motion. Then he saw the two men coming, so he pulled his foot back and let himself be strapped in, but now he could no longer reach the crank. Neither the soldier nor the condemned man would find it, and the traveller was determined not to touch it. But that was unnecessary. Hardly were the straps attached when the machine already started working. The bed quivered, the needles danced on his skin, and the harrow swung up and down. The traveller had already been staring for some time before he remembered that a wheel in the inscriber was supposed to squeak, but everything was quiet without the slightest audible hum. Because of its silent working, the machine did not really attract attention. The traveller looked over at the soldier and the condemned man. The condemned man was the livelier of the two. Everything in the machine interested him. At times he bent down. At other times he stretched up, all the time pointing with his forefinger, in order to show something to the soldier. For the traveller it was embarrassing. He was determined to remain here until the end, but he could no longer endure the sight of the two men. "'Go home,' he said. The soldier might have been ready to do that, but the condemned man took the order as a direct punishment. With his hands folded he begged and pleaded to be allowed to stay there, and when the traveller shook his head and was unwilling to give in, he even knelt down. Seeing that orders were of no help here, the traveller wanted to go over and chase the two away. Then he heard a noise from up in the inscriber. He looked up. So was the gear-wheel going out of alignment? But it was something else. The lid on the inscriber was lifting up slowly. Then it fell completely open. The teeth of a cogwheel were exposed and lifted up. Soon the entire wheel appeared. It was as if some huge force was compressing the inscriber, so that there was no longer sufficient room for this wheel. The wheel rolled all the way to the edge of the inscriber, fell down, rolled upright a bit in the sand, and then fell over and lay still. But already, up on the inscriber, another gear-wheel was moving upward. Several others followed, large ones, small ones, ones hard to distinguish. With each of them the same thing happened. One kept thinking that now the inscriber must surely be empty, but then a new cluster with lots of parts would move up, fall down, roll in the sand, and lie still. With all this going on, the condemned man totally forgot the traveller's order. The gear-wheels completely delighted him. He kept wanting to grab one, and at the same time he was urging the soldier to help him but he kept pulling his hand back, startled, for immediately another wheel followed, which 
at least in its initial rolling, surprised him. The traveller, by contrast, was very upset. Obviously the machine was breaking up. Its quiet operation had been an illusion. He felt as if he had to look after the officer, now that the latter could no longer look after himself. But while the falling gear-wheels were claiming all his attention, he had neglected to look at the rest of the machine. However, when he now bent over the harrow, once the last gear-wheel had left the inscriber, he had a new, even more unpleasant surprise. The harrow was not writing, but only stabbing, and the bed was not rolling the body, but lifting it quivering up into the needles. The traveller wanted to reach in to stop the whole thing, if possible. This was not the torture the officer wished to attain. It was murder, pure and simple. He stretched out his hands, but at that point the harrow was already moving upwards and to the side, with the skewered body, just as it did in other cases, but only in the twelfth hour. Blood flowed out in hundreds of streams, not mixed with water. The water-tubes had also failed to work this time. Then one last thing went wrong. The body would not come loose from the needles. Its blood streamed out, but it hung over the pit without falling. The harrow wanted to move back to its original position, but, as if it realized that it could not free itself of its load, it remained over the hole. Help! the traveller yelled out to the soldier and the condemned man, and grabbed the officer's feet. He wanted to push against the feet himself, and have the two others grab the officer's head from the other side, so that he could be slowly taken off the needles. But now the two men could not make up their mind whether to come or not. The condemned man turned away at once. The traveller had to go over to him and drag him to the officer's head by force. At this point, almost against his will, he looked at the face of the corpse. It was as it had been in his life. He could discover no sign of the promised transfiguration. What all the others had found in the machine, the officer had not. His lips were pressed firmly together. His eyes were open, and looked as they had when he was alive. His gaze was calm and convinced. The tip of a large iron needle had gone through his forehead. As the traveller, with the soldier and the condemned man behind him, came to the first houses in the colony, the soldier pointed to one and said, "'That's the tea-house.' On the ground floor of one of the houses was a deep low room, like a cave, with smoke-covered walls and ceiling. On the street side it was open all along its full width. Although there was little difference between the tea-house and the rest of the houses in the colony, which were all very dilapidated, except for the commandant's palatial structure, the traveller was struck by the impression of historical memory, and he felt the power of earlier times. Followed by his companions, he walked closer, going between the unoccupied tables, which stood in the street in front of the tea-house, and took a breath of the cool, stuffy air which came from inside. "'The old man is buried here,' said the soldier. A place in the cemetery was denied him by the chaplain. For a long time people were undecided where they should bury him. Finally they buried him here. Of course the officer explained none of that to you, for naturally he was the one most ashamed about it. A few times he even tried to dig up the old man at night, but he was always chased off. "'Where is the grave?' asked the traveller, who could not believe the soldier. Instantly both men, the soldier and the condemned man, ran in front of him, and with hands outstretched pointed to the place where the grave was located. They led this traveller to the back room where guests were sitting at a few tables. They were presumably dock-workers, strong men with short, shiny black beards. None of them wore coats, and their shirts were torn. They were poor, oppressed people. As the traveller came closer, a few got up, leaned against the wall, and looked at him. A whisper went up around the traveller. "'It's a foreigner. He wants to look at the grave.' They pushed one of the tables aside, under which there was a real gravestone. It was a symbol stone low enough for it to remain hidden under a table. It bore an inscription in very small letters. In order to read it, the traveller had to kneel down. It read, Here rests the old commandant. His followers, who are now not permitted to have a name, buried him in this grave and erected this stone. There exists a prophecy that the commandant will rise again after a certain number of years, and from this house will lead his followers to reconquest of the colony. Have faith, and wait. When the traveller had read it, and got up, he saw the men standing around him and smiling, as if they had read the inscription with him, found it ridiculous, 
and were asking him to share their opinion. The traveller acted as if he hadn't noticed, distributed some coins among them, waited until the table was pushed back over the grave, left the tea-house, and went to the harbour. In the tea-house the soldier and the condemned man had come across some people they knew who detained them. However, they must have broken free of them soon, because by the time the traveller found himself in the middle of a long staircase which led to the boats, they were already running after him. They probably wanted to force the traveller at the last minute to take them with him. While the traveller was haggling at the bottom of the stairs with a sailor about his passage out to the steamer, the two men were racing down the steps in silence, for they didn't dare cry out. But as they reached the bottom, the traveller was already in the boat, and the sailor at once cast off from shore. They could still have jumped into the boat, but the traveller picked up a heavy knotted rope from the boat bottom, threatened them with it, and thus prevented them from jumping in. End of In the Penal Colony by Franz Kafka Recorded by Peter Yearsley This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Last of the Troubadours by O. Henry Inexorably, Sam Galloway saddled his pony. He was going away from the Rancho Altito at the end of a three-month visit. It is not to be expected that a guest should put up with wheat coffee and biscuits yellow streaked with saleratus for longer than that. Nick Napoleon, the big negro man-cook, had never been able to make good biscuits. Once before, when Nick was cooking at the Willow Ranch, Sam had been forced to fly from his cuisine after only a six-week sojourn. On Sam's face was an expression of sorrow, deepened with regret and slightly tempered by the patient forgiveness of a connoisseur who cannot be understood. But very firmly and inexorably he buckled his saddle cinches, looped his stake rope, and hung it to his saddle horn, tied his slicker and coat on the cantle, and looped his quirt on his right wrist. The Mary Dews, householders of the Rancho Altito, men, women, children, and servants, vassals, visitors, employees, dogs, and casual callers were grouped in the gallery of the ranch house, all with faces set to the tune of melancholy and grief. Four. As the coming of Sam Galloway to any ranch, camp, or cabin between the rivers Frio or Bravo del Norte aroused joy, so his departure caused mourning and distress. And then, during absolute silence, except for the bumping of a hind elbow of a hound dog as he pursued a wicked flea, Sam tenderly and carefully tied his guitar across his saddle on top of his slicker and coat. The guitar was in a green duck bag, and if you catch the significance of it, it explains Sam. Sam Galloway was the last of the troubadours. Of course, you know about the troubadours. The encyclopedia says they flourished between the 11th and the 13th centuries. What they flourished doesn't seem clear. You may be pretty sure it wasn't a sword. Maybe it was a fiddle bow, or a fork full of spaghetti, or a lady's scarf. Anyhow, Sam Galloway was one of them. Sam put on a martyred expression as he mounted his pony, but the expression on his face was hilarious compared with the one on his ponies. You see, a pony gets to know his rider mighty well, and it is not unlikely that cow ponies in pastures and at hitching racks had often guided Sam's pony for being ridden by a guitar player instead of by a rollicking, cussing, all-wool cowboy. 
No man is a hero to his saddle horse. And even an escalator in a department store might be excused for tripping up a troubadour. Oh, I know I'm one, and so are you. You remember the stories you memorize and the card tricks you study and that little piece on the piano? How's it go? To tum, to tum, to tum. Those little Arabian ten-minute entertainments that you furnish when you go up to call on your rich Aunt Jane? You should know that omni personae in tres partes divisi sunt, namely, barons, troubadours, and workers. Barons have no inclination to read such falderall as this, and workers have no time, so I know you must be a troubadour, and that you will understand Sam Galloway. Whether we sing, act, dance, write, lecture, or paint, we are only troubadours, so let us make the worst of it. The pony with the Dante Alighieri face, guided by the pressure of Sam's knees, bore that wandering minstrel sixteen miles southeastward. Nature was in her most benignant mood. League after league of delicate sweet flowerets made fragrant the gently undulating prairie. The east wind tempered the spring warmth. Wool-white clouds flying in from the Mexican Gulf hindered the direct rays of the April sun. Sam sang songs as he rode. Under his pony's bridle he had tucked some sprigs of chaparral to keep away the deer flies. Thus crowned, the long-faced quadruped looked more Dante-esque than before, and, judging by his countenance, seemed to think of Beatrice. Straight as topography permitted, Sam rode to the sheep ranch of old man Ellison. A visit to a sheep ranch seemed to him desirable just then. There had been too many people, too much noise, argument, competition, confusion at Rancho Altito. He had never conferred upon old man Ellison the favor of sojourning at his ranch, but he knew he would be welcome. The troubadour is his own passport everywhere. The workers in the castle let down the drawbridge to him, and the baron sets him at his left hand at table in the banquet hall. Their ladies smile upon him and applaud his songs and stories, while the workers bring boar's heads and flagons. If the baron nods once or twice in his carved oaken chair, he does not do it maliciously. Old man Ellison welcomed the troubadour flatteringly. He had often heard praises of Sam Galloway from other ranchmen who had been complimented by his visits, but had never aspired to such an honor for his own humble barony. I say barony because old man Ellison was the last of the barons. Of course, Mr. Bulwer Lytton lived too early to know him, or he wouldn't have conferred that sobriquet upon Warwick. In life it is the duty and the function of the baron to provide work for the workers and lodging and shelter for the troubadours. Old Man Ellison was a shrunken old man, with a short yellow-white beard and a face lined and seamed by past and gone smiles. His ranch was a little two-room box house in a grove of hackberry trees in the lonesomest part of the sheep country. His household consisted of a Kiowa Indian man cook, four hounds, a pet sheep, and a half-tamed coyote chained to a fence post. He owned three thousand sheep, which he ran on two sections of leased land and many thousands of acres, neither leased nor owned. Three or four times a year someone who spoke his language would ride up to his gate and exchange a few bald ideas with him. Those were red-letter days to old man Ellison. Then in what illuminated, embossed, and gorgeously decorated capitals must have been written the day on which a troubadour, a troubadour who, according to the encyclopedia, should have flourished between the 11th and 13th centuries, drew rein at the gates of his baronial castle. Old man Ellison's smiles came back and filled his wrinkles when he saw Sam. He hurried out of the house in his shuffling, limping way to greet him. "'Hello, Mr. Ellison,' called Sam cheerfully. "'Thought I'd drop over and see you a while. Notice you've had fine rains on your range. They ought to make good grazing for your spring lambs.' "'Well, well, well.' 
said old man Ellison. I'm mighty glad to see you, Sam. I never thought you'd take the trouble to ride over to as out of the way an old ranch as this. But you're mighty welcome. Light? I got a sack of new oats in the kitchen. Shall I bring out a feed for your hoss? Oats for him? said Sam derisively. No, sirree, he's as fat as a pig now on grass. He don't get road enough to keep him in condition. I'll just turn him in the horse pasture with the drag rope on, if you don't mind. I am positive that never during the eleventh and thirteenth centuries did Baron, Troubadour, and Worker amalgamate as harmoniously as their parallels did that evening at old man Ellison's sheep ranch. The Kiowa's biscuits were light and tasty and his coffee strong. Ineradicable hospitality and appreciation glowed on old man Ellison's weather-tanned face. As for the troubadour, he said to himself that he had stumbled upon pleasant places indeed. A well-cooked, abundant meal, a host whom his lightest attempt to entertain seemed to delight far beyond the merits of the exertion, and the reposeful atmosphere that his sensitive soul at that time craved united to confer upon him a satisfaction and luxurious ease that he had seldom found on his tours of the ranches. After the delectable supper, Sam untied the green duck bag and took out his guitar. Not by way of payment, mind you. Neither Sam Galloway nor any of the other true troubadours are lineal descendants of the late Tommy Tucker. You have read of Tommy Tucker in the works of the esteemed but often obscure Mother Goose. Tommy Tucker sang for his supper. No true troubadour would do that. He would have his supper and then sing for art's sake. Sam Galloway's repertoire comprised about fifty funny stories and between thirty and forty songs. He by no means stopped there. He could talk through twenty cigarettes on any topic that you brought up, and he never sat up when he could lie down, and never stood when he could sit. I am strongly disposed to linger with him, for I am drawing a portrait, as well as a blunt pencil and a tattered thesaurus will allow. I wish you could have seen him. He was small and tough and inactive beyond the power of imagination to conceive. He wore an ultramarine blue woolen shirt laced down the front with a pearl gray exaggerated sort of shoestring, indestructible brown duck clothes, inevitable high-heeled boots with Mexican spurs, and a Mexican straw sombrero. That evening Sam and old man Ellison dragged their chairs out under the hackberry trees. They lighted cigarettes, and the troubadour gaily touched his guitar. Many of the songs he sang were the weird, melancholy, minor-keyed canciones that he had learned from the Mexican sheep herders and vaqueros. One in particular charmed and soothed the soul of the lonely baron. It was a favorite song of the sheep herders, beginning, Wee Wee Palomita which being translated means, Fly, fly, little dove. Sam sang it for old man Ellison many times that evening. The troubadour stayed on at the old man's ranch. There was peace and quiet and appreciation there, such as he had not found in the noisy camps of the cattle kings. No audience in the world could have crowned the work of poet, musician, or artist with more worshipful and unflagging approval than that bestowed upon his efforts by old man Ellison. No visit by a royal personage to a humble woodchopper or peasant could have been received with more flattering thankfulness and joy. On a cool canvas-covered cot in the shade of the hackberry trees, Sam Galloway passed the greater part of his time. There he rolled his brown paper cigarettes, read such tedious literature as the ranch afforded, and added to his repertoire of improvisations that he played so expertly on his guitar. To him, as a slave ministering to a great lord, the Kiowa brought cool water from the red jar hanging under the brush shelter, and food when he called for it. The prairie zephyrs fanned him mildly. Mockingbirds at morn and eve competed with but scarce equaled the sweet melodies of his lyre, 
a perfumed stillness seemed to fill all his world. While old man Ellison was pottering among his flocks of sheep on his mile-an-hour pony, and while the Kiowa took his siesta in the burning sunshine at the end of the kitchen, Sam would lie on his cot thinking what a happy world he lived in, and how kind it is to the ones whose mission in life it is to give entertainment and pleasure. Here he had food and lodging as good as he had ever longed for, absolute immunity from care or exertion or strife, an endless welcome, and a host whose delight at the sixteenth repetition of a song or a story was as keen as at its initial given. Was there ever a troubadour of old who struck upon as royal a castle in his wanderings? While he lay thus, meditating upon his blessings, little brown cottontails would shyly frolic through the yard. A covey of white, top-knotted blue quail would run past in single file twenty yards away. A paisano bird out hunting for tarantulas would hop upon the fence and salute him with sweeping flourishes of its long tail. In the eighty-acre horse pasture the pony with the Dante-esque face grew fat and almost smiling. The troubadour was at the end of his wanderings. Old man Ellison was his own vaciero. That means he supplied his sheep camps with wood, water, and rations by his own labors instead of hiring a vaciero. On small ranches it is often done. One morning he started for the camp of Incarnacion Felipe de la Cruz y Monte Piedras, one of his sheep herders, with the week's usual rations of brown beans, coffee, meal, and sugar. Two miles away on the trail from Old Fort Ewing he met face to face a terrible being called King James mounted on a fiery, prancing, Kentucky-bred horse. King James's real name was James King, but people reversed it because it seemed to fit him better, and also because it seemed to please his majesty. King James was the biggest cattleman between the Alamo Plaza in San Antone and Bill Hopper's saloon in Brownsville. Also, he was the loudest and most offensive bully and braggart and bad man in southwest Texas. And he always made good whenever he bragged, and the more noise he made, the more dangerous he was. In the story papers, it is always the quiet, mild-mannered man with light blue eyes and a low voice who turns out to be really dangerous. But in real life, and in this story, such is not the case. Give me my choice between assaulting a large, loud-mouthed roughhouser and an inoffensive stranger with blue eyes sitting quietly in a corner, and you will see something doing in the corner every time. King James, as I intended to say earlier, was a fierce, two-hundred-pound, sunburned, blonde man, as pink as an October strawberry, and with two horizontal slits under shaggy red eyebrows for eyes. On that day he wore a flannel shirt that was tan-colored, with the exception of certain large areas which were darkened by transudations due to the summer sun. There seemed to be other clothing and garnishings about him, such as brown duck trousers stuffed into immense boots and red handkerchiefs and revolvers, and a shotgun laid across his saddle and a leather belt with millions of cartridges shining in it. But your mind skidded off such accessories. What held your gaze was just the two little horizontal slits that he used for eyes. This was the man that old man Ellison met on the trail. And when you count up in the baron's favor that he was sixty-five and weighed ninety-eight pounds and had heard of King James's record, and that he, the baron, had a hankering for the vita simplex and had no gun with him and wouldn't have used it if he had, you can't censure him if I tell you that the smiles with which the troubadour had filled his wrinkles went out of them and left them plain wrinkles again. But he was not the kind of baron that flies from danger. He reined in the mile-an-hour pony no difficult fate, and saluted the formidable monarch. King James expressed himself with royal directness. "'You're that old snoozer that's running sheep on this range, ain't you?' said he. "'What right have you got to do it? Do you own any land or lease any?' "'I have two sections leased from the state,' said old man Ellison mildly. "'Not by no means you haven't,' said King James. "'Your lease expired yesterday, and I had a man at the land office on the minute to take it up. "'You don't control a foot of grass in Texas. "'You sheep men have got to get your time's up. 
It's a cattle country, and there ain't any room in it for snoozers. This range you've got your sheep on is mine. I'm putting up a wire fence forty by sixty miles, and if there's a sheep inside of it when it's done, it'll be a dead one. I'll give you a week to move yours away. If they ain't gone by then, I'll send six men over here with Winchester to make mutton out of the whole lot. And if I find you here at the same time, this is what you'll get. King James patted the breech of his shotgun warningly. Old man Ellison rode on to the camp of Incarnacion. He sighed many times, and the wrinkles in his face grew deeper. Rumors that the old order was about to change had reached him before. The end of free grass was in sight. Other troubles, too, had been accumulating upon his shoulders. His flocks were decreasing instead of growing. The price of wool was declining at every clip. Even Bradshaw, the storekeeper at Frio City, at whose store he bought his ranch supplies, was dunning him for his last six months' bill and threatening to cut him off. And so this last greatest calamity suddenly dealt out to him by the terrible King James was a crusher. When the old man got back to the ranch at sunset, he found Sam Galloway lying on his cot, propped against a roll of blankets and wool sacks, fingering his guitar. "'Hello, Uncle Ben!' the troubadour called cheerfully. "'You rolled in early this morning. I've been trying a new twist on the Spanish Fandango today. I just about got it. Here's how she goes. Listen!' "'That's fine. That's mighty fine!' said old man Ellison, sitting on the kitchen step and rubbing his white Scotch terrier whiskers. "'I reckon you got all the musicians beat east and west, Sam, as far as the roads are cut out.' "'Oh, I don't know,' said Sam, reflectively. "'But I certainly do get there on variations.' "'I guess I can handle anything in five flats about as well as any of them. "'But you look kind of fagged out, Uncle Ben. Ain't you feeling right well this evening?' little tired, that's all, Sam. If you ain't played yourself out, let's have that Mexican piece that starts off with Wheelie Wheelie Palomita. It seems that that song kind of soothes and comforts me after I've been riding far or anything bothers me. Why, say guramente, senor, said Sam. I'll hit her up for you as often as you like. And before I forget about it, Uncle Ben, you want to jerk Bradshaw up about them last hams he sent us. They're just a little bit strong. A man, sixty-five years old, living on a sheep ranch and beset by a complication of disasters, cannot successfully and continuously dissemble. Moreover, a troubadour has eyes quick to see unhappiness in others around him, because it disturbs his own ease. So on the next day, Sam again questioned the old man about his air of sadness and abstraction. Then old man Ellison told him the story of King James's threats and orders, and that pale melancholy and red ruin appeared to have marked him for their own. The troubadour took the news thoughtfully. He had heard much about King James. On the third day of the seven days of grace allowed him by the autocrat of the range, old man Ellison drove his buckboard to Frio City to fetch some necessary supplies for the ranch. Bradshaw was hard, but not implacable. He divided the old man's order by two and let him have a little more time. One article secured was a new fine ham for the pleasure of the troubadour. Five miles out of Frio City on his way home, the old man met King James riding into town. His majesty could never look anything but fierce and menacing, but today his slit's eyes appeared to be a little wider than they usually were. "'Good day,' said the king gruffly. "'I've been wanting to see you. I hear it said by a cowman from Sandy yesterday that you was from Jackson County, Mississippi, originally. I want to know if that's a fact.' "'Born there,' said old man Ellison, "'and raised there till I was twenty-one. "'This man says,' went on King James, "'that he thinks you was related to the Jackson County Reeveses. "'Was he right?' "'Aunt Caroline Reeves,' said the old man, "'was my half-sister.' "'She was my aunt,' said King James. "'I run away from home when I was sixteen. "'Now let's re-talk over some things that we discussed a few days ago. "'They call me a bad man.' and they're only half right. 
there's plenty of room in my pasture for your bunch of sheep and their increase for a long time to come. Aunt Caroline used to cut out sheep in cake dough and bake em for me. You keep your sheep where they are and use all the range you want. How's your finances? The old man related his woes in detail, dignifiedly with restraint and candor. She used to smuggle extra grub into my school basket. I'm speaking of Aunt Caroline, said King James. I'm going over to Frio City today, and I'll ride back by your ranch tomorrow. I'll draw $2,000 out of the bank there and bring it over to you. And I'll tell Bradshaw to let you have everything you want on credit. You are bound to have heard that the Jackson County Reeveses and Kings would stick closer by each other than chestnut burrs. Well, I'm a king yet whenever I run across the Reeves. So you look out for me along about sundown tomorrow and don't worry about nothing. Shouldn't wonder if the dry spell don't kill out the young grass. Old man Ellison drove happily ranchward. Once more the smiles filled out his wrinkles. Very suddenly, by the magic of kinship and the good that lies somewhere in all hearts, his troubles had been removed. On reaching the ranch he found that Sam Galloway was not there. His guitar hung by its buckskin string to a hackberry limb, moaning as the gulf breeze blew across its masterless strings. The Kiowa endeavored to explain. Sam, he catch pony, said he, and say he ride to Frio City. What for can no damn sabby? Say he come back tonight. Maybe so. That's all. As the first stars came out, the troubadour rode back to his haven. He pastured his pony and went into the house, his spurs jingling martially. Old man Ellison sat at the kitchen table having a tin cup of before-supper coffee. He looked contented and pleased. "'Hello, Sam,' said he. "'I'm darn glad to see you back. I don't know how I managed to get along on this ranch anyhow before you dropped in to cheer things up. I'll bet you've been skylarking around with some of them Frio City gals now. That's kept you so late. And then old man Ellison took another look at Sam's face and saw that the minstrel had changed to a man of action. And while Sam is unbuckling from his waist old man Ellison's six-shooter that the latter had left behind when he drove to town, we may well pause to remark that anywhere and whenever a troubadour lays down the guitar, and takes up the sword, trouble is sure to follow. It is not the expert thrust of Athos, nor the cold skill of Aramis, nor the iron wrist of Porthos that we have to fear. It is the Gascon's fury, the wild and unacademic attack of the troubadour, the sword of D'Artagnan. I done it, said Sam. I went over to Frio City to do it. I couldn't let him put the ski bunk on you, Uncle Ben. I met him in Summers's saloon. I knowed what to do. I said a few things to him that nobody else heard. He reached for his gun first. Half a dozen fellows saw him do it, but I got mine unlimbered first. Three doses I gave him right around the lungs, and a saucer could have covered up all of them. He won't bother you no more. This is the King James you speak of? asked old man Ellison while he sipped his coffee. You bet it was. And they took me before the county judge and the witnesses what saw him draw his gun first was all there. Well, of course, they put me under $300 bond to appear before the court. But there was four or five boys on the spot ready to sign the bail. He won't bother you no more, Uncle Ben. You ought to have seen how close them bullet holes was together. I reckon playing a guitar as much as I do must kind of limber a fella's trigger finger up a little, don't you think, Uncle Ben? Then there was a little silence in the castle except for the sputtering of a venison steak that the Kiowa was cooking. Sam, said old man Ellison, stroking his white whiskers with a tremulous hand, would you mind getting a guitar and playing that wee lay wee lay palo meat to piece once or twice? It always seems to be kind of soothing and comforting when a man's tired and fagged out. There is no more to be said except that the title of the story is wrong. It should have been called 
the last of the barons. There never will be an end to the troubadours, and now and then it does seem that the jingle of their guitars will drown the sound of the muffled blows of the pickaxes and trip-hammers of all the workers in the world. End of The Last of the Troubadours by O. Henry This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Letter to American Boys by George MacDonald My dear cousins, shall I really be talking to you as I sit here in my study with the river Thames now flowing, now ebbing past my window? I am uttering no word, I am only writing, and you are not listening, not reading, for it will be a long time ere what I am now thinking shall reach you over the millions of waves that swell and sink between us. And yet I shall in very truth be talking to you. In like manner, with divine differences, God began to talk to us ages before we were born. I will not say before we began to be, for in a sense that very moment God thought of us we began to exist, for what God thinks of is. We have been lying for ages in his heart without knowing it, but now we have begun to know it. We are here with a great beginning, and before us an end so great that there is no end to it. But we must take heed, or else the very greatness will turn to confusion and terror. Shall I explain what made me begin my letter to you just this way? I was sitting in my room, as I am now, thinking what I should say to you. And as I sat thinking, after something worth saying and fit to say, my room spoke to me. That is, out of its condition and appearance came a thought into my mind, and that you may understand how it came and how it was what it was, I will first show you what my room at this moment is like. For the thought had nothing to do with the sun outside, or the shining river, or the white-sailed boats, neither with the high wind that is tossing the rosy hawthorn bloom before my windows, or with the magnolia trained up the wall and looking in at one of them. It had only to do with the inside of the room. It is rather a long room. The greater part has its walls filled with books, and I am sitting at one end quite surrounded by them. But when I lift my eyes, I look to the other end, and into the heart of the stage, for acting upon, filling all the width and a third part of the length of the room. It is surrounded with curtains, but those in front of it are withdrawn, and there the space of it lies before me, a bare, empty hollow of green and blue and red, which to-morrow evening will be filled with group after group of moving, talking, shining, acting men and women, boys and girls. It looked to me like a human heart, waiting to be filled with the scenes of its own story, with this difference, that the heart itself will determine of what sort those groups shall be. Then there grew up in my mind the following little parable, which, to those who do not care to understand it, will be dark but those who desire to know its meaning may give light. There was once a wise man to whom was granted the power to send forth his thoughts in shapes that other people could see, and as he walked abroad in the world he came upon some whom his wisdom might serve. One day, having in a street of the city where he dwelt, rescued from danger a boy about ten years of age, he went with him to his mother, and begged that he might take him to his house for a week. When they heard his name, the parents willingly let their son go with him, and he taught him many things, and the boy loved and trusted him. When the boy was asleep in bed, the wise man would go to his room at midnight and lay his ear to his ear, and hearken to his dreams. Then he would stand and spread out his arms over him and look up, and the boy would smile, and his sleep was the deeper. Once, just an hour after the sage had thus visited him, the boy woke, and found himself alone in the middle of the night. He could not get to sleep again, and grew so restless that he rose and went down to the stair. The moon shone in every western window, and his way was now in glimmer and now in gloom. On the first landing he saw a door wide open which he had never seen open till now. It was the door of the wizard's room. Within all was bright with moonlight and the boy first peeped, then stepped in, and peered timidly about him. The farther end of the room was hidden by a curtain stretched quite across it, and curious to see what was behind, he approached it. But ere he reached it, the curtain slowly divided in the middle, and drawn back to each side revealed a place with just enough light in it 
from the moonshine to show that it was a dungeon. In the middle of it, upon the floor, sat a prisoner with fetters to his feet and manacles to his hands. An iron collar was around his neck, and a chain from the collar had its last link in an iron staple deep fixed in the stone floor. His head was sunk in his bosom, and he sat abject and despairing. "'What a wicked man he must be!' thought the boy, and was turning to run away in terror when the man lifted his head, and his look caught and held him, for he saw a pale, worn, fierce countenance, which somehow through all the added years and all the dirt that defiled it, he recognised as his own. For a moment the prisoner gazed at him mournfully, then a wild passion of rage and despair seized him. He dragged and tore at his chains, raved and shrieked, and dashed himself on the ground like one mad with imprisonment. For a time he lay exhausted, then half rose and sat as before, gazing helplessly upon the ground. By and by a spider came creeping along the bar of his fetters. He put out his hand, and with the manacle on his wrist crushed it, and smiled. Instantly through the gloom came a strong, clear, yet strangely sweet voice, and the very sweetness had in it something that made the boy think of fire. And the voice said, So, in the midst of misery thou takest delight in destruction. Is it not well thou art chained? If thou wast free, thou wouldst in time destroy the world. Tame thy wild beast, or sit there till I tame him. The prisoner peered and stared through the dusk, but could see no one. He fell into another fit of furious raving, but not a hairbreadth would one link of chain yield to his wildest endeavour. "'O oh, my mother!' he cried, as he sank again into the grave of exhaustion. "'Thy mother is gone from thee,' said the voice, "'outworn by thine evil ways. Thou didst choose to have thyself and not thy mother, and there thou hast thyself, and she is gone. I only am left to care for thee, not with kisses and sweet words, but with a dungeon.' Unawares to thyself thou hast forged thine own chains, and riveted them upon thy limbs. Not Hercules could free thee or himself from such imprisonment. The man burst out weeping, and cried with sobs, What then am I to do, for the burden of them is intolerable? What I will tell thee, said the voice, for so shall thy chains fall from thee. I will do it, said the man. Thy prison is foul, said the voice. It is answered the prisoner. "'Cleanse it, then.' "'How can I cleanse it when I cannot move?' "'Cannot move? Thy hands were upon thy face a moment ago, and now they are upon the floor. Near one of these hands lies a dead mouse. Yonder is an open window. Cast the dead thing out into the furnace of life, that it may speedily make an end thereof.' With sudden obedient resolve the prisoner made the endeavour to reach it, the chain pulled the collar hard, and the manacle wrenched his fist. But he caught the dead thing by the tail, and with a fierce effort threw it. Out of the window it flew and fell, and the air of his dungeon seemed already clearer. After a silence came the voice again. "'Behind thee lies a broom,' it said. "'Reach forth and take it, and sweep around thee as far as thy chains will yield thee scope.' The man obeyed, and as he swept at every stroke he reached farther, at length, how it came he could not tell, for his chains hung heavy upon him still, he found himself sweeping the very foot of the walls. A moment more, and he stood at the open window, looking out into the world. A dove perched upon the window-sill, and walked inquiringly in. He caught it in his hands, and looked how to close the window, that he might secure its company. Then came the voice. "'Wilt thou, a prisoner, make of thyself a jailer?' He opened his hands, and the dove darted into the sunlight. There it fluttered and flashed for a moment like a bird of snow, then re-entered and flew into his very hands. He stroked and kissed it. The bird went and came and was his companion. Still his chains hung about him, and he sighed and groaned under their weight. "'Set thee down,' said the voice, "'and polish thine irons.' He obeyed, rubbing link against link busily with his hands. And thus he laboured, as it seemed to the boy in the vision, day after day, until at last every portion within his reach of fetter and chain and collar glittered with brightness. "'Go to the window,' then said the voice, "'and lay thee down in the sunshine.' He went, and lay down, and fell asleep. 
When he awoke he began to raise himself heavily, but, lo, the sun had melted all the burnished parts of his bonds, the rest dropped from him, and he sprung to his feet. For very joy of lightness he ran about the room like a frolicking child. Then said the voice once more, "'Now carve thee out of the wall the figure of a man, as perfect as thou canst think and make it.' "'Alas!' said the prisoner to himself, "'I know not how to carve or fashion the image of anything.' But as he said it, he turned with a sigh to find among the fragments of his fetters what piece of iron might best serve him for a chisel. To work he set, and many and weary were the hours he wrought, for his attempts appeared to him nothing better than those of a child, and again and ever again as he carved he had to change his purpose, and cut away what he had carved, for the thing he wrought would not conform itself to the thing he thought, and it seemed he made no progress in the task that was set him but he did not know that it was because his thought was not good enough to give strength and skill to his hand, that it seemed too good for his hand to follow. One night he wrought hard by the glimmer of his wretched lamp, until overwearied he fell asleep, and slept like one dead. When he awoke, lo, a man of light, lovely and grand, who stood where he had been so wearily carving the unresponsive stone. He rose and drew nigh. Behold, it was an opening in the wall through which his freedom shone. The man of light was the door into the universe, and he darted through the wall. As he vanished from his sight, the boy felt the wind of the morning lave his forehead. But with the prisoner vanished the vision. He was alone, with the moon shining through the windows. Too solemn to be afraid, he crept back to his bed and fell fast asleep. In the morning he knew there had come to him what he now took for a strange dream, but he remembered little of it, and thought less about it, and the same day the wizard took him home. His mother was out when he arrived, and he had not been in five minutes before it began to rain. It was holiday time, and there were no lessons, and the schoolroom looked dismal as a new street. He had not a single companion, and the rain came down with slow persistence. He tried to read, but could not find any enjoyment in it. His thoughts grew more and more gloomy, until at last his very soul was disquieted within him. When his mother came home and sought him in the schoolroom, she found him lying on the floor, sullen and unkind. Although he knew her step as she entered, he never looked up, and when she spoke to him he answered like one aggrieved. "'I'm sorry you are unhappy,' said his mother sweetly. "'I did not know you were to be home to-day. Come with me to my room.' He answered his mother insolently. I don't want to go with you, I only want to be left alone." His mother turned away, and without another word left the room. The cat came in, went up to him purring, and rubbed herself against him. He gave her such a blow that she flew out again in angry fright, with her back high above her head. And the rain rained faster, and the wind began to blow, and the misery settled down upon his soul like lead. At last he wept, with his face on the floor, quite overmastered by the most contemptible of passions, self-pity. Again the voice of his mother came to him. The wizard had in the meantime come to see her, and had just left her. "'Get up, my boy,' she said, in a more commanding tone than he had ever heard from her before. With her words the vision returned upon him, clear and plain and strong. He started in terror, almost expecting to hear the chains rattle about him. "'Get up and make the room tidy. See how you have thrown the books about,' said his mother. He dared not disobey her. He sprung to his feet as he reduced the little chaos around him to order. First calmness descended, and then shame arose. As he fulfilled her word, his mother stood and looked on. The moment he had finished, he ran to her. He threw his arms about her neck, burst into honest, worthy tears, and cried, Mother! Then, after a while, he sobbed out, I'm sorry I was so cross and rude to my mother. She kissed him, and put her arms around him, and with his mind's eye he saw the flap of the white dove's wing. She took him by the hand and led him to the window. The sun was shining, and a grand rainbow stood against the black curtain of the receding cataract. Come, my child, she said. We will go out together." It was long years ere the boy understood all the meanings of the vision. I doubt if he understands them all yet. But he will one day, and I can say no more for the wisest of the readers, 
or for the writer himself of this parable. The father of all the boys on earth and in heaven be with the boys of America. And when they grow up, may they and the men of England understand, love, and help each other. Amen. Your friend, George MacDonald. Read for LibriVox.org on the 22nd of November 2006 by alexfoster.me.uk This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Luck by Mark Twain Note this is not a fancy sketch. I got it from a clergyman who was an instructor at Woolwich forty years ago, and who vouched for its truth. Signed, M. T. It was at a banquet in London, in honor of one of the two or three conspicuously illustrious English military names of this generation. For reasons which will presently appear, I will withhold his real name and titles, and call him Lieutenant General Lord Arthur Scornsby, V.C., K.C.B., etc., etc., etc. What a fascination there is in a renowned name! There sat the man, in actual flesh, whom I had heard of so many thousands of times since that day, thirty years before when his name shot suddenly to the zenith from a Crimean battlefield to remain forever celebrated. It was food and drink for me to look and look and look at that demigod, scanning, searching, noting, the quietness, the reserve, the noble gravity of his countenance, the simple honesty that expressed itself all over him, the sweet unconsciousness of his greatness, unconsciousness of the hundreds of admiring eyes fastened upon him, unconsciousness of the deep, loving, sincere worship welling out of the breasts of those people and flowing toward him. The clergyman at my left was an old acquaintance of mine. Clergyman now, but had spent the first half of his life in the camp and field, and as an instructor in the military school at Woolwich. Just at the moment I have been talking about, a veiled and singular light glimmered in his eyes, and he leaned down and muttered confidentially to me, indicating the hero of the banquet with a gesture, Privately, his glory is an accident, just a product of incredible luck. The verdict was a great surprise to me. If its subject had been Napoleon, or Socrates, or Solomon, my astonishment could not have been greater. Some days later came the explanation of this strange remark, and this is what the Reverend told me. About forty years ago, I was an instructor in the military academy at Woolwich. I was present in one of the sections when young Scoresby underwent his preliminary examination. I was touched to the quick with pity, for the rest of the class answered up brightly and handsomely, while he, why, dear me, he didn't know anything, so to speak. He was evidently good and sweet and lovable and guileless, and so it was exceedingly painful to see him stand there, as serene as a graven image, and deliver himself of answers which were veritably miraculous for stupidity and ignorance. All the compassion in me was aroused in his behalf. I said to myself, when he comes to be examined again, he will be flung over, of course. So it will be simply a harmless act of charity to ease his fall as much as I can. 
I took him aside, and found that he knew a little of Caesar's history, and as he didn't know anything else, I went to work and drilled him like a galley slave on a certain line of stock questions concerning Caesar which I knew would be used. <laughs> if you'll believe me, he went through with flying colors on examination day. He went through on that purely superficial cram, and got compliments, too, while others, who knew a thousand times more than he, got plucked. By some strangely lucky accident, an accident not likely to happen twice in a century, he was asked no question outside of the narrow limits of his drill. It was stupefying. Well, all through his course I stood by him, with something of the sentiment which a mother feels for a crippled child, and he always saved himself, just by miracle, apparently. Now, of course, the thing that would expose him and kill him at last was mathematics. I resolved to make his death as easy as I could. So I drilled him and crammed him and crammed him and drilled him just on the line of questions which the examiner would be most likely to use, and then launched him on his fate. Well, sir, try to conceive of the result. To my consternation, he took the first prize, and with it he got a perfect ovation in the way of compliments. <laughs> sleep! There was no more sleep for me for a week! My conscience tortured me day and night. What I had done, I had done purely through charity, and only to ease the poor youth's fall. I never had dreamed of any such preposterous result as the thing that had happened. I felt as guilty and miserable as the creator of Frankenstein. Here was a wooden head, whom I had put in the way of glittering promotions and prodigious responsibilities. And but one thing could happen. He and his responsibilities would all go to ruin together at the first opportunity. The Crimean War had just broken out. Of course, there had to be a war, I said to myself. We couldn't have peace, and give this donkey a chance to die before he is found out. I waited for the earthquake. It came, and it made me reel when it did come. He was actually gazetted to a captaincy in a marching regiment. Better men grow old and gray in the service before they climb to a sublimity like that. And who could ever have foreseen that they would go and put such a load of responsibility on such green and inadequate shoulders? I could just barely have stood it if they had made him a cornet. But a captain! Think of it! I thought my hair would turn white. Consider what I did, I, who so loved repose and inaction. I said to myself, I am responsible to the country for this, and I must go along with him, and protect the country against him as far as I can. So I took my poor little capital that I had saved up through years of work and grinding economy, and went with a sigh, and bought a cornetcy in his regiment, and away we went to the field. And there, oh dear, it was awful, blunders? Why, he never did anything but blunder. But, you see, nobody was in the fellow's secret. Everybody had him focused wrong and necessarily misinterpreted his performance every time. Consequently, they took his idiotic blunders for inspirations of genius. They did, honestly. 
his mildest blunders were enough to make a man in his right mind cry and they did make me cry and rage and rave too privately and the thing that kept me always in a sweat of apprehension was the fact that every fresh blunder he made increased the luster of his reputation i kept saying to myself he'll get so high that when the discovery does finally come it will be like the sun falling out of the sky he went right along up from grade to grade over the dead bodies of his superiors until at last in the hottest moment of the battle of blank down went our colonel and my heart jumped into my mouth for scoresby was next in rank now for it said i we'll all land in sheol in ten minutes sure the battle was awfully hot the allies were steadily giving way all over the field our regiment occupied a position that was vital a blunder now must be destruction at this critical moment what does this immortal fool do but detach the regiment from its place and order a charge over a neighboring hill where there wasn't a suggestion of an enemy there you go i said to myself this is the end at last and away we did go and were over the shoulder of the hill before the insane movement could be discovered and stopped and what did we find an entire and unsuspected russian army in reserve and what happened were we eaten up that is necessarily what would have happened in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred but no those russians argued that no single regiment would come browsing around there at such a time it must be the entire english army and that the sly russian game was detected and blocked so they turned tail and away they went pell-mell over the hill and down into the field in wild confusion and we after them they themselves broke the solid russian centre in the field and tore through and in no time there was the most tremendous rout you ever saw and the defeat of the allies was turned into a sweeping and splendid victory marshal canrobert looked on dizzy with astonishment admiration and delight and sent right off for scornsby and hugged him and decorated him on the field in presence of all the armies and what was scornsby's blunder that time merely the mistaking his right hand for his left that was all a an order had come to him to fall back and support our right and instead he fell forward and went over the hill to the left but the name he won that day as a marvellous military genius filled the world with his glory and that glory will never fade while history books last he is just as good and sweet and lovable and unpretending as a man can be but he doesn't know enough to come in when it rains he has been pursued day by day and year by year by a most phenomenal and astonishing luckiness he has been a shining soldier in all our wars for half a generation he has littered his military life with blunders and yet has never committed one that didn't make him a knight or a baronet or a lord or something look at his breast why he is just clothed in domestic and foreign decorations well sir 
every one of them is a record of some shouting stupidity or other, and, taken together, they are proof that the very best thing in all this world that can befall a man is to be born lucky. End of Luck by Mark Twain This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mortal Immortal by Mary Shelley 16th July, 1833 This is a memorable anniversary for me. On it I complete my three hundred and twenty-third year. The wandering Jew? Certainly not. More than eighteen centuries have passed over his head. In comparison with him I am a very young immortal. Am I then immortal? This is a question which I have asked myself by day and night for now three hundred and three years, and yet cannot answer it. I detected a grey hair amidst my brown locks this very day. That surely signifies decay. Yet it may have remained concealed there for three hundred years for some persons have become entirely white-headed before twenty years of age. I will tell my story, and my reader shall judge for me. I will tell my story, and so contrive to pass some few hours of a long eternity become so wearisome to me. Forever! Can it be? To live forever? I have heard of enchantments in which the victims were plunged into a deep sleep, to wake after a hundred years as fresh as ever. I have heard of the seven sleepers. Thus to be immortal would not be so burdensome, but, oh, the weight of never-ending time, the tedious passage of the still succeeding hours. How happy was the fabled Norjahad! But to my task. All the world has heard of Cornelius Agrippa. His memory is as immortal as his arts have made me. All the world has also heard of his scholar, who, unawares, raised the foul fiend during his master's absence, and was destroyed by him. The report, true or false, of this accident was attended with many inconveniences to the renowned philosopher. All his scholars at once deserted him. His servants disappeared. He had no one near him to put coals on his ever-burning fires while he slept, or to attend to the changeful colours of his medicines while he studied. Experiment after experiment failed, because one pair of hands was insufficient to complete them. The dark spirits laughed at him for not being able to retain a single mortal in his service. I was then very young, very poor, and very much in love. I had been for about a year the pupil of Cornelius, though I was absent when this accident took place. On my return, my friends implored me not to return to the alchemist's abode. I trembled as I listened to the dire tale they told. I required no second warning. And when Cornelius came and offered me a purse of gold if I would remain under his roof, I felt as if Satan himself tempted me. My teeth chattered. My hair stood on end. I ran off as fast as my trembling knees would permit. My failing steps were directed whither for two years they had every evening been attracted, a gently bubbling spring of pure living waters, 
beside which lingered a dark-haired girl, whose beaming eyes were fixed on the path I was accustomed each night to tread. I cannot remember the hour when I did not love Bertha. We had been neighbours and playmates from infancy. Her parents, like mine, were of humble life, yet respectable. Our attachment had been a source of pleasure to them. In an evil hour, a malignant fever carried off both her father and mother, and Bertha became an orphan. She would have found a home beneath my paternal roof, but, unfortunately, the old lady of the near castle, rich, childless, and solitary, declared her intention to adopt her. Henceforth, Bertha was clad in silk, inhabited a marble palace, and was looked on as being highly favoured by fortune. But in her new situation, among her new associates, Bertha remained true to the friend of her humbler days. She often visited the cottage of my father, and when forbidden to go thither, she would stray towards the neighbouring wood, and meet me beside its shady fountain. She often declared that she owed no duty to her new protectress, equal in sanctity to that which bound us. Yet still I was too poor to marry, and she grew weary of being tormented on my account. She had a haughty but an impatient spirit, and grew angry at the obstacles that prevented our union. We met now after an absence, and she had been sorely beset while I was away. She complained bitterly, and almost reproached me for being poor. I replied hastily, "'I'm honest if I am poor. Were I not, I might soon become rich.' This exclamation produced a thousand questions. I feared to shock her by owning the truth, but she drew it from me, and then, casting a look of disdain on me, she said, "'You pretend to love, and you fear to face the devil for my sake.' I protested that I had only dreaded to offend her, while she dwelt on the magnitude of the reward that I should receive. Thus encouraged, shamed by her, led on by love and hope, laughing at my late fears, with quick steps and a light heart, I returned to accept the offers of the alchemist, and was instantly installed in my office. A year passed away. I became possessed of no insignificant sum of money. Custom had banished my fears. In spite of the most painful vigilance, I had never detected the trace of a cloven foot, nor was the studious silence of our abode ever disturbed by demoniac howls. I still continued my stolen interviews with Bertha, and hope dawned on me, hope but not perfect joy, for Bertha fancied that love and security were enemies, and her pleasure was to divide them in my bosom. Though true of heart, she was somewhat of a coquette in manner, and I was jealous as a Turk. She slighted me in a thousand ways, yet would never acknowledge herself to be in the wrong, she would drive me mad with anger, and then force me to beg her pardon. Sometimes she fancied that I was not sufficiently submissive, and then she had some story of a rival, favoured by her protectress. She was surrounded by silk-clad youths, the rich and gay. What chance had the sad-robed scholar of Cornelius compared with these? On one occasion the philosopher made such large demands upon my time that I was unable to meet her as I was wont. He was engaged in some mighty work, and I was forced to remain day and night, feeding his furnaces and watching his chemical preparations. Bertha waited for me in vain at the fountain. Her haughty spirit fired at this neglect, 
and when at last I stole out during the few short minutes allotted to me for slumber, and hoped to be consoled by her, she received me with disdain, dismissed me in scorn, and vowed that any man should possess her hand rather than he who could not be in two places at once for her sake. She would be revenged. And truly she was. In my dingy retreat I heard that she had been hunting, attended by Albert Hoffer. Albert Hoffer was favoured by her protectress, and the three passed in cavalcade before my smoky window, I thought that they mentioned my name. It was followed by a laugh of derision, as her dark eyes glanced contemptuously towards my abode. Jealousy, with all its venom and all its misery, entered my breast. Now I shed a torrent of tears to think that I should never call her mine, and anon I imprecated a thousand curses on her inconstancy. Yet still I must stir the fires of the alchemist, still attend on the changes of his unintelligible medicines. Cornelius had watched for three days and nights, nor closed his eyes. The progress of his alembics was slower than he expected. In spite of his anxiety, sleep weighed upon his eyelids. Again and again he threw off drowsiness with more than human energy. Again and again it stole away his senses. He eyed his crucibles wistfully. Not ready yet, he murmured. Will another night pass before the work is accomplished? Winsy, you are vigilant, you are faithful. You have slept, my boy, you slept last night. Look at that glass vessel. The liquid it contains is of a soft rose colour. The moment it begins to change its hue, awaken me. Till then I may close my eyes. First it will turn white, and then emit golden flashes. But wait not till then, when the rose colour fades, rouse me. I scarcely heard the last words, muttered as they were in sleep. Even then he did not quite yield to nature. Winsy, my boy, he again said, do not touch the vessel, do not put it to your lips. It is a filter, a filter to cure love. You would not cease to love your Bertha. Beware to drink. And he slept. His venerable head sunk on his breast, and I scarce heard his regular breathing. For a few minutes I watched the vessel, the rosy hue of the liquid remained unchanged. Then my thoughts wandered. They visited the fountain, and dwelt on a thousand charming scenes never to be renewed. Never! Serpents and adders were in my heart as the word never half formed itself on my lips. False girl, false and cruel! Never more would she smile on me as that evening she smiled on Albert. Worthless, detested woman! I would not remain unrevenged. She should see Albert expire at her feet. She should die beneath my vengeance. She had smiled in disdain and triumph. She knew my wretchedness and her power. Yet what power had she, the power of exciting my hate, my utter scorn, my, oh, all but indifference? Could I attain that? Could I regard her with careless eyes, transferring my rejected love to one fairer and more true? That were indeed a victory. A bright flash darted before my eyes. I had forgotten the medicine of the adept. I gazed on it with wonder, flashes of admirable beauty, more bright than those which the diamond emits when the sun's rays are on it, glanced from the surface of the liquid. An odour, the most fragrant and grateful, stole over my sense. The vessel seemed one globe of living radiance, lovely to the eye, 
and most inviting to the taste. The first thought, instinctively inspired by the grosser sense, was, I will, I must drink. I raised the vessel to my lips. It will cure me of love, of torture. Already I had quaffed half of the most delicious liquor ever tasted by the palate of man, when the philosopher stirred. I started, I dropped the glass, the liquid flamed and glanced along the floor, while I felt Cornelius's gripe at my throat as he shrieked aloud, Wretch! You have destroyed the labour of my life! The philosopher was totally unaware that I had drunk any portion of his drug. His idea was, and I gave a tacit assent to it, that I had raised the vessel from curiosity, and that, frightened at its brightness and the flashes of intense light it gave forth, I had let it fall. I never undeceived him. The fire of the medicine was quenched. The fragrance died away. He grew calm, as a philosopher should, under the heaviest trials, and dismissed me to rest. I will not attempt to describe the sleep of glory and bliss which bathed my soul in paradise during the remaining hours of that memorable night. Words would be faint and shallow types of my enjoyment, or of the gladness that possessed my bosom when I woke. I trod air, my thoughts were in heaven, earth appeared heaven, and my inheritance upon it was to be one trance of delight. This it is to be cured of love, I thought. I will see Bertha this day, and she will find her lover cold and regardless, too happy to be disdainful, yet how utterly indifferent to her. The hours danced away. The philosopher, secure that he had once succeeded, and believing that he might again, began to concoct the same medicine once more. He was shut up with his books and drugs, and I had a holiday. I dressed myself with care. I looked in an old but polished shield, which served me for a mirror. I thought my good looks had wonderfully improved. I hurried beyond the precincts of the town, joy in my soul, the beauty of heaven and earth around me. I turned my steps toward the castle. I could look on its lofty turrets with lightness of heart, for I was cured of love. My Bertha saw me afar off as I came up the avenue. I know not what sudden impulse animated her bosom, but at the sight she sprang with a light fawn-like bound down the marble steps, and was hastening towards me. But I had been perceived by another person, the old high-born hag who called herself her protectress, and was her tyrant, had seen me also. She hobbled, panting, up the terrace. A page, as ugly as herself, held up her train and fanned her as she hurried along, and stopped my fair girl with a, How now, my bold mistress, whither so fast? Back to your cage, hawks are abroad. Bertha clasped her hands. Her eyes were still bent on my approaching figure. I saw the contest. How I abhorred the old crone who checked the kind impulses of my Bertha's softening heart. Hitherto respect for her rank had caused me to avoid the lady of the castle. Now I disdained such trivial considerations. I was cured of love, and lifted above all human fears. I hastened forwards, and soon reached the terrace. How lovely Bertha looked, her eyes flashing fire, her cheeks glowing with impatience and anger. She was a thousand times more graceful and charming than ever. I no longer loved. Oh, no, I adored, worshipped, idolized her. 
she had that morning been persecuted, with more than usual vehemence, to consent to an immediate marriage with my rival. She was reproached with the encouragement that she had shown him. She was threatened with being turned out of doors with disgrace and shame. Her proud spirit rose in arms at the threat, but when she remembered the scorn that she had heaped upon me, and how perhaps she had thus lost one whom she now regarded as her only friend, she wept with remorse and rage. At that moment I appeared. "'Oh, Winsy!' she exclaimed. "'Take me to your mother's cot. Swiftly let me leave the detested luxuries and wretchedness of this noble dwelling. Take me to poverty and happiness.' I clasped her in my arms with transport. The old lady was speechless with fury, and broke forth into invective only when we were far on our road to my natal cottage. My mother received the fair fugitive, escaped from a gilt cage to nature and liberty, with tenderness and joy. My father, who loved her, welcomed her heartily. It was a day of rejoicing, which did not need the addition of the celestial potion of the alchemist to steep me in delight. Soon after this eventful day I became the husband of Bertha. I ceased to be the scholar of Cornelius, but I continued to be his friend. I always felt grateful to him for having unawares procured me that delicious draught of a divine elixir, which, instead of curing me of love, sad cure, solitary and joyless remedy for evils which seem blessings to the memory, had inspired me with courage and resolution, thus winning for me an inestimable treasure in my Bertha. I often called to mind that period of trance-like inebriation with wonder. The drink of Cornelius had not fulfilled the task for which he affirmed that it had been prepared, but its effects were more potent and blissful than words could express. They had faded by degrees, yet they lingered long, and painted life in hues of splendour. Bertha often wondered at my lightness of heart and unaccustomed gaiety, for before I had been rather serious or even sad in my disposition. She loved me the better for my cheerful temper, and our days were winged by joy. Five years afterwards I was suddenly summoned to the bedside of the dying Cornelius. He had sent for me in haste, conjuring my instant presence. I found him stretched on his pallet, enfeebled even to death. All of life that yet remained animated his piercing eyes, and they were fixed on a glass vessel full of a roseate liquid. Behold, he said in a broken and inward voice, the vanity of human wishes, a second time my hopes are about to be crowned, a second time they are destroyed. Look at that liquor. You remember five years ago I had prepared the same, with the same success. Then, as now, my thirsting lips expected to taste the immortal elixir, you dashed it from me, and at present it is too late." He spoke with difficulty, and fell back on his pillow. I could not help saying, How, revered master, can a cure for love restore you to life? A faint smile gleamed across his face as I listened earnestly to his scarcely intelligible answer. A cure for love and for all things, the elixir of immortality. Ah, if now I might drink, I should live for ever. As he spoke, a golden flash gleamed from the liquid. A well-remembered fragrance stole over the air. He raised himself, all weak as he was, 
strength seemed miraculously to re-enter his frame. He stretched forth his hand. A loud explosion startled me. A ray of fire shot up from the elixir, and the glass vessel which contained it was shivered to atoms. I turned my eyes towards the philosopher. He had fallen back. His eyes were glassy, his features rigid. He was dead. But I lived, and was to live for ever. So said the unfortunate alchemist, and for a few days I believed his words. I remembered the glorious drunkenness that had followed my stolen draught. I reflected on the change I had felt in my frame, in my soul, the bounding elasticity of the one, the buoyant lightness of the other. I surveyed myself in a mirror, and could perceive no change in my features during the space of the five years which had elapsed. I remembered the radiant hues and grateful scent of that delicious beverage, worthy the gift it was capable of bestowing. I was, then, immortal. A few days after I laughed at my credulity, the old proverb that a prophet is least regarded in his own country was true with respect to me and my defunct master. I loved him as a man, I respected him as a sage, but I derided the notion that he could command the powers of darkness, and laughed at the superstitious fears with which he was regarded by the vulgar. He was a wise philosopher, but had no acquaintance with any spirits but those clad in flesh and blood. His science was simply human, and human science, I soon persuaded myself, could never conquer nature's laws so far as to imprison the soul for ever within its carnal habitation. Cornelius had brewed a soul-refreshing drink, more inebriating than wine, sweeter and more fragrant than any fruit. It possessed probably strong medicinal powers, imparting gladness to the heart and vigour to the limbs, but its effects would wear out. Already were they diminished in my frame. I was a lucky fellow to have quaffed health and joyous spirits, and perhaps long life at my master's hands, but my good fortune ended there. Longevity was far different from immortality. I continued to entertain this belief for many years. Sometimes a thought stole across me. Was the alchemist indeed deceived? But my habitual credence was that I should meet the fate of all the children of Adam, at my appointed time, a little late, but still at a natural age. Yet it was certain that I retained a wonderfully youthful look. I was laughed at for my vanity in consulting the mirror so often, but I consulted it in vain. My brow was untrenched, my cheeks, my eyes, my whole person continued as untarnished as in my twentieth year. I was troubled. I looked at the faded beauty of Bertha. I seemed more like her son. By degrees our neighbours began to make similar observations, and I found at last that I went by the name of the Scholar Bewitched. Bertha herself grew uneasy. She became jealous and peevish, and at length she began to question me. We had no children, we were all in all to each other, and though, as she grew older, her vivacious spirit became a little allied to ill temper, and her beauty sadly diminished, I cherished her in my heart as the mistress I had idolized, the wife I had sought and won with such perfect love. At last our situation became intolerable. Bertha was fifty. I, twenty years of age, I had, in very shame, in some measure adopted the habits of a more advanced age. 
I no longer mingled in the dance among the young and gay, but my heart bounded along with them while I restrained my feet, and a sorry figure I cut among the nesters of our village. But before the time I mention, things were altered. We were universally shunned. We were, at least I was, reported to have kept up an iniquitous acquaintance with some of my former master's supposed friends. Poor Bertha was pitied, but deserted. I was regarded with horror and detestation. What was to be done? We sat by our winter fire. Poverty had made itself felt, for none would buy the produce of my farm, and often I had been forced to journey twenty miles to some place where I was not known to dispose of our property. It is true we had saved something for an evil day. That day was come. We sat by our lone fireside, the old-hearted youth and his antiquated wife. Again Bertha insisted on knowing the truth. She recapitulated all she had ever heard said about me, and added her own observations. She conjured me to cast off the spell. She described how much more comely grey hairs were than my chestnut locks. She descanted on the reverence and respect due to age, how preferable to the slight regard paid to mere children. Could I imagine that the despicable gifts of youth and good looks outweighed disgrace, hatred, and scorn? Nay, in the end I should be burnt as a dealer in the black art, while she, to whom I had not deigned to communicate any portion of my good fortune, might be stoned as my accomplice. At length she insinuated that I must share my secret with her, and bestow on her like benefits to those I myself enjoyed, or she would denounce me and then she burst into tears. Thus beset, I thought it was the best way to tell the truth. I revealed it as tenderly as I could, and spoke only of a very long life, not of immortality, which representation indeed coincided best with my own ideas. When I ended, I rose and said, And now, my Bertha, will you denounce the lover of your youth? You will not, I know. But it is too hard, my poor wife, that you should suffer from my ill luck and the accursed arts of Cornelius. I will leave you. You have wealth enough, and friends will return in my absence. I will go. Young as I seem, and strong as I am, I can work and gain my bread among strangers, unsuspected and unknown. I loved you in youth. God is my witness that I would not desert you in age, but that your safety and happiness require it. I took my cap and moved towards the door. In a moment Bertha's arms were round my neck, and her lips were pressed to mine. No, my husband, my Winsy, she said, you shall not go alone. Take me with you. We will remove from this place, and, as you say, among strangers we shall be unsuspected and safe. I'm not so very old as quite to shame you, my Winsy, and I dare say the charm will soon wear off and with the blessing of God you will become more elderly-looking, as is fitting. You shall not leave me. I returned the good soul's embrace heartily. I will not, my Bertha, but for your sake I had not thought of such a thing. I will be your true, faithful husband while you are spared to me, and do my duty by you to the last. The next day we prepared secretly for our emigration. We were obliged to make great pecuniary sacrifices. It could not be helped. We realized a sum sufficient at least to maintain us while Bertha lived, and, without saying adieu to anyone, 
quitted our native country to take refuge in a remote part of western France. It was a cruel thing to transport poor Bertha from her native village and the friends of her youth to a new country, new language, new customs. The strange secret of my destiny rendered this removal immaterial to me, but I compassionated her deeply and was glad to perceive that she found compensation for her misfortunes in a variety of little ridiculous circumstances. Away from all tell-tale chroniclers, she sought to decrease the apparent disparity of our ages by a thousand feminine arts, rouge, youthful dress, and assumed juvenility of manner. I could not be angry. Do not I myself wear a mask? Why quarrel with hers because it was less successful? I grieved deeply when I remembered that this was my Bertha, whom I had loved so fondly, and won with such transport, the dark-eyed, dark-haired girl with smiles of enchanting archness and a step like a fawn, this mincing, simpering, jealous old woman. I should have revered her grey locks and withered cheeks, but thus... It was my work, I knew, but I did not the less deplore this type of human weakness. Her jealousy never slept. Her chief occupation was to discover that, in spite of outward appearances, I was myself growing old. I verily believe that the poor soul loved me truly in her heart, but never had woman so tormenting a mode of displaying fondness. She would discern wrinkles in my face and decrepitude in my walk, while I bounded along in youthful vigour, the youngest looking of twenty youths. I never dared address another woman. On one occasion, fancying that the belle of the village regarded me with favouring eyes, she bought me a grey wig, her constant discourse among her acquaintances was that, though I looked so young, there was ruin at work within my frame, and she affirmed that the worst symptom about me was my apparent health. My youth was a disease, she said, and I ought at all times to prepare, if not for a sudden and awful death, at least to wake some morning white-haired, and bowed down with all the marks of advanced years. I let her talk. I often joined in her conjectures. Her warnings chimed in with my never-ceasing speculations concerning my state, and I took an earnest though painful interest in listening to all that her quick wit and excited imagination could say on the subject. Why dwell on these minute circumstances? We lived on for many long years. Bertha became bedridden and paralytic. I nursed her as a mother might a child. She grew peevish and still harped upon one string of how long I should survive her. It has ever been a source of consolation to me that I performed my duty scrupulously towards her. She had been mine in youth, she was mine in age, and at last, when I heaped the sod over her corpse, I wept to feel that I had lost all that really bound me to humanity. Since then... How many have been my cares and woes! How few and empty my enjoyments! I pause here in my history. I will pursue it no further. A sailor without rudder or compass, tossed on a stormy sea. A traveller lost on a wide-spread heath, without landmark or stone to guide him. Such have I been more lost, more hopeless than either. A 
a nearing ship, A gleam from some far cot may save them, But I have no beacon except the hope of death. Death, mysterious, ill-visaged friend of weak humanity, Why alone of all mortals have you cast me from your sheltering fold? Oh, for the peace of the grave, the deep silence of the iron-bound tomb, That thought would cease to work in my brain, And my heart beat no more with emotions varied only by new forms of sadness. Am I immortal? I return to my first question. In the first place, is it not more probable that the beverage of the alchemist was fraught rather with longevity than eternal life? Such is my hope. And then be it remembered that I only drank half of the potion prepared by him. Was not the whole necessary to complete the charm? To have drained half the elixir of immortality is but to be half immortal. My forever is thus truncated and null. But again, who shall number the years of the half of eternity? I often try to imagine by what rule the infinite may be divided. Sometimes I fancy age advancing upon me, one grey hair I have found. Fool! Do I lament? Yes, the fear of age and death often creeps coldly upon my heart, and the more I live, the more I dread death, even while I abhor life. Such an enigma is man, born to perish, when he wars, as I do, against the established laws of his nature. But for this anomaly of feeling, surely I might die. The medicine of the alchemist would not be proof against fire, sword, and the strangling waters. I have gazed upon the blue depths of many a placid lake, and the tumultuous rushing of many a mighty river, and have said peace inhabits those waters. Yet I have turned my steps away, to live yet another day. I have asked myself whether suicide would be a crime in one to whom thus only the portals of the other world could be opened. I have done all, except presenting myself as a soldier or duelist, an object of destruction to my, no, not my fellow mortals, and therefore I have shrunk away. They are not my fellows. The inextinguishable power of life in my frame and their ephemeral existence place us wide as the poles asunder. I could not raise a hand against the meanest or the most powerful among them. Thus I have lived on for many a year, alone and weary of myself, desirous of death yet never dying, a mortal immortal. Neither ambition nor avarice can enter my mind and the ardent love that gnaws at my heart, never to be returned, never to find an equal on which to expend itself, lives there only to torment me. This very day I conceived a design by which I may end all, without self-slaughter, without making another man a cane, an expedition, which mortal frame can never survive, even endued with the youth and strength that inhabits mine, thus I shall put my immortality to the test, and rest forever, or return the wonder and benefactor of the human species. Before I go, 
a miserable vanity has caused me to pen these pages. I would not die and leave no name behind. Three centuries have passed since I quaffed the fatal beverage. Another year shall not elapse before, encountering gigantic dangers, warring with the powers of frost in their home, beset by famine, toil, and tempest, I yield this body, too tenacious a cage for a soul which thirsts for freedom, to the destructive elements of air and water. Or, if I survive, my name shall be recorded as one of the most famous among the sons of men, and my task achieved, I shall adopt more resolute means, and by scattering and annihilating the atoms that compose my frame, set at liberty the life imprisoned within, and so cruelly prevented from soaring from this dim earth to a sphere more congenial to its immortal essence. End of The Mortal Immortal by Mary Shelley Read for LibriVox.org by David Barnes This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. On Love by Percy Bysshe Shelley Reading by Ethan Gordon What is love? Ask him who lives, what is life? Ask him who adores, what is God? I know not the internal constitution of other men, nor even thine whom I now address. I see that in some external attributes they resemble me, but when, misled by that appearance, I have thought to appeal to something in common, and unburden my inmost soul to them, I have found my language misunderstood, like one in a distant and savage land. The more opportunities they have afforded me for experience, the wider has appeared the interval between us, and to a greater distance have the points of sympathy been withdrawn. With a spirit ill-fitted to sustain such proof, trembling and feeble though its tenderness, I have everywhere sought sympathy, and have found only repulse and disappointment. Thou demandest what is love? It is that powerful attraction towards all that we conceive, or fear, or hope beyond ourselves, when we find within our own thoughts the chasm of an insufficient void, and seek to awaken in all things that are a community with what we experience within ourselves. If we reason, we would be understood. If we imagine, we would that the airy children of our brain were born anew within another's. If we feel, we would that another's nerves should vibrate to our own, that the beams of their eyes should kindle at once and mix and melt into our own, that lips of motionless ice should not reply to lips quivering and burning with the heart's best blood. This is love. This is the bond and the sanction which connects not only man with man, but with everything which exists. We are born into the world, and there is something within us which, from the instant that we live, more and more thirsts after its likeness. It is probably in correspondence with this law that the infant drains milk from the bosom of its mother. This propensity develops itself with the development of our nature. We dimly see within our intellectual nature a miniature, as it were, of our entire self. Yet deprived of all that we condemn or despise, the ideal prototype of everything excellent or lovely that we are capable of conceiving as belonging to the nature of man. Not only the portrait of our external being, but an assemblage of the minutest particles of which our nature is composed, a mirror whose surface reflects only the forms of purity and brightness, a soul within our soul that describes a circle around its proper paradise, which pain and sorrow and evil dare not overleap. To this we eagerly refer all sensations thirsting that they should resemble or correspond with it. The discovery of its antitype, the meeting with an understanding capable of clearly estimating our own, 
an imagination which should enter into and seize upon the subtle and delicate peculiarities which we have delighted to cherish and unfold in secret, with a frame whose nerves, like the chords of two exquisite lyres, strung to the accompaniment of one delightful voice, vibrate with the vibrations of our own, and of a combination of all these in such proportions as the type within demands. This is the invisible and unattainable point to which love tends, and to attain which it urges forth the powers of man to arrest the faintest shadows of that, without the possession of which there is no rest nor respite to the heart over which it rules. Hence in solitude, or in that deserted state when we are surrounded by human beings, and yet they sympathize not with us, we love the flowers, the grass, and the waters, and the sky, in the motion of the very leaves of spring, in the blue air, there is then found a secret correspondence with our heart. There is eloquence in the tongueless wind, and a melody in the flowing brooks and the rustling of the reeds beside them, which, by their inconceivable relation to something within the soul, awaken the spirits to a dance of breathless rapture, and bring tears of mysterious tenderness to the eyes, like the enthusiasm of patriotic success, or the voice of one beloved singing to you alone. Stern says that if he were in a desert, he would love some cypress. So soon as this want or power is dead, man becomes the living sepulchre of himself, and what yet survives is the mere husk of what once he was. End of On Love by Percy Bysshe Shelley This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Point of Honor from Best Short Stories Collected by Thomas L. Masson a young lieutenant was passed by a private, who failed to salute. The lieutenant called him back, and said sternly, You did not salute me, for this you will immediately salute two hundred times. At this moment the general came up. What's all this? he exclaimed, seeing the poor private about to begin. The lieutenant explained, This ignoramus failed to salute me, and as a punishment I am making him salute two hundred times. Quite right, replied the general, smiling, but do not forget, sir, that upon each occasion you are to salute in return. End of The Point of Honor from Best Short Stories, collected by Thomas L. Masson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Tamara Schwartz. The Schoolmaster's Progress by Carolyn M. S. Kirkland Master William Horner came to our village to school when he was about eighteen years old. Tall, lank, straight-sided and straight-haired, with a mouth of the most puckered and solemn kind. His figure and movements were those of a puppet, cut out of shingle and jerked by a string, and his address corresponded very well with his appearance. Never did that prim mouth give way before a laugh. A faint and misty smile was the widest departure from its propriety, and this unaccustomed disturbance made wrinkles in the flat, skinny cheeks, like those in the surface of a lake after the intrusion of a stone. Master Horner knew well what belonged to the pedagogical character, and that facial solemnity stood high on the list of indispensable qualifications. He had made up his mind before he left his father's house how he would look during the term. He had not planned any smiles, knowing that he must board round, and it was not for ordinary occurrences to alter his arrangements, so that when he was betrayed into a relaxation of the muscles, it was in such a sort, as if he was putting his bread and butter in jeopardy. Truly, he had a grave time that first winter, 
The rod of power was new to him, and he felt it his duty to use it more frequently than might have been thought necessary by those upon whose sense the privilege had palled. Tears and sulky faces, and impotent fists doubled fiercely when his back was turned, were the rewards of his conscientiousness, and the boys, and girls too, were glad when working time came round again, and the master went home to help his father on the farm. But with the autumn came Master Horner again, dropping among us as quietly as the faded leaves, and awakening at least as much serious reflection. Would he be as self-sacrificing as before, postponing his own ease and comfort to the public good? Or would he have become more sedentary, and less fond of circumambulating the schoolroom with a switch over his shoulder? Many were fain to hope he might have learned to smoke during the summer, and accomplishment which would probably have moderated his energy not a little, and disposed him rather to reverie than to action. But here he was, and all the broader chested and stouter armed for his labours in the harvest field. Let it not be supposed that Master Horner was of a cruel and ogreish nature, a babe-eater, a Herod, one who delighted in torturing the helpless. Such souls there may be among those endowed with the awful control of the feral, but they are rare in the fresh and natural regions we describe. It is, we believe, where young gentlemen are to be crammed for college, that the process of hardening heart and skin together goes on most vigorously. Yet among the uneducated there is so high a respect for bodily strength, that it is necessary for the schoolmaster to show, first of all, that he possesses this inadmissible requisite for his place. The rest is more readily taken for granted. Brains he may have, a strong arm he must have. So he proves the more important claim first. We must therefore make all due allowance for Master Horner, who could not be expected to overtop his position so far as to discern at once the philosophy of teaching. He was sadly browbeaten during his first term of service by a great broad-shouldered lout of some eighteen years or so, who thought he needed a little more schooling, but at the same time felt quite competent to direct the manner and measure of his attempts. "'You'd ought to begin with a large hand, Joshua,' said Master Horner to this youth. "'What should I want a coarse hand for?' said the disciple, with great contempt. "'Coarse hand won't never do me no good. I want a fine hand copy.' The master looked at the infant giant, and did as he wished, but we say not with what secret resolutions. At another time, Master Horner, having had a hint from some one more knowing than himself, proposed to his elder scholars to write after dictation, expatiating at the same time quite floridly, the ideas having been supplied by the knowing friend, upon the advantages likely to arise from this practice, and saying, among other things, it will help you, when you write letters, to spell the words good. Pooh, said Joshua, spellin' ain't nothin'. Let them that finds the mistakes correct em. I'm for everyone's having a way of their own. How dared you be so saucy to the master? asked one of the little boys after school. Because I could lick him easy, said the hopeful Joshua who knew very well why the master did not undertake him on the spot. Can we wonder that Master Horner determined to make his empire good as far as it went? A new examination was required on the entrance into a second term, and, with whatever secret trepidation, the master was obliged to submit. Our law prescribes examinations, but forgets to provide for the competency of the examiners so that few better farces offer than the course of question and answer on these occasions. We know not precisely what were Master Horner's trials, but we have heard of a sharp dispute between the inspectors whether A-N-G-E-L spelt angle or angel. Angle had it, and the school maintained that pronunciation ever after. Master Horner passed, 
and he was requested to draw up the certificate for the inspectors to sign. As one had left his spectacles at home, and the other had a bad cold, so that it was not convenient for either to write more than his name. Master Horner's exhibition of learning on this occasion did not reach us, but we know that it must have been considerable, since he stood the ordeal. "'What is orthography?' said an inspector once in our presence. The candidate writhed a good deal, studied the beams overhead, and the chickens out of the window, and then replied, "'It is so long since I learnt the first part of the spelling-book that I can't justly answer that question. But if I could just look it over, I guess I could.' Our schoolmaster entered upon his second term with new courage and invigorated authority. Twice certified, who should dare doubt his competency? Even Joshua was civil, and lesser louts, of course, obsequious, though the girls took more liberties, for they feel, even at that early age, that influence is stronger than strength. Could a young schoolmaster think of feruling a girl with her hair in ringlets and a gold ring on her finger? impossible, and the immunity extended to all the little sisters and cousins, and there were enough large girls to protect all the feminine part of the school. With the boys Master Horner still had many a battle, and whether with a view to this or as an economical ruse, he never wore his coat in school, saying it was too warm. Perhaps it was an astute attention to the prejudices of his employers, who loved no man that does not earn his living by the sweat of his brow. The shirt-sleeves gave the idea of a manual labor school, in one sense at least. It was evident that the master worked, and that afforded a probability that the scholars worked too. Master Horner's success was most triumphant that winter. A year's growth had improved his outward man exceedingly, filling out the limbs so that they did not remind you so forcibly of a young colt's, and supplying the cheeks with the flesh and blood so necessary where moustaches were not worn. Experience had given him a degree of confidence, and confidence gave him power. In short, people said the master had waked up, and so he had. He actually set about reading for improvement, and although, at the end of the term, he could not quite make out from his historical studies which side Hannibal was on, yet this is readily explained by the fact that he boarded round and was obliged to read generally by firelight, surrounded by ungoverned children. After this Master Horner made his own bargain. When school time came round with the following autumn, and the teacher presented himself for a third examination, such a test was pronounced no longer necessary, and the district consented to engage him at the astounding rate of sixteen dollars a month with the understanding that he was to have a fixed home, provided he was willing to allow a dollar a week for it. Master Horner bethought him of the successive killing times and consequent doughnuts of the twenty families in which he had sojourned the years before, and consented to the exaction. Behold our friend, now as high as district teacher can ever hope to be, his scholarship established his home stationary and not revolving, and the good behavior of the community ensured by the fact that he, being of age, now had a farm to retire upon in case of any disgust. Master Horner was at once the preeminent beau of the neighborhood, spite of the prejudice against learning. He brushed his hair straight up in front, and wore a sky-blue ribbon for a guard to his silver watch, and walked as if the tall heels of his blunt boots were eggshells and not leather. Yet he was far from neglecting the duties of his place. He was beau only on Sundays and holidays, very schoolmaster the rest of the time. It was at a spelling school that Master Horner first met the educated eyes of Miss Harriet Bangle, a young lady visiting the Englehearts in our neighborhood. She was from one of the towns in western New York and had brought with her a variety of city airs and graces somewhat caricatured, set off with year-old French fashions much travestied. Whether she had been sent out to the new country to try, somewhat late, a rustic chance for an establishment, or whether her company had been found rather trying at home, 
we cannot say. The view which she was at some pains to make understood was that her friends had contrived this method of keeping her out of the way of a desperate lover, whose addresses were not acceptable to them. If it should seem surprising that so high-bred a visitor should be sojourning in the wild woods, it must be remembered that more than one celebrated Englishman, and not a few distinguished Americans, have farmer brothers in the western country, no whit less rustic in their exterior and manner of life than the plainest of their neighbors. When these are visited by their refined kinsfolk, we of the woods catch glimpses of the gay world, or think we do. That great medicine hath, with its tinct gilded, many a vulgarism to the satisfaction of wiser heads than ours. Miss Bangle's manner bespoke for her that high consideration which she felt to be her due. Yet she condescended to be amused by the rustics and their awkward attempts at gaiety and elegance. And, to say truth, few of the village merry-makings escaped her, though she wore always the air of great superiority. The spelling-school is one of the ordinary winter amusements in the country. It occurs once in a fortnight or so, and has power to draw out all the young people for miles round, arrayed in their best clothes and their holiday behavior. When all is ready, umpires are elected, and after these have taken the distinguished place usually occupied by the teacher, the young people of the school choose the two best scholars to head the opposing classes. These leaders choose their followers from the mass, each calling a name in turn, until all the spellers are ranked on one side or the other, lining the sides of the room and all standing. The schoolmaster, standing too, takes his spelling book and gives a placid yet awe-inspiring look along the ranks, remarking that he intends to be very impartial and that he shall give out nothing that is not in the spelling book. For the first half hour or so he chooses common and easy words that the spirit of the evening may not be damped by the too early thinning of the classes. When a word is missed, the blunderer has to sit down and be a spectator only for the rest of the evening. At certain intervals, some of the best speakers mount the platform and speak a piece, which is generally as declamatory as possible. The excitement of this scene is equal to that afforded by any city spectacle whatever, and towards the close of the evening, when difficult and unusual words are chosen to confound the small number who still keep the floor, it becomes scarcely less than painful. When perhaps only one or two remain to be puzzled, the master, weary at last of his task, though a favorite one, tries by tricks to put down those whom he cannot overcome in fair fight. If, among all the curious, useless, unheard-of words which may be picked out of the spelling-book, he cannot find one which the scholars have not noticed, he gets the last head down by some quip or catch. Bay will perhaps be the sound. One scholar spells it B-E-Y, another B-A-Y, while the master all the time means B-A, which comes within the rule being in the spelling book. It was on one of these occasions, as we have said, that Miss Bangle, having come to the spelling school to get materials for a letter to a female friend, first shone upon Mr. Horner. She was excessively amused by his solemn air and puckered mouth, and set him down at once as fair game. Yet she could not help becoming somewhat interested in the spelling school, and after it was over found she had not stored up half as many of the schoolmaster's points as she intended for the benefit of her correspondent. In the evening's contest a young girl from some few miles distance, Ellen Kingsbury, the only child of a substantial farmer, had been the very last to sit down, after a prolonged effort on the part of Mr. Horner to puzzle her for the credit of his own school. She blushed and smiled and blushed again, but spelt on until Mr. Horner's cheeks were crimson with excitement, and some touch of shame that he should be baffled at his own weapons. At length, either by accident or design, Ellen missed a word, and sinking into her seat was numbered with the slain. In the laugh and talk which followed, for with the conclusion of the spelling all form of a public assembly vanishes, 
our schoolmaster said so many gallant things to his fair enemy, and appeared so much animated by the excitement of the contest, that Miss Bangle began to look upon him with rather more respect, and to feel somewhat indignant that a little rustic like Ellen should absorb the entire attention of the only beau. She put on, therefore, her most gracious aspect, and mingled in the circle, causing the schoolmaster to be presented to her, and did her best to fascinate him by certain airs and graces which she had found successful elsewhere. What game is too small for the close-woven net of a coquette? Mr. Horner quitted not the fair Ellen until he had handed her into her father's sleigh, and he then wended his way homewards, never thinking that he ought to have escorted Miss Bangle to her uncle's, though she certainly waited a little while for his return. We must not follow into particulars the subsequent intercourse of our schoolmaster with the civilized young lady. All that concerns us is the result of Miss Bangle's benevolent designs upon his heart. She tried most sincerely to find its vulnerable spot, meaning no doubt to put Mr. Horner on his guard for the future, and she was unfeignedly surprised to discover that her best efforts were of no avail. She concluded he must have taken a counter-poison, and she was not slow in guessing its source. She had observed the peculiar fire which lighted up his eyes in the presence of Ellen Kingsbury, and she bethought herself of a plan which would ensure her some amusement at the expense of these impertinent rustics, though in a manner different somewhat from her original, more natural idea of simple coquetry. A letter was written to Master Horner, purporting to come from Ellen Kingsbury, worded so artfully that the schoolmaster understood at once that it was intended to be a secret communication, though its ostensible object was an inquiry about some ordinary affair. This was laid in Mr. Horner's desk before he came to school, with an intimation that he might leave an answer in a certain spot on the following morning. The bait took at once, for Mr. Horner, honest and true himself, and much smitten with the fair Ellen, was too happy to be circumspect. The answer was duly placed, and as duly carried to Miss Bangle by her accomplice, Joe Englehart, an unlucky pickle, who was always for ill, never for good and who found no difficulty in obtaining the letter unwatched, since the master was obliged to be in school at nine, and Joe could always linger a few minutes later. This answer being opened and laughed at, Miss Bangle had only to contrive a rejoinder, which being rather more particular in its tone than the original communication, led on yet again the happy schoolmaster, who branched out into sentiment, taffeta phrases, silken terms precise, talked of hills and dales and rivulets and the pleasures of friendship, and concluded by entreating a continuance of the correspondence. Another letter, and another, every one more flattering and encouraging than the last, almost turned the sober head of our poor master, and warmed up his heart so effectually that he could scarcely attend to his business. The spelling schools were remembered, however, and Ellen Kingsbury made one of the merry company. But the latest letter had not forgotten to caution Mr. Horner not to betray the intimacy, so that he was in honour bound to restrict himself to the language of the eyes, hard as it was to forbear the single whisper for which he would have given his very dictionary. So their meeting passed off without the explanation which Miss Bangle began to fear would cut short her benevolent amusement. The correspondence was resumed with renewed spirit and carried on until Miss Bangle, though not overburdened with sensitiveness, began to be a little alarmed for the consequences of her malicious pleasantry. She perceived that she herself had turned schoolmistress, and that Master Horner, instead of being merely her dupe, had become her pupil too, for the style of his replies had been constantly improving, and the earnest and manly tone which he assumed promised anything but the quiet, sheepish pocketing of injury and insult upon which she had counted. In truth, there was something deeper than vanity in the feelings with which he regarded Ellen Kingsbury. The encouragement which he supposed himself to have received threw down the barrier which his extreme bashfulness would have interposed between himself and any one who possessed charms enough to attract him. And we must excuse him if, in such a case, 
he did not criticize the mode of encouragement, but rather grasped eagerly the proffered good without a scruple, or one which he would own to himself, as to the propriety with which it was tendered. He was as much in love as a man can be, and the seriousness of real attachment gave both grace and dignity to his once awkward diction. The evident determination of Mr. Horner to come to the point of asking Papa brought Miss Bangle to a very awkward pass. She had expected to return home before matters had proceeded so far, but being obliged to remain some time longer, she was equally afraid to go on and to leave off, a denouement being almost certain to ensue in either case. Things stood thus when it was time to prepare for the grand exhibition which was to close the winter's term. This is an affair of too much magnitude to be fully described in the small space yet remaining in which to bring out our voracious history. It must be slubbered o'er in haste, its important preliminaries left to the cold imagination of the reader, its fine spirit perhaps evaporating for want of being embodied in words. We can only say that our master, whose school life was to close with the term, labored as man never before labored in such a cause, resolute to trail a cloud of glory after him when he left us. Not a candlestick, nor a curtain that was attainable, either by coaxing or bribery, was left in the village. Even the only piano, that frail treasure, was wiled away and placed in one corner of the rickety stage. The most splendid of all the pieces in the Columbian Orator, the American Spectator, the but we must not enumerate, in a word, the most astounding and pathetic specimens of eloquence within ken of either teacher or scholars had been selected for the occasion, and several young ladies and gentlemen, whose academical course had been happily concluded at an earlier period, either at our own institution or at some other, had consented to lend themselves to the parts, and their choicest decorations for the properties of the dramatic portion of the entertainment. Among these last was pretty Ellen Kingsbury, who had agreed to personate the Queen of Scots in the garden scene from Schiller's tragedy of Mary Stuart. And this circumstance accidentally afforded Master Horner the opportunity he had so long desired, of seeing his fascinating correspondent without the presence of peering eyes. A dress rehearsal occupied the afternoon before the day of days, and the pathetic expostulations of the lovely Mary mine all doth hang my life my destiny upon my words the force of tears aided by the long veil and the emotion which sympathy brought into ellen's countenance proved too much for the enforced prudence of master horner when the rehearsal was over and the heroes and heroines were to return home it was found that by a stroke of witty invention not new in the country the harness of Mr. Kingsbury's horses had been cut in several places, his whip hidden, his buffalo skin spread on the ground, and the sleigh turned bottom upwards on them. This afforded an excuse for the master's borrowing a horse and sleigh of somebody, and claiming the privilege of taking Miss Ellen home, while her father returned with only Aunt Sally and a great bag of bran from the mill, companions about equally interesting. Here, then, was the golden opportunity so long wished for. Here was the power of ascertaining at once what is never quite certain until we have heard it from warm, living lips, whose testimony is strengthened by glances in which the whole soul speaks, or seems to speak. The time was short, for the slaying was but too fine, and Father Kingsbury, having tied up his harness and collected his scattered equipment, was driving so close behind that there was no possibility of lingering for a moment. Yet many moments were lost before Mr. Horner, very much in earnest, and all unhackneyed in manners of this sort, could find a word in which to clothe his new-found feelings. The horse seemed to fly, the distance was half past, and at length, in absolute despair of anything better, he blurted out at once what he had determined to avoid a direct reference to the correspondence. A game at cross-purposes ensued. Exclamations and explanations and denials and apologies filled up the time which was to have made Master Horner so blessed. 
The light from Mr. Kingsbury's windows shone upon the path, and the whole result of this conference so longed for was a burst of tears from the perplexed and mortified Ellen, who sprang from Mr. Horner's attempts to detain her, rushed into the house without vouchsafing him a word of adieu, and left him standing. No bad personification of Orpheus after the last hopeless flitting of his Eurydice. "'Won't you light, master?' said Mr. Kingsbury. "'Yes. No. Thank you. Good evening.' stammered poor Master Horner, so stupefied that even Aunt Sally called him a dummy. The horse took the sleigh against the fence going home, and threw out the master, who scarcely recollected the accident, while to Ellen the issue of this unfortunate drive was a sleepless night, and so high a fever in the morning that our village doctor was called to Mr. Kingsbury's before breakfast. Poor Master Horner's distress may hardly be imagined. Disappointed, Bewildered, cut to the quick, yet as much in love as ever, he could only in bitter silence turn over in his thoughts the issue of his cherished dream. Now persuading himself that Ellen's denial was the effect of a sudden bashfulness, now inveighing against the fickleness of the sex, as all men do when they are angry with any one woman in particular. But his exhibition must go on in spite of wretchedness, and he went about mechanically, talking of curtains and candles and music and attitudes and pauses and emphasis, looking like a somnambulist whose eyes are open but their senses shut, and often surprising those concerned by the utter unfitness of his answers. It was almost evening when Mr. Kingsbury, having discovered through the intervention of the doctor and Aunt Sally the cause of Ellen's distress, made his appearance before the unhappy eyes of Master Horner angry, solemn, and determined, taking the schoolmaster apart and requiring an explanation of his treatment of his daughter. In vain did the perplexed lover ask for time to clear himself, declare his respect for Miss Ellen and his willingness to give every explanation which she might require. The father was not to be put off, and though excessively reluctant, Mr. Horner had no recourse but to show the letters which alone could account for his strange discourse to Ellen. He unlocked his desk, slowly and unwillingly, while the old man's impatience was such that he could scarcely forbear thrusting in his own hand to snatch at the papers which were to explain this vexatious mystery. What could equal the utter confusion of Master Horner and the contemptuous anger of the father when no letters were to be found? Mr. Kingsbury was too passionate to listen to reason, or to reflect for one moment upon the irreproachable good name of the schoolmaster. He went away in inexorable wrath, threatening every practicable visitation of public and private justice upon the head of the offender, whom he accused of having attempted to trick his daughter into an entanglement which should result in his favor. A doleful exhibition was this last one of our thrice-approved and most worthy teacher. Stern necessity and the power of habit enabled him to go through with most of his part. But where was the proud fire which had lighted up his eye on similar occasions before? He sat as one of three judges before whom the unfortunate Robert Emmett was dragged in his shirt-sleeves by two fierce-looking officials but the chief judge looked far more like a criminal than did the proper representative. He ought to have personated Othello, but was obliged to excuse himself from raving for the handkerchief, the handkerchief, on the rather anomalous plea of a bad cold. Mary Stuart, being i the bond, was anxiously expected by the impatient crowd, and it was with distress amounting to agony that the master was obliged to announce in person the necessity of omitting that part of the representation on account of the illness of one of the young ladies. Scarcely had the words been uttered and the speaker hidden his burning face behind the curtain when Mr. Kingsbury started up in his place amid the throng to give a public recital of his grievance, no uncommon resort in the new country. He dashed at once to the point and before some friends who saw the utter impropriety of his proceeding could persuade him to defer his vengeance, he had laid before the assembly, some three hundred people perhaps, his own statement of the case. 
he was got out at last, half coaxed, half hustled, and the gentle public, only half understanding what had been set forth thus unexpectedly, made quite a pretty row of it. Some clamoured loudly for the conclusion of the exercises. Others gave utterances in no particularly choice terms to a variety of opinions as to the schoolmaster's proceedings, varying the note occasionally by shouting, THE LETTERS! THE LETTERS! WHY DON'T YOU BRING OUT THE LETTERS? At length, by means of much rapping on the desk by the President of the evening, who was fortunately a popular character, order was partially restored, and the favorite scene from Miss Moore's dialogue of David and Goliath was announced as the closing piece. The sight of little David in a white tunic edged with red tape, with a calico scrip and a very primitive-looking sling, and a huge Goliath, decorated with a militia belt and sword, and a spear like a weaver's beam indeed, enchained everybody's attention. Even the peccant schoolmaster and his pretended letters were forgotten, while the sapient Goliath, every time he raised the spear, in the energy of his declamation, to thump upon the stage, picked away fragments of the low ceiling which fell conspicuously on his great shock of black hair. At last, with the crowning threat, up went the spear for an astounding thump, and down came a large piece of the ceiling, and with it a shower of letters. The confusion that ensued beggars all description. A general scramble took place, and in another moment twenty pairs of eyes at least were feasting on the choice phrases lavished upon Mr. Horner. Miss Bangle had set through the whole previous scene, trembling for herself, although she had, as she supposed, guarded cunningly against exposure. She had needed no profit to tell her what must be the result of a tete -a tete between Mr. Horner and Ellen. The moment she saw them drive off together, she induced her imp to seize the opportunity of abstracting the whole parcel of letters from Mr. Horner's desk, which he did by means of a sort of skill which comes by nature to such goblins, picking the lock by the aid of a crooked nail, as neatly as if he had been born within the shadow of the tombs. But magicians sometimes suffer severely from the malice with which they have themselves inspired their familiars. Joe Englehart, having been a convenient tool thus far, thought it quite time to torment Miss Bangle a little. So having stolen the letters at her bidding, he hid them on his own account, and no persuasions of hers could induce him to reveal this important secret, which he chose to reserve as a rod in case she refused him some intercession with his father, or some other accommodation rendered necessary by his mischievous habits. He had concealed the precious parcels in the unfloored loft above the schoolroom, a place accessible only by means of a small trap door without staircase or ladder, and here he meant to have kept them while it suited his purpose, but for the untimely intrusion of the weaver's beam. Miss Bangle had set through all, as we have said, thinking the letters safe, yet vowing vengeance against her confederate for not allowing her to secure them by a satisfactory conflagration. It was not until she heard her own name whispered through the crowd that she was awakened to her true situation. The sagacity of the low creatures, whom she had despised, showed them at once that the letters must be hers, since her character had been pretty shrewdly guessed, and the handwriting wore a more practiced air than is usual among females in the country. This was first taken for granted, and then spoken of as an acknowledged fact. The assembly moved like the heavings of a troubled sea. Everybody felt that this was everybody's business. Put her out! was heard from more than one rough voice near the door, and this was responded to by loud and angry murmurs from within. Mr. Englehart, not waiting to inquire into the merits of the case in this scene of confusion, hastened to get his family out as quietly and as quickly as possible. But groans and hisses followed his niece as she hung half-fainting on his arm, quailing completely beneath the instinctive indignation of the rustic public. As she passed out, a yell resounded among the rude boys about the door, and she was lifted into a sleigh, insensible from terror. She disappeared from that evening, and no one knew the time of her final departure for the East. 
Mr. Kingsbury, who is a just man when he is not in a passion, made all the reparation in his power for his harsh and ill-considered attack upon the master. And we believe that functionary did not show any traits of implacability of character. At least he was seen, not many days after, sitting peaceably at tea with Mr. Kingsbury, Aunt Sally, and Miss Ellen, and he has since gone home to build a house upon his farm. And people do say that after a few months more Ellen will not need Miss Bangle's intervention if she should see fit to correspond with the schoolmaster. The End of the Schoolmaster's Progress by Carolyn M. S. Kirkland This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Sredni Vashtar by Saki, also known as Hector Hugh Monroe. This reading by Suzanne Houghton. Conradin was ten years old and the doctor had pronounced his professional opinion that the boy would not live another five years. The doctor was silky and defeat, and counted for little, but his opinion was endorsed by Mrs. de Ropp, who counted for nearly everything. Mrs. de Ropp was Conradin's cousin and guardian, and in his eyes she represented those three-fifths of the world that are necessary and disagreeable and real. The other two-fifths, in perpetual antagonism to the foregoing, were summed up in himself and his imagination. One of these days Conradin supposed he would succumb to the mastering pressure of wearisome, necessary things, such as illnesses, and coddling restrictions and drawn-out dullness. Without his imagination, which was rampant under the spur of loneliness, he would have succumbed long ago. Mrs. de Ropp would never, in her honestest moments, have confessed to herself that she disliked Conradin, though she might have been dimly aware that thwarting him for his good was a duty which she did not find particularly irksome. Conradin hated her with a desperate sincerity which he was perfectly able to mask. Such few pleasures as he could contrive for himself gained an added relish from the likelihood that they would be displeasing to his guardian and from the realm of his imagination she was locked out, an unclean thing which should find no entrance. In the dull, cheerless garden, overlooked by so many windows that were ready to open with the message not to do this or that, or a reminder that medicines were due, he found little attraction. The few fruit trees that it contained were set jealously apart from his plucking, as though they were rare specimens of their kind blooming in an arid waste. It would probably have been difficult to find a market gardener who would have offered ten shillings for their entire yearly produce. In a forgotten corner, however, almost hidden behind a dismal shrubbery, was a disused tool shed of respectable proportions, and within its walls Conradin found a haven, something that took on the varying aspects of a playroom and a cathedral. He had peopled it with a legion of familiar phantoms evoked partly from fragments of history and partly from his own brain, but it also boasted two inmates of flesh and blood. In one corner lived a ragged-plumaged Uden hen, on which the boy lavished an affection that had scarcely another outlet. Further back in the gloom stood a large hutch, divided into two compartments, one of which was fronted with close iron bars. This was the abode of a large polecat ferret, which a friendly butcher boy had once smuggled, cage and all, into its present quarters, in exchange for a long secreted hoard of small silver. Conradin was dreadfully afraid of the lithe, sharp fanged beast, but it was his most treasured possession. Its very presence in the tool shed was a secret and fearful joy to be kept scrupulously from the knowledge of the woman, as he privately dubbed his cousin. And one day, out of heaven knows what material, he spun the beast a wonderful name, and from that moment 
it grew into a god and a religion. The woman indulged in religion once a week at a church nearby, and took Conradin with her, but to him the church service was an alien rite in the house of Rimmon. Every Thursday, in the dim and musty silence of the tool-shed, he worshipped with mystic and elaborate ceremonial before the wooden hutch where dwelt Sredni Vashtar, the great ferret. Red flowers in their season, and scarlet berries in the winter time were offered at his shrine, for he was a god who laid some special stress on the fierce, impatient side of things, as opposed to the woman's religion, which, as far as Conradin could observe, went to great lengths in the contrary direction. And on great festivals powdered nutmeg was strewn in front of his hutch, an important feature of the offering being that the nutmeg had to be stolen. These festivals were of irregular occurrence, and were chiefly appointed to celebrate some passing event. On one occasion, when Mrs. de Rapp suffered from acute toothache for three days, Conradin kept up the festival during the entire three days, and almost succeeded in persuading himself that Sredni Vashtar was personally responsible for the toothache. If the malady had lasted for another day, the supply of nutmeg would have given out. The Uden hen was never drawn into the cult of Sredni Vashtar. Conradin had long ago settled that she was an Anabaptist. He did not pretend to have the remotest knowledge as to what an Anabaptist was, but he privately hoped that it was dashing and not very respectable. Mrs. de Rapp was the ground plan on which he based and detested all respectability. After a while, Conradin's absorption in the tool-shed began to attract the notice of his guardian. It is not good for him to be pottering down there in all weathers, she promptly decided. And at breakfast one morning she announced that the Uden hen had been sold and taken away overnight. With her short-sighted eyes she peered at Conradin, waiting for an outbreak of rage and sorrow, which she was ready to rebuke with a flow of excellent precepts and reasoning. But Conradin said nothing. There was nothing to be said. Something, perhaps, in his white, set face gave her a momentary qualm, for at tea that afternoon there was toast on the table, a delicacy which she usually banned on the ground that it was bad for him, also because the making of it gave trouble, a deadly offense in the middle-class feminine eye. "'I thought you liked toast,' she exclaimed, with an injured air, observing that he did not touch it. "'Sometimes.' said Conradin. In the shed that evening there was an innovation in the worship of the hutch god. Conradin had been wont to chant his praises. Tonight he asked a boon. Do one thing for me, Sredni Vashtar. The thing was not specified. As Sredni Vashtar was a god, he must be supposed to know. And choking back a sob as he looked at that other empty corner, Conradin went back to the world he so hated. And every night, in the welcome darkness of his bedroom, and every evening in the dusk of the tool-shed, Conradin's bitter litany went up. Do one thing for me, Sredni Vashtar. Mrs. de Rapp noticed that the visits to the shed did not cease, and one day she made a further journey of inspection. What are you keeping in that locked hutch? she asked. I believe it's guinea pigs. I'll have them all cleared away. Conradin shut his lips tight, but the woman ransacked his bedroom till she found the carefully hidden key, and forthwith marched down to the shed to complete her discovery. It was a cold afternoon, and Conradin had been bidden to keep to the house. From the furthest window of the dining room, the door of the shed could just be seen beyond the corner of the shrubbery, and there Conradin stationed himself. He saw the woman enter, and then he imagined her opening the door of the sacred hutch, and peering down with her short-sighted eyes into the thick straw bed where his god lay hidden. Perhaps she would prod at the straw in her clumsy impatience, and Conradin fervently breathed his prayer for the last time. But he knew, as he prayed, that he did not believe. He knew that the woman would come out presently with that pursed smile he loathed so well on her face, and that in an hour or two the gardener would carry away his wonderful god, a god no longer but a simple brown ferret in a hutch. 
and he knew that the woman would triumph always as she triumphed now, and that he would grow ever more sickly under her pestering and domineering and superior wisdom, till one day nothing would matter much more with him, and the doctor would be proved right. And in the sting and misery of his defeat he began to chant loudly and defiantly the hymn of his threatened idol. Sredni Vashtar went forth. His thoughts were red thoughts and his teeth were white. His enemies called for peace, but he brought them death. Sredni Vashtar the Beautiful. And then of a sudden he stopped his chanting and drew closer to the window pane. The door of the shed still stood ajar as it had been left, and the minutes were slipping by. They were long minutes, but they slipped by, nevertheless. He watched the starlings running and flying in little parties across the lawn. He counted them over and over again, with one eye always on that swinging door. A sour-faced maid came in to lay the table for tea, and still Conradin stood and waited and watched. Hope had crept by inches into his heart. And now a look of triumph began to blaze in his eyes that had only known the wistful patience of defeat. Under his breath, with a furtive exultation, he began once again the pian of victory and devastation. And presently his eyes were rewarded. Out through that doorway came a long, low, yellow and brown beast, with eyes a-blink at the waning daylight, and dark, wet stains around the fur of jaws and throat. Conradin dropped on his knees. The great polecat ferret made its way down to a small brook at the foot of the garden, drank for a moment, then crossed a little plank bridge and was lost to sight in the bushes. Such was the passing of Sredni Vashtar. "'Tea is ready,' said the sour-faced maid. "'Where is the mistress?' "'She went down to the shed some time ago,' said Conradin. "'And while the maid went to summon her mistress to tea, "'Conradin fished a toasting fork out of his sideboard drawer "'and proceeded to toast himself a piece of bread. "'And during the toasting of it, "'and the buttering of it with much butter, "'and the slow enjoyment of eating it, Conradin listened to the noises and silences which fell in quick spasms beyond the dining-room door. The loud, foolish screaming of the maid, the answering chorus of wondering ejaculations from the kitchen region, the scuttering footsteps and hurried embassies for outside help, and then, after a lull, the scared sobbings and the shuffling tread of those who bore a heavy burden into the house. "'Whoever will break it to the poor child? "'I couldn't for the life of me!' exclaimed a shrill voice. "'And while they debated the matter among themselves, "'Conradin made himself another piece of toast. "'End of Sredni Vashtar by Saki "'This is a LibriVox recording. "'All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain.' For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Three Questions by Leo Tolstoy From the collection What Men Live By and Other Tales Translated by L. and A. Maud It once occurred to a certain king that if he always knew the right time to begin everything, if he knew who were the right people to listen to and whom to avoid, and above all, if he always knew what was the most important thing to do, he would never fail in anything he might undertake. And this thought having occurred to him, he had it proclaimed throughout his kingdom that he would give a great reward to anyone who would teach him what was the right time for every action, and who were the most necessary people, and how he might know what was the most important thing to do. And learned men came to the king, but they all answered his questions differently. In reply to the first question, some said that to know the right time for every action 
one must draw up in advance a table of days, months, and years, and must live strictly according to it. Only thus, said they, could everything be done at its proper time. Others declared that it was impossible to decide beforehand the right time for every action, but that, not letting oneself be absorbed in idle pastimes, one should always attend to all that was going on, and then do what was most needful. Others again said that, however attentive the king might be to what was going on, it was impossible for one man to decide correctly the right time for every action, but that he should have a council of wise men, who would help him to fix the proper time for everything. But then again others said that there were some things which could not wait to be laid before a council, but about which one had at once to decide whether to undertake them or not. But in order to decide that one must know beforehand what was going to happen. It is only magicians who know that, and therefore, in order to know the right time for every action, one must consult magicians. Equally various were the answers to the second question. Some said the people the king most needed were his counsellors, others the priests, others the doctors, while some said the warriors were the most necessary. To the third question, as to what was the most important occupation, some replied that the most important thing in the world was science. Others said it was skill in warfare, and others again that it was religious worship. All the answers being different, the king agreed with none of them, and gave the reward to none. But still wishing to find the right answers to his questions, he decided to consult a hermit, widely renowned for his wisdom. The hermit lived in a wood which he never quitted, and he received none but common folk. So the king put on simple clothes, and before reaching the hermit's cell, dismounted from his horse, and, leaving his bodyguard behind, went on alone. When the king approached, the hermit was digging the ground in front of his hut. Seeing the king, he greeted him, and went on digging. The hermit was frail and weak, and each time he stuck his spade into the ground and turned a little earth, he breathed heavily. The king went up to him and said, I have come to you, wise hermit, to ask you to answer three questions. How can I learn to do the right thing at the right time? Who are the people I most need, and to whom should I therefore pay more attention than to the rest, and what affairs are the most important and need my first attention? The hermit listened to the king, but answered nothing. He just spat on his hands and recommenced digging. "'You're tired,' said the king. "'Let me take the spade and work a while for you.' "'Thanks,' said the hermit, and giving the spade to the king, he sat down on the ground. When he had dug two beds, the king stopped and repeated his questions. The hermit again gave no answer, but rose, stretched out his hand for the spade, and said, "'Now rest a while, and let me work for a bit.' But the king did not give him the spade, and continued to dig. One hour passed, and another. The sun began to sink behind the trees, and the king at last stuck the spade into the ground, and said, I came to you, wise man, for an answer to my questions. If you can give me none, tell me so, and I will return home. Here comes someone running, said the hermit. Let us see who it is. The king turned round and saw a bearded man come running out of the wood. The man held his hands pressed against his stomach, and blood was flowing from under them. When he reached the king, he fell fainting on the ground, moaning feebly. The king and the hermit unfastened the man's clothing. There was a large wound in his stomach. The king washed it as best as he could, and bandaged it with his handkerchief and with a towel the hermit had. But the blood would not stop flowing, 
and the king again and again removed the bandage soaked with warm blood, and washed and rebandaged the wound. When at last the blood ceased flowing, the man revived and asked for something to drink. The king brought fresh water and gave it to him. Meanwhile the sun had set, and it had become cool. So the king, with the hermit's help, carried the wounded man into the hut and laid him on the bed. Lying on the bed the man closed his eyes and was quiet, but the king was so tired with his walk and with the work that he'd done that he crouched down on the threshold and also fell asleep, so soundly that he slept all through the short summer night. When he awoke in the morning it was long before he could remember where he was or who was the strange bearded man lying on the bed and gazing intently at him with shining eyes. "'Forgive me,' said the bearded man, in a weak voice, when he saw that the king was awake and was looking at him. "'I do not know you, and have nothing to forgive you for,' said the king. "'You do not know me, but I know you. I am that enemy of yours who swore to revenge himself on you, because you executed his brother and seized his property.' I knew you had gone alone to see the hermit, and I resolved to kill you on your way back. But the day passed, and you didn't return. So I came out from my ambush to find you, and I came upon your bodyguard, and they recognized me and wounded me. I escaped from them, but should have bled to death had you not dressed my wound. I wished to kill you, and you have saved my life." Now, if I live, and if you wish it, I will serve you as your most faithful slave, and will bid my sons to do the same. Forgive me. The king was very glad to have made peace with his enemy so easily, and to have gained him for a friend, and he not only forgave him, but said he would send his servants and his own physician to attend him, and promised to restore his property. Having taken leave of the wounded man, the king went out into the porch and looked round for the hermit. Before going away he wished once more to beg an answer to the questions he'd put. The hermit was outside, on his knees, sowing seeds in the beds that had been dug the day before. The king approached him and said, "'For the last time I pray you to answer my questions, wise man.' "'You have already been answered,' said the hermit, still crouching on his thin legs, and looking up at the king who stood before him. "'How answered? What do you mean?' said the king. "'Do you not see?' replied the hermit. "'If you had not pitied my weakness yesterday, and had not dug those beds for me, but had gone your way, that man would have attacked you, and you would have repented of not having stayed with me.' So the most important time was when you were digging the beds, and I was the most important man, and to do me good was your most important business. Afterwards, when that man ran to us, the most important time was when you were attending to him, for if you had not bound up his wounds, he would have died without having made peace with you. So he was the most important man, and what you did for him was your most important business. Remember, then, there is only one time that is important. Now. It is the most important time because it is the only time when we have any power. The most necessary man is he with whom you are, for no man knows whether he will ever have dealings with anyone else. And the most important affair is to do him good, because for that purpose alone was man sent into this life. End of Three Questions by Leo Tolstoy This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how to volunteer, 
please contact LibriVox.org. Recording by Peter Yearsley. The Watcher by Robert H. Benson. One morning the priest and I went out soon after breakfast and walked up and down a grass path between two yew hedges. The dew was not yet off the grass that lay in shadow, and thin patches of gossamer still hung like torn cambric on the yew shoots on either side. As we passed for the second time up the path, the old man suddenly stooped, and pushing aside a dock leaf at the foot of the hedge, lifted a dead mouse, and looked at it as it lay stiffly on the palm of his hand. I saw that his eyes filled slowly with the ready tears of old age. He has chosen his own resting place, he said. Let him lie there. Why did I disturb him? And he lay him gently down again, and then, gathering a fragment of wet earth, he sprinkled it over the mouse. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, he said, in sure and certain hope. And then he stopped, and, straightening himself with difficulty, walked on, and I followed him. You once expressed an interest, he said, in my tales of the visions of nature I have seen. Shall I tell you how once I saw a very different sight? I was eighteen years old at the time, that terrible age when the soul seems to have dwindled to a spark overlaid by a mountain of ashes, when blood and fire and death and loud noises seem the only things of interest, and all tender things shrink back and hide from the dreadful noonday of manhood. Someone gave me one of those shot pistols that you may have seen, and I loved the sense of power that it gave me, for I had never had a gun. For a week or two in the summer holidays I was content with shooting at a mark, or at the level surface of water, and delighted to see the cardboard shattered or the quiet pool torn to shreds along its mirror, where the sky and green lay sleeping. Then that ceased to interest me, and I longed to see a living thing suddenly stop living at my will. Now, and he held up a deprecating hand, I think sport is necessary for some natures. After all, the killing of creatures is necessary for man's food. And sport, as you will tell me, is a survival of man's delight in obtaining food and it requires certain noble qualities of endurance and skill. I know all that, and I know further, that for some natures it is a relief, an escape for humours that will otherwise find an evil outlet. But I do know this, that for me it was not necessary. However, there was every excuse, and I went out in good faith one summer evening, intending to shoot some rabbits as they ran to cover from the open field. I walked along the inside of a fence with a wood above me and on my left, and the green meadow on my right. Well, owing probably to my own lack of skill, though I could hear the patter and rush of the rabbits all round me, and could see them in the distance, sitting up listening with cocked ears, as I stole along the fence, I could not get close enough to fire at them with any hope of what I fancied was success, and by the time that I had arrived at the end of the wood, I was in an impatient mood. I stood for a moment or two leaning on the fence, looking out of that pleasant coolness into the open meadow beyond. The sun had at that moment dipped behind the hill before me, and all was in shadow, except where there hung a glory about the topmost leaves of a beech that still caught the sun. The birds were beginning to come in from the fields, and were settling one by one in the wood behind me staying here and there to sing one last line of melody. I could hear the quiet rush and the sudden clap of a pigeon's wings as he came home, and as I listened I heard, pealing out above all other sounds, the long liquid song of a thrush somewhere above me. I looked up idly and tried to see the bird, and after a moment or two caught sight of him as the leaves of the beech parted in the breeze. His head lifted, and his whole body vibrating with the joy of life and music. As someone has said, his body was one beating heart. The last radiance of the sun over the hill reached him, 
and bathed him in golden warmth. Then the leaves closed again as the breeze dropped, but still his song rang out. Then there came on me a blinding desire to kill him. All the other creatures had mocked me and run home. Here at least was a victim, and I would pour out the sullen anger that had been gathering during my walk, and at least demand this one life as a substitute. Side by side with this I remembered clearly that I had come out to kill for food. That was my one justification. Side by side I saw both these things, and I had no excuse, no excuse. I turned my head every way, and moved a step or two back to catch sight of him again, and, although this may sound fantastic and overwrought, in my whole being was a struggle between light and darkness. Every fibre of my life told me that the thrush had a right to live. Ah, he had earned it, if labour were wanting, by this very song that was guiding death towards him. But black, sullen anger had thrown my conscience, and was now struggling to hold it down till the shot had been fired. Still I waited for the breeze, and then it came, cool and sweet-smelling like the breath of a garden, and the leaves parted. Then he sang in the sunshine, and in a moment I lifted the pistol and drew the trigger. With the crack of the cap came silence overhead, and after what seemed an interminable moment came the soft rush of something falling and the faint thud among last year's leaves. Then I stood half terrified and stared among the dead leaves. All seemed dim and misty. My eyes were still a little dazzled by the bright background of sunlit air and rosy clouds, on which I had looked with such intensity, and the space between the branches was a world of shadows. Still I looked a few yards away, trying to make out the body of the thrush, and fearing to hear a struggle of beating wings among the dry leaves. And then I lifted my eyes a little, vaguely. A yard or two beyond where the thrush lay was a rhododendron bush, the blossoms had fallen, and the outline of dark heavy leaves was unrelieved by the slightest touch of colour. As I looked at it I saw a face looking down from the higher branches. It was a perfectly hairless head and face. The thin lips were parted in a wide smile of laughter. There were innumerable lines about the corners of the mouth, and the eyes were surrounded by creases of merriment. What was perhaps most terrible about it all was that the eyes were not looking at me, but down among the leaves. The heavy eyelids lay drooping, and the long, narrow, shining slits showed how the eyes laughed beneath them. The forehead sloped quickly back like a cat's head. The face was the colour of earth, and the outlines of the head faded below the ears and chin into the gloom of the dark bush. There was no throat, or body, or limbs, so far as I could see. The face just hung there like a downturned eastern mask in an old curiosity shop, and it smiled with sheer delight, not at me, but at the thrush's body. There was no change of expression so long as I watched it, just a silent smile of pleasure, petrified on the face. I could not move my eyes from it. After what I suppose was a minute or so, the face had gone. I did not see it go but I became aware that I was looking only at leaves. No, there was no outline of leaf or play of shadows that could possibly have been taken for form of a face. You can guess how I tried to force myself to believe that that was all, how I turned my head this way and that, to catch it again, but there was no hint of a face. Now I cannot tell you how I did it, but although I was half beside myself with fright, I went forward towards the bush, and searched furiously among the leaves for the body of the thrush, and at last I found it, and lifted it. It was still limp and warm to the touch. Its breast was a little ruffled, and one tiny drop of blood lay at the root of the beak below the eyes, like a tear of dismay and sorrow at such an unmerited, unexpected death. I carried it to the fence and climbed over and then began to run in great steps, looking now and then awfully at the gathering gloom of the wood behind, where the laughing face had mocked the dead. I think, looking back as I do now, that my chief instinct was that I could not leave the thrush there to be laughed at, 
and that I must get it out into the clean, airy meadow. When I reached the middle of the meadow, I came to a pond which never quite ran dry, even in the hottest summer. On the bank I laid the thrush down, and then, deliberately, but with all my force, dashed the pistol into the water, then emptied my pockets of the cartridges, and threw them in, too. Then I turned again to the piteous little body, feeling that at least I had tried to make amends. There was an old rabbit-hole near, the grass growing down in its mouth, and a tangle of web and dead leaves behind. I scooped a little space out among the leaves, and then laid the thrush there, gathered a little of the sandy soil and poured it upon the body, saying, I remember, half unconsciously, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, in sure and certain hope. And then I stopped, feeling that I had been a little profane, though I do not think so now. And then I went home. As I dressed for dinner, looking out over the darkening meadow where the thrush lay, I remember feeling happy that no evil thing could mock the defenceless dead out there in the clean meadow where the wind blew and the stars shone down. End of The Watcher by Robert H. Benson This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Wind's Tale by Hans Christian Andersen Read by West Winds Twelve when the wind sweeps across a field of grass, it makes little ripples in it, like a lake. In a field of corn it makes great waves, like the sea itself. This is the wind's frolic. Then listen to the stories it tells. It sings them aloud, one kind of song among the trees of the forest, and a very different one when it is pent up within walls with all their cracks and crannies. Do you see how the wind chases the white fleecy clouds, as if they were a flock of sheep? Do you hear the wind down there, howling, in the open doorway, like a watchman winding his horn? Then, too, how he whistles in the chimneys, making the fire crackle and sparkle. How cozy it is to sit in the warm glow of the fire, listening to the tales it has to tell. Let the wind tell its own story. It can tell you more adventures than all of us put together. Listen now. Phew, phew, far away. That was the refrain of his song. Close to the great belt stands an old mansion with thick red walls, says the wind. I know every stone of it. I knew them before when they formed part of Marstig's castle on the Ness. It had to come down. The stones were used again and made a new wall of a new castle in another place. Boraby Hall, as it now stands. I have watched the high-born men and women of all the various races who have lived there, and now I am going to tell you about Valdemar Da and his daughters. He held his head very high, for he came of a royal stock. He knew more than the mere chasing of a stag or the emptying of a flagon. He knew how to manage his affairs, he said himself. His lady wife walked proudly across the brightly polished floors in her gold brocaded kirtle. The tapestries in the rooms were gorgeous, and the furniture of costly carved woods. She had brought much gold and silver plate into the house with her, and the cellars were full of German ale, when there was anything there at all. Fiery black horses neighed in the stables. Boraby Hall was a very rich place, when wealth came there. Then there were the children, three dainty maidens, Ida, Johanna, and Anna Dorothea. I remember their names well. They were rich and aristocratic people, and they were born and bred in wealth. Phew, phew, far away, roared the wind. Then he went on with his story. I did not see here, as in other old noble castles, the high-born lady sitting among her maidens in the great hall turning the spinning-wheel. No, she played upon the ringing lute, and sang to its tones. Her songs were not always the old Danish ditties, however, but songs in foreign tongues. 
all was life and hospitality. Noble guests came from far and wide. There were sounds of music and the clanging of flagons, so loud that I could not drown them, said the wind. Here were arrogance and ostentation enough, and to spare. Plenty of lords, but the lords had no place there. Then came the evening of May Day, said the wind. I came from the west. I had been watching ships being wrecked and broken up on the west coast of Jutland. I tore over the heaths and the green wooded coasts, across the island of Funen, and over the great belt, puffing and blowing. I settled down to rest on the coast of Zealand, close to Borreby Hall, where the splendid forest of oaks still stood. The young bachelors of the neighborhood came out and collected faggots and branches, the longest and driest they could find. These they took to the town, piled them up in a heap, and set fire to them. Then the men and maidens danced and sang around the bonfire. I lay still, said the wind, but I softly moved a branch, the one laid by the handsomest young man, and his billet blazed up highest of all. He was the chosen one. He had the name of honor. He became buck of the street, and he chose from among the girls his little May lamb. All was life and merriment, greater far than within rich Borreby Hall. The great lady came driving towards the hall, in her gilded chariot, drawn by six horses. She had her three dainty daughters with her. They were, indeed, three lovely flowers, a rose, a lily, and a pale hyacinth. The mother herself was a gorgeous tulip. She took no notice whatever of the crowd, who all stopped in their game to drop their curtsies and make their bows. One might have thought that, like a tulip, she was rather frail in the stalk, and feared to bend her back. The rose, the lily, and the pale hyacinth, yes, I saw them all three, Whose may lambs were they one day to become, I thought. Their mates would be proud knights, perhaps even princes. Phew, phew, far away, yes, the chariot bore them away, and the peasants whirled on in their dance. They played at riding the summer into the village, to Borreby village, Terraby village, and many others. But that night when I rose, said the wind, the noble lady laid herself down to rise no more. That came to her which comes to every one. There was nothing new about it. Valdemar Da stood grave and silent for a time. The proudest tree may bend, but it does not break, said something within him. The daughters wept, and every one else at the castle was wiping their eyes. But Madame Da had fared away, and I fared away too. Phew, phew, said the wind. I came back again. I often come back across the island of Funen and the waters of the belt, and took up my place on Borreby shore, close to the great forest of oaks. The ospreys and the wood pigeons used to build in it, the blue raven and even the black stork. It was early in the year. Some of the nests were full of eggs, while in others the young ones were just hatched. What a flying and screaming was there! Then came the sound of the axe. Whoosh! Blow upon blow, the forest was to be felled. Valdemar Da was about to build a costly ship, a three-decked man-of-war, which it was expected the king would buy. So the wood fell, the ancient landmark of the seamen, the home of the birds. The shrike was frightened away, its nest was torn down. The osprey and all the other birds lost their nests, too, and they flew about distractedly, shrieking in their terror and anger. The crows and the jackdaws screamed in mockery, Caw! Caw! Valdemar Da and his three daughters stood in the middle of the wood among the workmen. They all laughed at the wild cries of the birds, except Anna Dorothea who was touched by their distress, and when they were about to fell a tree which was half dead, and on whose naked branches a black stork had built its nest, out of which the young ones were sticking their heads, she begged them with tears in her eyes to spare it. So the tree 
with the black stork's nest was allowed to stand. It was only a little thing. The chopping and the sawing went on. The three-decker was built. The master builder was a man of humble origin, but of noble loyalty. Great power lay in his eyes and on his forehead, and Valdemar Da liked to listen to him, and little Ida liked to listen too, the eldest fifteen-year-old daughter. But whilst he built the ship for her father, he built a castle in the air for himself, in which he and little Ida sat side by side as man and wife. This might also have happened if his castle had been built of solid stone, with moat and ramparts, wood and gardens. But with all his wisdom the shipbuilder was only a poor bird. And what business has a sparrow in a crane's nest? Phew, phew! I rushed away, and he rushed away, for he dared not stay, and little Ida got over it, as get over it she must. The fiery black horses stood neighing in the stables. They were worth looking at, and they were looked at to some purpose, too. An admiral was sent from the king to look at the new man-of-war, with a view to purchasing it. The admiral was loud in his admiration of the horses. I heard all he said, added the wind. I went through the open door with the gentlemen, and scattered the straw like gold before their feet. Valdemar Da wanted gold. The admiral wanted the black horses, and so he praised them as he did. But his hints were not taken. Therefore the ship remained unsold. There it stood, by the shore covered up with boards, like a Noah's ark, which never reached the water. Phew! Phew! Get along! Get along! It was a miserable business. In the winter, when the fields were covered with snow and the belt was full of ice floes, which I drove up on to the coast, said the wind, the ravens and the crows came in flocks, the one blacker than the other, and perched up on the desolate dead ship by the shore. They screamed themselves hoarse about the forest which had disappeared and the many precious birds' nests which had been devastated, leaving old and young homeless, and all for the sake of this old piece of lumber, the proud ship which was never to touch the water. I whirled the snow about till it lay in great heaps round the ship. I let it hear my voice, and all that a storm has to say. I know that I did my best to give it an idea of the sea. Phew! Phew! The winter passed by, winter and summer passed away. They come and go, just as I do. The snow flakes, the apple blossom, and the leaves fall, each in their turn. Few, few, they pass away, as men pass too. The daughters were still young, little Ida, the rose, as lovely to look at as when the shipbuilder turned his gaze upon her. I often took hold of her long brown hair when she stood lost in thought by the apple tree in the garden. She never noticed that I showered apple blossom over her loosened hair. She only gazed at the red sunset against the golden background of the sky, and the dark trees and bushes of the garden. Her sister Johanna was like a tall, stately lily. She held herself as stiffly erect as her mother and seemed to have the same dread of bending her stem. She liked to walk in the long gallery where the family portraits hung. The ladies were painted in velvet and silk, with tiny pearl embroidered caps on their braided tresses. Their husbands were all clad in steel, or in costly cloaks lined with squirrel skins and stiff blue ruffs. Their swords hung loosely by their sides. Where would Johanna's portrait one day hang on these walls? What would her noble husband look like? These were her thoughts, and she even spoke them aloud. I heard her as I swept through the long corridor into the gallery, where I veered round again. Anna Dorothea, the pale hyacinth, was only a child of fourteen, quiet and thoughtful. Her large blue eyes, as clear as water, were very solemn but childhood's smile still played upon her lips. I could not blow it away, nor did I wish to do so. I used to meet her in the garden, the ravine, and in the manor fields. 
She was always picking flowers and herbs, those she knew her father could use for healing drinks and potions. Valdemar Da was proud and conceited, but he was also learned, and he knew a great deal about many things. One could see that, and many whispers went about as to his learning. The fire blazed in his stove even in summer, and his chamber door was locked. This went on for days and nights, but he did not talk much about it. One must deal silently with the forces of nature. He would soon discover the best of everything, the red, red gold. This was why his chimney flamed and smoked and sparkled. Yes, I was there too, said the wind. Away with you, away, I sang in the back of the chimney. Smoke, smoke, embers and ashes, that is all it will come to. You will burn yourself up in it. Phew, phew, away with it. But Valdemar Da could not let it go. The fiery steeds in the stable. Where were they? The old gold and silver plate in the cupboard and chest. Where was that? The cattle, the land, the castle itself. Yes, they could all be melted down in the crucible, but yet no gold would come. Barn and larder got emptier and emptier. Fewer servants, more mice. One pane of glass got broken, and another followed it. There was no need for me to go in by the doors, said the wind. A smoking chimney means a cooking meal, but the only chimney which smoked here swallowed up all the meals, all for the sake of the red gold. I blew through the castle gate like a watchman blowing his horn, but there was no watchman, said the wind. I twisted round the weathercock on the tower, and it creaked as if the watchman up there was snoring, only there was no watchman. Rats and mice were the only inhabitants. Poverty laid at the table. Poverty lurked in the wardrobe and the larder. The doors fell off their hinges. Cracks and crannies appeared everywhere. I went in and out, said the wind, so I know all about it. The hair and the beard of Valdemar Da grew gray. In the sorrow of his sleepless nights, amid smoke and ashes, his skin grew grimy and yellow, and his eyes greedy for gold, the long-expected gold. I whistled through the broken panes and fissures. I blew into the daughter's chests, where their clothes lay faded and threadbare. They had to last forever. A song like this had never been sung over the cradles of these children. A lordly life became a woeful life. I was the only one to sing in the castle now, said the wind. I snowed them up, for they said it gave warmth. They had no firewood, for the forest was cut down where they should have got it. There was a biting frost. Even I had to keep rushing through the crannies and passages to keep myself lively. They stayed in bed to keep themselves warm. Those noble ladies, their father crept about under a fur rug. Nothing to bite, and nothing to burn. A lordly life indeed. Phew, phew, let it go. But this was what Valdemar Da could not do. After winter comes the spring, said he. A good time will come after a time of need. But they make us wait their pleasure. Wait! The castle is mortgaged. We are in extremities, and yet the gold will come. At Easter! I heard him murmur to the spider's web, You clever little weaver! You teach me to persevere. If your web is broken, you begin at the beginning again and complete it. Broken again, and cheerfully you begin it over again. That is what one must do and one will be rewarded. It was Easter morning. The bells were ringing, and the sun was at play in the heavens. Valdemar Da had watched through the night with his blood at fever pitch, boiling and cooling, mixing and distilling. I heard him sigh like a despairing soul. I heard him pray, and I felt that he held his breath. The lamp had gone out, but he never noticed it. I blew up the embers, and they shone upon his ashen face, which took a tinge of color from their light. His eyes started in their sockets. 
they grew larger and larger, as if they would leap out. Look at the alchemist's glass. Something twinkles in it. It is glowing, pure and heavy. He lifted it with a trembling hand, and shouted with a trembling voice. Gold, gold, he reeled. And I could easily have blown him over, said the wind. But I only blew upon the embers, and followed him to the room where his daughters sat shivering. His coat was powdered with ash, as well as his beard and his matted hair. He drew himself up to his full height, and held up his precious treasure in the fragile glass. "'Found! One! Gold!' he cried, stretching up his hand with the glass which glittered in the sunbeams. His hand shook, and the alchemist's glass fell to the ground, shivered into a thousand atoms. The last bubble of his welfare was shattered, too. Phew, phew, far away, and away I rushed from the gold-maker's home. Late in the year, when the days were short and dark up here, and the fog envelops the red berries and bare branches with its cold moisture, I came along in a lively mood, clearing the sky and snapping off the dead boughs. This is no great labor, it is true, yet it has to be done. Borabi Hall, the home of Valdemar Da, was having a clean sweep of a different sort. The family enemy, Ove Rammel, of Bassness, appeared holding the mortgage of the hall and all its contents. I drummed upon the cracked window-panes, beat against the decaying doors, and whistled through all the cracks and crannies. Phew! I did my best to prevent Herr Ove taking a fancy to stay there. Ida and Anna Dorothea faced it bravely, although they shed some tears. Johanna stood pale and erect, and bit her finger till it bled. Much that would help her. Ove Rommel offered to let them stay on at the castle for Valdemar Da's lifetime, but he got no thanks for his offer. I was listening. I saw the ruined gentleman stiffen his neck and hold his head higher than ever. I beat against the walls and the old linden trees with such force that the thickest branch broke, although it was not a bit rotten. It fell across the gate like a broom, as if someone was about to sweep. And a sweeping there was indeed to be. I quite expected it. It was a grievous day, and a hard time for them. But their wills were as stubborn as their necks were stiff. They had not a possession in the world but the clothes on their backs. Yes, one thing, an alchemist glass which had been bought and filled with the fragments scraped up from the floor, the treasure which promised much and fulfilled nothing. Valdemar Da hid it in his bosom, took his staff in his hand, and, with his three daughters, the once wealthy gentleman walked out of Borabi Hall for the last time. I blew a cold blast upon his burning cheeks. I fluttered his gray beard and his long white hair. I sang such a tune as only I could sing. Phew, phew, away with them, away with them. This was the end of all their grandeur. Ida and Anna Dorothea walked one on each side of him. Joanna turned round in the gateway. But what was the good of that? Nothing could make their luck turn. She looked at the red stones of what had once been Marsk Stig's castle. Was she thinking of his daughters? The elder took the younger by the hand, and out they roamed to a faraway land. Was she thinking of that song? Here there were three, and their father was with them. They walked along the road where once they used to ride in their chariot. They trod it now as vagrants on their way to a plastered cottage on Smidstrup Heath, which was rented at ten marks yearly. This was their new country seat, with its empty walls and its empty vessels. The crows and the magpies wheeled screaming over their heads with their mocking, Caw! Caw! Out of the nest! Caw! Caw! Just as they screamed in Borabi Forest, when the trees were felled. Herr Da and his daughters must have noticed it. I blew into their ears to try and deaden the cries, which, after all, were not worth listening to. So they took up their abode in the plastered cottage on Smidstrup Heath, 
and I tore off over marshes and meadows, through naked hedges and bare woods, to the open seas and other lands. Phew, phew, away, away, and that for many years. What happened to Valdemar Da? What happened to his daughters? This is what the wind relates. The last of them I saw, yes, for the last time, was Anna Dorothea, the pale hyacinth. She was old and bent now. It was half a century later. She lived the longest. She had gone through everything. Across the heath, near the town of Viborg, stood the dean's new handsome mansion, built of red stone with toothed gables. The smoke curled thickly out of the chimneys. The gentle lady and her fair daughters sat in the bay window looking into the garden at the drooping thorns and out to the brown heath beyond. What were they looking at there? They were looking at a stork's nest on a tumble-down cottage. The roof was covered, as far as there was any roof to cover, with moss and house leek, but the stork's nest made the best covering. It was the only part to which anything was done, for the stork kept it in repair. This house was only fit to be looked at, not to be touched. I had to mind what I was about, said the wind. The cottage was allowed to stand for the sake of the stork's nest. In itself it was only a scarecrow on the heath. But the dean did not want to frighten away the stork. So the hovel was allowed to stand. The poor soul inside was allowed to live in it. She had the Egyptian bird to thank for that, or was it payment for once having pleaded for the nest of his wild black brother in the Borabi forest? Then, poor thing, she was a child, a delicate pale hyacinth in a noble flower garden. Poor Anna Dorothea, she remembered it all. Ah, human beings can sigh as well as the wind when it sows through the rushes and reeds. Oh dear, oh dear, no bells rang over the grave of Valdemar Da. No schoolboys sang when the former lord of Borby Castle was laid in his grave. Well, everything must have an end, even misery. Sister Ida became the wife of a peasant, and this was her father's sorest trial. His daughter's husband, a miserable serf, who might at any moment be ordered the punishment of the wooden horse by his lord. It is well that the sod covers him now. And you too, Ida. Ah, yes, ah, yes, poor me, poor me. I still linger on. In thy mercy release me, O Christ. This is the prayer of Anna Dorothea, as she lay in the miserable hovel which was only left standing for the sake of the stork. I took charge of the boldest of the sisters, said the wind. She had clothes made to suit her manly disposition, and took a place as a lad with a skipper. Her words were few and looks stubborn, but she was willing enough at her work. But with all her will she could not climb the rigging, so I blew her overboard before any one discovered that she was a woman. And I fancy that was not a bad deed of mine, said the wind. On such an Easter morning as that on which Valdemar Da thought he had found the red gold, I heard from beneath the stork's nest a psalm echoing through the miserable walls. It was Anna Dorothea's last song. There was no window, only a hole in the wall. The sun rose in splendor and poured in upon her. Her eyes were glazed and her heart broken. This would have been so this morning, whether the sun had shone upon her or not. The stork kept a roof over her head till her death. I sang at her grave, said the wind, and I sang at her father's grave. I know where it is, and hers too, which is more than any one else knows. The old order changeth, giving place to the new. The old high road now only leads to cultivated fields, while peaceful graves are covered by busy traffic on the new road. Soon comes steam, with its row of wagons behind it, rushing over the graves, forgotten, like the names upon them. Phew, phew, let us be gone, 
This is the story of Valdemar Da and his daughters. Tell it better yourselves, if you can, said the wind. As it veered around, then it was gone. The End of The Wind's Tale